This is Christian Fantoni. I teach at Region Preparatory School of Oklahoma. I teach Latin and world literature. And this fall with Kepler Education, I am hoping to teach a French one class and an advanced Latin class on Caesar and Virgil. I'm going to read book one of The Aeneid by Virgil. And the translation I have chosen is the one provided by the Loeb Classical Edition. The Aeneid, Book One. Arms and a man I sing, who first from the coast of Troy, exiled by fate, came to Italy and Lavine shores, much buffeted on sea and land by violence from above through cruel Juno's unforgiving wrath, and much enduring in war also, till he should build a city and bring his gods to Latium. Whence came the Latin race, the lords of Alba, and the lofty walls of Rome. Tell me, O muse, the cause, wherein thwarted in will, or wherefore angered, did the queen of heaven drive a man of goodness so wondrous to traverse so many perils, to face so many toils? Can heavenly spirits cherish resentment so dire? There was an ancient city, the home of Tyrian settlers, Carthage, over against Italy and the Tiber's mouths afar, rich in wealth and stern in war's pursuits. This, tis said, Juno loved above all other lands, holding Samus itself less dear. Here was her armor, here her chariot. That here should be the capital of the nations, should the fates perchance allow it, was even then the goddess's aim and cherished hope. Yet, in truth, she had heard that a race was springing from Trojan blood to overthrow some day the Tyrian towers, that from it a people, kings of broad realms and proud in war, should come forth for Libya's downfall. So rolled the wheel of fate. The daughter of Saturn, fearful of this and mindful of the old war, which erstwhile she had fought at Troy for her beloved Argos. Not yet, too, had the cause of her wrath and her bitter sorrows faded from her mind. Deep in her heart remained the judgment of Paris and the outrage, outrage of her slighted beauty, her hatred of the race and the honors paid to ravish Ganymede. Inflamed hereby yet more, she tossed on the wide main the Trojan remnant left by the Greeks and pitiless Achilles, and kept them far from Latium. And many a year they wandered, driven by the fates over all the seas. So vast was the effort to found the Roman race. Hardly out of sight of Sicilian land were they spreading their sails seaward, and merely ploughing the foaming brine with brazen prow, when Juno, nursing an undying wound deep in her heart, spoke thus to herself. What? I resign my purpose, baffled, and fail to turn from Italy the Teucrian king? The fates doubtless forbid me. Had Pallas power to burn up the Argive fleet and sink the sailors in the deep because of one single man's guilt and the frenzy of Ajax, son of Oilus? Her own hand hurled from the clouds, Jove's swift flame scattered their ships and upheaved the sea in tempest. But him, as with pierced breast he breathed forth flame, she caught in a whirlwind and impaled on a spiky crag. Yet I, who move as queen of gods, at once sister and wife of Jove, with one people I'm warring these many years. 
And will any still worship Juno's godhead, or humbly lay sacrifice upon her altars? Thus inwardly, brooding with heart inflamed, the goddess came to Aeolia, mother land of storm clouds, tracts teeming with furious blasts. Here, in his vast cavern, Aeolus, the king, keeps under his sway and with prison bond, curbs the struggling winds and the roaring gales. They, to the mountain's mighty moans, chafe blustering around the barriers. In his lofty citadel sits Aeolus, scepter in hand, taming their passions and soothing their rage. Did he not so, they would surely bear off with them in wild flight seas and lands and the vaults of heaven, sweeping them through space. But fearful of this, the Father Omnipotent hid them in gloomy, gloomy caverns, and over them piled high mountain masses, and gave them a king who, under fixed covenant, should be skilled to tighten and loosen the reins at command. Him Juno now addressed thus in suppliant speech. Aeolus, for to you the father of gods and king of men has given power to calm and uplift the waves with the wind. A people hateful to me sails the Tyrene Sea, carrying into Italy Ilium's vanquished gods. Hurl fury into your winds, sink and overwhelm the ships, or drive the men asunder and scatter their bodies on the deep. Twice seven nymphs have I of wondrous beauty, of whom Deopea, fairest of form, I will link to you in sure wedlock, making her yours for ever, that for such service of yours she may spend all her years with you and make you father of fair offspring. Thus answered Aeolus, Your task, O queen, is to search out your desire. My duty is to do your bidding. To your grace I owe all this my realm, to your grace my scepter and Jove's favor. You grant me a couch at the feasts of the gods and make me lord of clouds and storms. So he spoke, and, turning his spear, smote the hollow mount on its side, when, lo, the winds, as if in armed array, rush forth where passage is given, and blow in storm blasts across the world. They swoop down upon the sea, and from its lowest depths upheave it all. East and south winds together, and the southwester, thick with tempests, and shoreward roll vast billows. Then come the cries of men and creaking of cables. In a moment, clouds snatch sky and day from the Trojans' eyes. Black night broods over the deep. From pole to pole it thunders. The skies lighten with frequent flashes. All forebodes the sailor's instant death. Straightway, Aeneas' limbs weakened with chilling dread. He groans and, stretching his two upturned hands to heaven, thus cries aloud, O thrice and four times blessed, whose lot it was to meet death before their father's eyes beneath the lofty walls of Troy. O son of Tidius, bravest of the Danaan race, ah, that I could not fall on the alien plains and gasp out this lifeblood at your hand, where, under the spear of Eacides, fierce Hector lies prostrate, and mighty Sarpedon, where Simois seizes and sweeps beneath his waves so many shields and helms and bodies of the brave. As he flings forth such words, a gust shrieking from the north strikes full on his sail and lifts the waves to heaven. The oars snap, 
Then the prow swings round and gives the broadside to the waves. Down in a heap comes a sheer mountain of water. Some of the seamen hang upon the billow's crest. To others, the yawning sea shows ground beneath the waves. The surges sieve with sand. Three ships the south wind catches and hurls on hidden rocks. Rocks the Italian call the Italians call the altars, rising amidst the waves, a huge ridge topping the sea. Three the east forces from the deep into shallows and sandbanks, a piteous sight dashes on shawls and girds with a mound of sand. One which bore the Lycians and loyal Orontes before the eyes of Aeneas, a mighty toppling wave strikes astern. The helmsman is dashed out and hurled head foremost, but the ship is thrice on the same spot, whirled round and round by the wave and engulfed in the sea's devouring eddy. Here and there are seen swimmers in the vast abyss with weapons of men, planks, and Trojan treasure amid the waves. Now the stout ship of Ilioneus, now of brave Achates, and that wherein Aba sailed, and that of aged Aletis, the storm has mastered. With side joints loosened, all let in the hostile flood and gap gape at every seam. Meanwhile, Neptune saw the sea in a turmoil of wild uproar. The storm let loose and the still waters seething up from their lowest depths. Greatly troubled was he, and gazing out over the deep he raised a composed countenance above the water's surface. He sees Aeneas' fleet scattered over all the sea, the Trojans overwhelmed by the waves and by the falling heavens, nor did Juno's wiles and wrath escape her brother's eye. East wind and west he calls before him, then speaks thus. Has pride in your birth so gained control of you? Do you now dare winds without command of mind to mingle earth and sky and raise confusion thus? Whom I... But better it is to calm the troubled waves. Hereafter, with another penalty, shall you pay me for your crimes. Speed your flight and bear this word to your king. Not to him, but to me were given by lot the lordship of the sea and the dread trident. He holds the savage rocks, home of you and yours, east wind. In that hall, let Aeolus lord it and rule within the barred prison of the winds. Thus he speaks, and swifter than his word, he calms the swollen seas, puts to flight the gathered clouds, and brings back the sun. Simotoe and Triton, with common effort, thrust the ships from the sharp rock. The god himself levers them up with his trident, opens the vast quicksands, allays the flood, and on light wheels glides over the topmost waters. And as when oft times in a great nation tumult has risen, the base rubble rage angrily, and now brands and stones fly, madness lending arms. Then, if perchance there set eyes on a man honored for noble character and service, they are silent and stand by with attentive ears. With speech he sways their passion and soothes their breasts. Just so all the roar of ocean sank, soon as the sire, looking forth upon the waters and driving under a clear sky, guides his steeds and, flying onward, gives reins to his willing call. The wearied followers of Aeneas strive to run for the nearest shore and turn towards the coast of Libya. There, in a deep inlet, lies a spot where an island forms a harbour with the barrier of its sides, 
on which every wave from the main is broken, then parts into receding ripples. On either side loom heavenward huge cliffs and twin peaks, beneath whose crest far and wide is the stillness of sheltered water. Above, too, is a background of shimmering woods with an overhanging grove, black with gloomy shade. Under the brow of the fronting cliff is a cave of hanging rocks. Within are fresh waters and seats in the living stone, a haunt of nymph. Here, no fetters imprison weary ships, no anchor holds them fast with hooked bite. Here, with seven ships mustered from all his fleet, Aeneas takes shelter. And disembarking with earnest longing for the land, the Trojans gain the welcome beach and stretch their brine-drenched limbs upon the shore. At once, Achates struck a spark from flint, caught the fire in leaves, laid dry fuel about, and waved the flame amid the tinder. Then, wearied with their lot, they take out the corn of Ceres, spoiled by the waves, with the tools of Ceres, and prepare to parch the rescued grain in the fire and crush it under the stone. Meanwhile, Aeneas climbs a peak and seeks a full view far and wide over the deep. If he may but see aught of storm-tossed Antheus and his Thrygian galleys, or of Capis, or the arms of Caicus on the high stern. There is no ship in sight. He descries three stags straying on the shore. Whole herds follow behind these, and in long line graze down the valley. Thereon he stopped and seized in his hand his bow and swift arrows, the arms borne by faithful Achates. And first he lays low the leaders themselves, their heads held high with branching antlers, then routs the herd and all the common sort, driving them with his darts amid the leafy woods. Nor does he stay his hand till seven huge forms he stretches victoriously on the ground, equal in number to his ships. Then he seeks the harbor and divides them among all his company. Next he shares the wine with good Acestis, which good Acestis had stowed in jars on the Trinacrian shore, and hero-like had given at parting. And speaking thus, calms their sorrowing hearts. O oh, comrades, for he here this we have not been ignorant of misfortune. You who have suffered worse, this also God will end. You drew near to Scylla's fury and her deep echoing crags. You have known, too, the rocks of the Cyclops. Recall your courage and banish sad fear. Perhaps even this distress it will some day be a joy to recall. Through varied fortunes, through countless hazards, we journey towards Latium, where fate promises a home of peace. There it is granted that Troy's realm shall rise again. Endure and live for a happier day. <clears throat> Such words he spoke, while sick with deep distress, he feigns hope on his face and deep in his heart stifles his anguish. The others prepare the spoil, the feast that is to be. They flay the hides from the ribs and lay bare the flesh. Some cut in it into pieces and impale it, still quivering on spits. Others set cauldrons on the shore and feed them with fire. Then with food they revive their strength and stretched along the grass, take their fill of old wine and fat venison. When hunger was banished by the feast and the board was cleared, in long discourse they yearned for their lost comrades. 
but when hope and fear, uncertain whether to deem them still alive or bearing the final doom, and hearing no more when called. More than the rest does loyal Aeneas in silence mourn the loss now of valiant Orontes, now of Amicus, the cruel doom of Lycus, brave Gyas, and brave Cloanthus. Now all was ended, when from the sky's summit Jupiter looked forth upon the sail-winged sea and outspread lands, the shores and peoples far and wide, and, looking, paused on heaven's height and cast his eyes on Libya's realm. And lo, as on such cares he pondered in, in heart, Venus, saddened and her bright eyes brimming with tears, spoke to him. You that with eternal sway rule the world of men and gods, and frightened with your bolt, what great crime could my Aeneas, could my Trojans, have wrought against you, to whom, after many disasters born, the whole world is barred for Italy's sake? Surely it was your promise that from them some time, as the years rolled on, the Romans were to arise. From them, even from Teucer's restored line, should come rulers to hold the sea and all lands beneath their sway. What thought, Father, has turned you? That promise, indeed, was my comfort for Troy's fall and sad overthrow, when I weighed fate against the fates opposed. Now, though tried by so many disasters, the same fortune dogs them. What end of their toils, great king, do you grant? Antenor could escape the Achaean host, thread safely the Illyrian gulfs and inmost realms of the Liburnians, and pass the springs of Timavus, whence through nine mouths, with a mountain's mighty roar, it comes a bursting flood and buries the fields under its sounding sea. Yet here he set Padua's town, a home for his Teucrians, gave a name to the race, and hung up the arms of Troy. Now, settled in tranquil peace, he is at rest. But we, your offspring, to whom you grant the heights of heaven, have lost our ships, O oh, shame unutterable, and to appease one angry foe, are betrayed and kept far from Italian shores. And thus is piety honored? Is this the way you restore us to empire? Smiling on her with that look wherewith he clears sky and storms, the father of men and gods gently kissed his daughter's lips and then spoke thus. Spare your fears, Lady of Cythera. Your children's fates abide unmoved. You will see Lavinium's city and his promised walls, and great souled Aeneas you will raise on high to the starry heaven. No thought has turned me. This your son, for since this cares knows at your heart, I will speak, and further unrolling the scroll of fate will disclose its secrets, shall wage a great war in Italy, shall crush proud nations, and for his people shall set up laws and city walls, till the third summer has seen him reigning in Latium, and three winters have passed in camp since the Rutulians were laid low. But the lad Ascanius, now surnamed Eulus, Elus he was, while the Elian state stood firm in sovereignty, shall fulfill in empire thirty great circles of rolling mouths, shall shift his throne from Lavinian seat, and great in power, shall build the walls of Alba Longa. Here then, for thrice a hundred years, 
<clears throat> and broken shall the kingdom endure under Hector's race, until Ilia, a royal priestess, shall bear to Mars her twin offspring. Then Romulus, proud in the tiny hide of the she-wolf, his nurse, shall take up the line and found the walls of Mars, and call the people Romans after his own name. For these I set no bounds in space or time, but have given empire without end. Spiteful Juno, who now in her fear troubles sea and earth and sky, shall change to better counsels and with me cherish the Romans, lords of the world and the nation of the toga. Thus is it decreed. There shall come a day, as the sacred seasons glide past, when the house of Asaracus shall bring into bondage Phtia and fame Mycenae, and hold lordship over vanquished Argos. From this noble line shall be born the Trojan Caesar, who shall extend his empire to the ocean, his glory to the stars, as Julius, name descended from great Eulus. Him, in days to come, shall you, anxious no more, welcome to heaven, laden with eastern spoils. He, too, shall be invoked in vows. Then wars shall cease and savage ages soften. Hoary faith and Vesta, queerness with his brother Remus, shall give laws. The gates of war, green with iron and close-fitting bars, shall be closed. Within impious rage, sitting on savage arms, his hands fast bound behind with a hundred brazen knots, shall war in the ghastliness of blood-stained lips. <clears throat> So speaking, he sends the son of Maya down from heaven, that the land and towers of new-built Carthage may open to greet the Teucrians, and Dido, ignorant of fate, might not bar them from her lands. Through the wide air he flies on the orage of wings, and speedily alights on the Libyan coasts. At once he does his bidding, and God willing it, the Phoenicians lay aside their savage thoughts. Above all, the queen receives a gentle mind and gracious purpose towards the Teucrians. But loyal Aeneas, through the night revolving many a care, so soon as kindly light was given, determines to issue forth and explore the strange country, to learn to what coasts he has come with the wind, who dwells there, man or beast, for all he sees is waste, then bring back the tidings to his friends. The fleet he hides in overarching groves beneath a hollow rock, closely encircled by trees and quivering shade. Then, Achates alone attending, himself strides forth, grasping in hand two shafts, tipped with broad steel. Across his path, in the midst of the forest, came his mother, with a maiden's face and mien, and a maiden's arms, whether one of Sparta or such a one as Thracian Hopalis, when she outties horses and outstrips the winged east wind in flight. For from her shoulders in huntress fashion, she had slung the ready bow and had given her hair to the winds to scatter, her knee bare and her flowing robes gathered in a knot. Before he speaks, Ho, oh, she cries, tell me, youths, if perchance you have seen a sister of mine here straying, girt with quiver and a dappled lynx's hide, or pressing with shouts on the track of a foaming boar. <clears throat> thus Venus, and thus in answer Venus' son began. None of your sisters have I heard or seen, but by what name should I call you, maiden? 
For your face is not mortal, nor has your voice a human ring. O goddess, surely, sister of Phoebus, or one of the race of nymphs, show grace to us, whoever you may be, and lighten this our burden. Inform us, pray, beneath what sky, on what coasts of the world we are cast. Knowing nothing of countries or peoples, we wander driven hither by wind and huge billows. Many a victim shall fall for you at our hand before your altars. Then said Venus, Nay, I claim no, not such worship. Tyrian maids are wont to wear the quiver and bind their ankles high with the purple buskin. It is the Punic realm, you see, a Tyrian people and the city of Agenor. But the bordering country is Libyan, a race unconquerable in war. Dido wields the scepter. Dido, who, fleeing from her brother, came from the city of Tyre. Long would be the tale of wrong, long its winding course. But the main heads of the story I will trace. Her husband was Sychaeus, richest in gold of the Phoenicians, and fondly loved by unhappy Dido. To him her father had given the maiden, yoking her to him in the first bridal auspices. But the kingdom of Tyre was in the hands of her brother Pygmalion, monstrous in crime beyond all others. Between these two came frenzy. The king, impiously before the altars and blinded by lust for gold, strikes down Sychaeus unawares by stealthy blow, without a thought for his sister's love. And for long he hid the deed, and by many a pretense cunningly cheated the lovesick bride with empty hope. But in her sleep came the very ghost of, the, of her unburied husband. Raising his pale face in wondrous wise, he laid bare the cruel altars, and his breast pierced with steel, unveiling all the secret horror of the house. Then he bids her take speedy flight and leave her country, and to aid her journey, brought to light treasures long hidden underground, a mass of gold and silver known to none. Moved by this, Dido made ready her flight and her company. Then all assemble who felt towards the tyrant relentless hatred or keen fear. Ships, which by chance were ready, they seize and load with gold. The wealth of grasping Pygmalion is born overseas, the leader of the enterprise, a woman. They came to the place where today you will see the huge walls and rising citadel of New Carthage, and bought ground. Bursa, they called it therefrom, as much as they could encompass with a bull's hide, and they are choosing laws and magistrates in an august senate. But who, pray, are you, or from what coasts come, or whither hold you your course? As she questioned, thus he replied, sighing and drawing every word deep from his breast. <coughs> o oh, goddess, should I, tracing back from the first beginning, go on to tell, and you have leisure to hear the story of our woes, sooner would heaven close and evening lay the day to rest. From ancient Troy, if perchance the name of Troy has come to your ears, sailing over distant seas, the storm at its own caprice drove us to the Libyan coast. I am the loyal Aeneas, who carry with me in my fleet my household gods snatched from the foe. My fame is known to the heavens above. It is Italy I seek, my father's land, and a race sprung from Jupiter's most high. With twice ten ships I embarked on the Thrygian sea, following the fates declared, my goddess mother pointing me the, the way. Scarcely do seven remain, 
shattered by waves and wind. Myself unknown and destitute, I wander over the Libyan wastes, driven from Europe and from Asia. His further complaint, Venus suffered not, but in the midst of his lament broke in thus, <clears throat> Whoever you are, not hateful, I think, to the powers of heaven, do you draw the breath of life, since you have reached the Tyrian city. Only go forward and make your way to the queen's palace, for I bring you tidings of your comrades restored and of your fleet recovered, driven to safe heaven by shifting winds, unless my parents were false and vain the augury they taught me. Look at those twelve swans in exultant line, which Jove's bird, swooping from the expanse of heaven, was harrying in the open air. Now in long array they seem either to be settling in their places or already to be gazing down on the places where others have settled. As they, returning, sport with rustling wings and in company have circled the sky and uttered their songs, with like joy, your ships and the men of your company have reached harbor already or under full sail enter the river's mouth. Only go forward and where the path leads you, direct your steps. She spoke and as she turned away, her roseate neck flashed bright from her head. Her ambrosial tresses breathed celestial fragrance. Down to her feet fell her raiment, and in her step she was revealed the very goddess. He knew her for his mother, and as she fled, pursued her with these words, Why, cruel like others, do you so often mock your son with vain fan phantoms? Why am I not allowed to clasp hand in hand and hear and utter words unfeigned? Thus he reproaches her and bends his steps towards the city. But Venus shrouded them as they went with dusky air and enveloped them, goddess as she was, in a thick mantle of cloud that none might see or touch them, none delay or seek the cause of their coming. She herself through the sky goes her way to Pathos and joyfully revisits her abode where the temple and its hundred altars steam with Sabian incense and are fragrant with garlands ever fresh. <clears throat> Meanwhile, they sped on the road where the pathway points and now they were climbing the hill that looms large over the city and looks down on the confronting towers. Aeneas marvels at the massive buildings, mere huts once, marvels at the gates, the din, and paved high roads. Eagerly the Tyrians press on, some to build walls to rear the citadel and roll up stones by hand some to choose the site for a dwelling and enclose it with a furrow. Here some are digging harbors. Here others lay the deep foundation of their theater and hew out of the cliffs vast columns, fit adornment for the stage to be. Even as bees in early summer, amid flowery fields, ply their task in sunshine, when they lead forth the full-grown young of their race, or pack the fluid honey and strain their sails to bursting with sweet nectar, or receive the burdens, burdens of incomers, or in martial array drive from their faults the drones, a lazy herd. All aglow is the work, and the fragrant honey is sweet with thyme. Happy they whose walls already rise, cries Aeneas, lifting his eyes towards the city roofs. Veiled in a cloud, he enters, wondrous to tell, through their midst, and mingles with the people, seen by none. <clears throat> Amid the city was a grove, luxuriant in shade, the spot where first the Phoenicians, tossed by waves and whirlwind, 
dug up the token which Queen Lee Juno had pointed out ahead of the spirited horse. For thus was the race to be famous in war and rich in substance through the ages. Here Sidonian Dido was founding to Juno a mighty temple, rich in gifts and the presence of the goddess. Brazen was its threshold, uprising on steps. Bronze plates were its lintel beams, on doors of bronze creaked the hinges. In this grove first did a strange sight appear to him and allay his fears. Here first did Aeneas dare to hope for safety and put sure trust in his shattered fortunes. For while beneath the mighty temple awaiting the queen, he scans each object, while he marvels at the city's fortune, the handicraft of the several artists and the work of their so toil, he sees in due order the battles of Ilium, the warfare now known by fame throughout the world, the sons of Atreus and Priam and Achilles, fierce in his wrath against both. He stopped and weeping cried, Is there any place, Achates, any land on earth not full of our sorrow? See, there is Priam. Here, too, virtue finds its due reward. Here, too, are tears from misfortune and human sorrows pierce the heart. Dispel your fears. This fame will bring you some salvation. <clears throat> so he speaks and feasts his soul on the unsubstantial portraiture, sighing oft, and his face wet with a flood of tears. For he saw how, as they fought round Pergamus, here the Greeks were in rout, the Trojan youth hard on their heels. There fled the Thrygians, plumed Achilles in his chariot, pressing them close. Not far away, he discerns with tears the snowy canvas stance of Rhesus, which betrayed in their first sleep the blood-stained son of Tydeus laid waste with many a death and turned the fiery steeds away to the camp before they could taste Trojan fodder or drink of Xanthus. Elsewhere, Troilus, his armor flung away in flight, unhappy boy and ill-mashed in conflict with Achilles, is carried along by his horses and, fallen backward, clings to the empty car, still clasping the reins. His neck and hair are dragged over the ground and the dust is scored by his reversed spear. Meanwhile, to the temple of unfriendly Pallas, the Trojan women passed along with streaming tresses and bore the robe, mourning in suppliant guise and beating breasts with hands. With averted face, the goddess kept her eyes fast upon the ground. Thrice had Achilles dragged Hector round the walls of Troy and was selling the lifeless body for gold. Then, indeed, from the bottom of his heart, he heaves a deep groan as he spoils as the chariot as the very corpse of his friend met his gaze, and Priam outstretching weaponless hands. Himself, too, in close combat with the Achaean chiefs, he recognized, and the eastern ranks, and swarthy Memnon's armor. Penthesilae, in fury, leads the crescent-shielded ranks of the Amazons, and blazes amid her thousands. A golden belt she binds below her naked breast, and as a warrior queen dares battle a maid clashing with men. While these wondrous sights are seen by Dardan Aeneas, while in amazement he hangs wrapped in one fixed gaze, the queen, Dido, moved towards the temple of surpassing beauty with a vast company of youths thronging round her. Even as on Eurotas banks, or along the heights of Synthus, Diana guides her dancing bands, in whose train a thousand oreads troop to right and left. She bears a quiver on her shoulder, and as she treads over tops all the goddesses. Joys thrill Latona's silent breast, 
such was Dido. So moved she joyously through their midst, pressing on the work of her rising kingdom. Then, at the door of the goddess, beneath the temple's central dome, girt with arms and high enthroned, she took her seat. Laws and ordinances she gave to her people, their tasks she adjusted in equal shares or assigned by lot. When suddenly Aeneas sees approaching in the midst of a great crowd, Antheus and Sergestus and brave Cloanthus with others of the Trojans, whom the black storm had scattered on the sea and driven far away to other coasts. Amazed was he. Amazed, too, was Achates, thrilled with joy and fear. They burned with eagerness to clasp hands, but the uncertain event confuses their hearts. They keep hidden and clothed in, in the enfolding cloud, look to see what is their comrade's fortune, on what shore they leave the fleet, and why they come. For from all the ships chosen men advanced, craving grace and with loud cries made for the temple. <clears throat> when they had entered, and freedom to speak before the queen was granted, the eldest, Ilionius, with placid mien, thus began, Queen, to whom Jupiter has granted to found a new city, and to put the curb of justice on haughty tribes, we, unhappy Trojans, tempest-driven over every sea, make our prayer to you. Ward off the horror of flames from our ships, spare a pious race, and look more graciously on our fortunes. We have not come to spoil with the sword your Libyan homes, or to drive stolen booty to the shore. No such violence is in our hearts, nor have the vanquished such assurance. A place there is, by Greeks named Hesperia, an ancient land, mighty in arms and wealth of soil. There dwelt Enotrians. Now the rumor is that a younger race has called it from their leader's name, Italy. Hither lay our course, when, rising with sudden swell, stormy Orion bore us on hidden shoals, and with fierce blasts scattered us afar amid pathless rocks and waves of overwhelming surge. Hither to your shores have we few drifted. What race of man is this? What land is so barbarous as to allow this custom? We are debarred the welcome of the beach. They stir up wars and forbid us to set foot on the border of their land. If you think light of human kinship and mortal arms, yet look unto gods who will remember right and wrong. A king we had, Aeneas, none more just or dutiful than he, or more renowned in war and arms. If fate still preserves that hero, if he feeds on the air of heaven and lies not yet in the cruel shades, we have no fear, nor would you regret to have taken the first step in the strife of courtesy. In Sicilian regions, too, there are cities and a supply of arms, and a prince of Trojan blood, famed Asestis. <clears throat> Grant us to beach our storm-battered fleet, to fashion planks in the forest and trim oars, so that if we are granted to find king and comrades and steer our course to Italy, Italy and Latium we may gladly seek. But if our salvation is cut off, if you, noble father of the Trojan people, are the prey of the Libyan Gulf, and a nation's hope no longer lives in Eulus, that we at least may seek the straits of Sicily, whence we came hither, and the homes they are ready, and assist us for our king. So spoke Ilioneus, and all the sons of Dardanus loud, loudly shouted assent. Then Dido, lowering her eyes, briefly speaks, Free your hearts of fear, Teucrians. Put away your cares. 
stern necessity and the new estate of my kingdom force me to do such hard deeds and protect my frontiers far and wide with guards. Who could be ignorant of the race of Aeneas' people? Who of Troy's town and her brave deeds and brave men or of the fires of that great war? Not so dull are our Punic hearts, and not so far from this Tyrian city does the sun yoke his steeds. Whether your choice be great Hesperia and the fields of Saturn, or the lands of Eryx and Nasistis for your king, I will send you hands guarded by an escort and aid you with my wealth. Or is it your wish to settle with me on even terms within these realms? The city I build is yours. Draw up your ships. Trojan and Tyrian I shall treat alike. And would that your king were here, driven by the same wind, Aeneas himself. Nay, I will send trusty scouts along the coast and bid them traverse the ends of Libya if perchance his trace shipwrecked in forest or in town. Stirred in spirit by these words, brave Achaetus and father Aeneas had long burned to break through the cloud. First, Achaetus addresses Aeneas, Goddess born, what purpose now rises in your heart? You see that all is safe, comrades and fleet restored. One only is wanting, whom our own eyes saw engulfed amid the waves. All else agrees with your mother's words. Scarce had he said this when the encircling cloud suddenly parts and clears into open heaven. Aeneas stood forth, gleaming in the clear light, godlike in face and shoulders, for his mother herself had shed upon her son the beauty of flowing locks with youth's ruddy bloom, and on his eyes a joyous luster, even as the beauty which the hand gives to ivory, on when silver or parian marble is set in yellow gold. Then thus he addresses the queen, and unforeseen by all, suddenly speaks, I, whom you seek, am here before you, Aeneas of Troy, snatched from the Libyan waves. O oh, you who alone have pitied Troy's unutterable woes, you who grant us the remnant left by the Greeks, now outworn by every mischance of land and sea and destitute of all, a share in your city and home, to pay you fitting thanks, Dido, is not in our power, nor in theirs, who anywhere survive of Trojan race, scattered over the wide world. May the gods, if any divine powers have regard for the good, if there is any justice anywhere, may the gods and the consciousness of right bring you worthy rewards. What happy ages bore you! What glorious parents gave birth to so noble a child! While rivers run to ocean, while on the mountains shadows move over slopes, while heaven feeds the stars, ever shall your honor, your name, and your praises abide, whatever be the lands that summon me. So saying, he grasps his dear Ilioneus with the right hand, and with the left, Serestus, then others, brave Gaius and brave Cloanthus. Sidonian Dido was amazed, first at the sight of the hero, then at his strange misfortune, and thus her lips made utterance. What fate pursues you, goddess born, amid such perils? What violence drives you to savage shores? Are you that Aeneas whom gracious Venus bore to Dardanian Anchises by the wave of Phrygian Simois? Indeed, I myself remember well Teucer's coming to Sidon, when exiled from his native land he sought a new kingdom by aid of Belus. My father Belus was then wasting rich Cyprus and held it under his victorious sway. From that time on the fall of the Trojan city has been known to me. 
known to your name and the Pelagian kings. For though he was, he often lauded the Teucrians with highest praise and claimed that he was sprung from the Teucrians' ancient stock. Come, therefore, sirs, and pass within our halls. Me, too, has a like fortune driven through many toils, and willed that in this land I should at last find rest. Not ignorant of ill, I learn to aid distress. Thus she speaks, and at once leads Aeneas into the royal house, at once proclaims a sacrifice at the temples of the gods. Meanwhile, not less careful, is she to send his comrades on the shore twenty bulls, a hundred huge swine with bristling backs, a hundred fatted lambs with their ewes, the joyous gifts of the god. But the palace within is laid out with the splendor of princely pomp, and amid the halls they prepare a banquet. Coverlets there are, skillfully embroidered and of royal purple. On the tables is massive silver plate, and in gold are graven the doughty deeds of her sires, a long, long course of exploits traced through many a hero from the early dawn of the race. Aeneas, for a father's love did not suffer his heart to rest, speedily sends Achates forward to the ships to carry this news to Ascanius and lead him to the city. In Ascanius, all his fond parental care here is centered. Presents, too, snatched from the wreck of Ilium, he bids him bring a mantle stiff with figures wrought in gold and a veil fringed with yellow acanthus, once worn by Argive Helen when she sailed for Pergamus and her unlawful marriage. She had brought them from Mycenae, the wondrous gift of her mother Leda, the scepter, too, which Ilione, Priam's eldest daughter, once had borne, a necklace hung with pearls, and a coronet with double circlet of jewels and gold. Speeding these commands, Achaetus bent his way towards the ships. But the Cytherian revolves in her breast new wiles, new schemes. How Cupid, changed in face and form, may come in the stead of sweet Ascanius, and by his gifts kindle the queen to madness and send a flame into her very marrow. In truth, she fears the uncertain house and double-tongued Tyrians. Juno's fury chafes her, and at nightfall her care rushes back. Therefore, to winged love, she speaks these words. Son, my strength, my mighty power, O son, who alone scorned the mighty father's typhoian darts, to you I flee, and supply and sue your godhead. How your brother Aeneas is tossed on the sea about all coasts by bitter Juno's hate is known to you, and often have you grieved in our grief. Phoenician Dido now holds him, staying him with soft words, and I dread what may be the outcome of Juno's hospitality. At such a turning point of fortune she will not be idle. Wherefore, I purpose to outwit the queen with guile and encircle her with love's flame, that so no power may change her, but on my side she may be held fast in strong love for Aeneas. How you can do this, take now my thought. The princely boy, my chief of care, at his dear father's bidding, makes ready to go to the Sidonian city, bearing gifts that survive the sea and the flames of Troy. Him will I lull to sleep, and on the heights of Cythera or of Idalium will hide in my sacred sh shrine, so that he may by no means learn my wiles or come between to thwart them. For but a single night, feigned by craft is form, and boy that you are, Dawn the boy's familiar face, so that when, in the fullness of her joy, amid the royal feast and the flowing wine, 
Dido takes you to her bosom, embraces you, and imprints sweet kisses. You may breathe into her a hidden fire and beguile her with your poison. Love obeys his dear mother's words, lay by his wings, lays by his wings, and walks joyously with the step of Eulus. But Venus pours over the limbs of Ascanius the dew of gentle repose, and fondling him in her bosom, uplifts him with divine power to Idalia's high groves, where soft marjoram enwraps him in flowers and the breath of its sweet shade. And now, obedient to her word and rejoicing, rejoicing in Achates as guide, Cupid went forth, carrying the royal gifts for the Tyrians. As he enters, the queen has already, amid royal hangings, laid herself on a golden couch and taken her place in their midst. Now, Father Aeneas, now the Trojan youth gather, and the guests recline on coverlets of purple. Servants pour water on their hands, serve bread from baskets, and bring smooth shorn napkins. There are fifty serving maids within, whose task it is to arrange the long feast in order and keep the hearth aglow with fire. A hundred more there are with as many pages of like age to load the board with viands and set out the cups. The Tyrians, too, are gathered in throngs throughout the festal halls. Summoned to recline on the embroidered couches, they marvel at the gifts of Aeneas, marvel at Eulus, at the gods' glowing looks and well-feigned words, at the robe and veil embroidered with saffron acanthus. Above all, the unhappy Phoenician, doomed to impending ruin, cannot satiate her soul, but takes fire as she gazes, thrilled alike by the boy and by the gifts. He, when he has hung in embrace on Aeneas' neck and satisfied the deluded father's deep love, goes to the queen. With her eyes, with all her heart, she clings to him and repeatedly fondles him in her lap, knowing not, poor Dido, how great a god settles there to her sorrow. But he, mindful of his Acidalian mother, little by little begins to efface Sychaeus and essays with a living passion to surprise her long slumbering soul and her heart unused to love. When first there came a lull in the feasting and the boards were cleared, they set down great balls and crowned the wine. A din arises in the palace and voices roll through the spacious halls. Lighted lamps hang down from the fretted roof of gold, and flaming torches drive out the night. Then the queen called for a cup heavy with jewels and gold, and filled it with wine, one that Bellus and all of Bellus' line had been wont to use. Then through the hall fell silence. Jupiter, for they say that you appoint laws for host and guest, grant that this be a day of joy for Tyrians and the voyagers from Troy, and that our children may remember it. May Bacchus, giver of joy, be near, and bounteous Juno, and do you, Tyrians, grace the gathering with friendly spirit. She spoke, and on the board offered a libation of wine, and after the libation was first to touch the goblet with her lips, then with a challenge gave it to Bitius. He briskly drained the foaming cup and drank deep in the brimming gold, then other lords drank. Long-haired Iopas, once taught by mighty Atlas, makes the whole ring with his golden lyre. He sings of the wandering moon and the sun's toils, when sprang man and beast, when rain and fire, of Acturus, the reigning Hyades and the twin bears, 
why wintry suns make such haste to dip themselves in ocean, or what delay stays the slowly passing nights. With shout on shout, the Tyrians applaud and the Trojans follow. No less did unhappy Dido prolong the night with varied talk and drank deep draughts of love, asking much of Priam, of Hector much, now of the armor in which came the son of dawn, now of the wondrous steeds of Diomedes, now of the greatness of Achilles. Nay, more, she cries, tell us, my guest, from the first beginning, the treachery of the Greeks, the sad fate of your people and your own wanderings. For already a seventh summer bears you a wanderer over every land and sea. Hello, I'm Gregory Soderberg, and I'm a teacher with Kepler Education. I teach medieval humanities, rhetoric, logic, um, Greek, and economics. And, I'm, and I'll be reading today from the Robert Fagel's translation of the Aeneid, Book Two, The Final Hours of Troy. Silence. All fell hushed, their eyes fixed on Aeneas now, as the founder of his people, high on a seat of honor, set out on his story. Sorrow, unspeakable sorrow, my queen, you ask me to bring to life once more how the Greeks uprooted Troy and all her power, our kingdom mourned forever. What horrors I saw, a tragedy where I played a leading role myself. Who could tell such things, not even a Myrmidon, a Delopian, or comrade of iron-hearted Ulysses, and still refrain from tears? And now, too, the dank night is sweeping down from the sky, and the setting stars incline our heads to sleep. But if you long so deeply to know what we went through, to hear, in brief, the last great agony of Troy, much as I shudder at the memory of it all, I shrank back in grief. I'll try to tell it now. Ground down by the war and driven back by fate, the Greek captains had watched the years slip by until, helped by Minerva's superhuman skill, they built that mammoth horse, immense as a mountain, lining its ribs with ship timbers hewn from pine, and offering to secure safe passage home, or so they pretend, and the story spreads through Troy. But they pick by lot the best, most able-bodied men, and stealthily lock them in the horse's dark flanks, till the vast hold of the monster's womb is packed with soldiers' bristling weapons. Just inside of Troy, an island rises, Tenedos, famed in the old songs, powerful, rich, while Priam's realm stood fast. Now it's only a bay, a treacherous cove for ships. Well, there they sail, hiding out on its lonely coast while we thought, gone, sped home on the winds to Greece. So all Troy breathes free, relieved of her endless sorrow. We fling open the gates and stream out, elated to see the Greeks' abandoned camp, the deserted beachhead. Here the Dilopians formed ranks. Here savage Achilles pitched his tents. Over there the Armada moored, and here the familiar killing fields of battle. Some gaze wonderstruck at the gift for Pallas, the virgin never wed, transfixed by the horse, its looming mass, our doom. Thymoetes leads the way. Drag it inside the walls, he urges, plant it high on the city heights. Inspired by treachery now, or the fate of Troy, was moving towards this end. But Cappies, with other saner heads who took his side, suspecting a trap in any gift the Greeks might offer, tells us, Fling it into the sea, or torch the thing to ash, or bore it into the depths of its womb where men can hide. The common people are split into warring factions. But now, out in the lead with a troop of comrades, down Laocoon runs from the heights in full fury, calling out from a distance, Poor doomed foals, have you gone mad, you Trojans? You really believe the enemy sailed away? Or any gift of the Greeks is free of guile? Is that how well you know, Ulysses? Trust me, either the Greeks are hiding, shut inside those beams, or the horse is a battle engine geared to breach our walls, spy on our homes, come down on our city, overwhelm us, 
or some other deceptions lurking deep inside it. Trojans never trust that horse. Whatever it is, I fear the Greeks, especially bearing gifts. In that spirit, with all his might, he hurled a huge spear straight into the monster's flanks, the mortised timber work of its swollen belly. Quivering there it stuck, and the stricken womb came booming back from its depths with echoing groans. If fate and our own wits had not gone against us, surely Laocoon would have driven us on now, to rip the Greek lair open with iron spears, and Troy would still be standing, proud fortress of Priam. You would tower still. Suddenly, in the thick of it all, a young soldier, hands shackled behind his back, with much shouting. Trojan shepherds were hailing him toward the king. They'd come on, on the man by chance, a total stranger. He'd given himself up with one goal in mind, to open Troy to the Greeks and lay her waste. He trusted to courage, nerved for either end, to weave his lies or face his certain death. Young Trojan recruits, keen to have a look, came scurrying up from all sides, crowding around, outdoing each other to make a mockery of the captive. Now hear the treachery of the Greeks and learn from a single crime the nature of the beast. Haggard, helpless, there in our midst he stood, all eyes riveted on him now. Turning a wary glance at the line of Trojan troops, he groaned and spoke, Where can I find some refuge? Where on land, on sea? What's left for me now, a man of so much misery? Nothing among the Greeks, no place at all. And worse, I see my Trojan enemies crying for my blood. His groans convince us, cutting us all of our violence short. We press him, tell us where were you born, your family, what news do you bring? Tell us what you trust to, such a willing captive. All of it, my king, I'll tell you, come what may, the whole true story. Greek I am, I don't deny it, know that first. Fortune may have made me a man of misery, but wicked as she is, she can't make Sinon a lying fraud as well. Now perhaps you've caught some rumor of Palamedes, Bella's son, and his shining fame that rings in song. The Greeks charged him with treason, a trumped-up charge, an innocent man, and just because he opposed the war, they put him to death. But once he's robbed of the light, they mourn him sorely. Now I was his blood kin, a youngster when my father, a poor man, sent me off to the war at Troy as Palamedes' comrade. Long as he kept his royal status, holding forth in the council of kings, I had some standing too, some pride of place. But once he left the land of the living... Thanks to the jealous forked tongue of our Ulysses, you're no stranger to his story, I was shattered. I dragged out my life in the shadows, grieving, seething alone, in silence, outraged by my innocent friend's demise, until I burst out like a madman, swore if I ever returned in triumph to our native Argos, ever got the chance, I'd take revenge, and my oath provoked a storm of hatred. That was my first step on the slippery road to ruin. From then on, Ulysses kept tormenting me, pressing charge on charge. From then on, he brooded about his two-edged rumors among the rank and file. Driven by guilt, he looked for ways to kill me. He never rested until making Calchas his henchman. But why now? Why go over that unforgiving ground again? Why waste words? If you think all Greeks are one, if hearing the name Greek is enough for you, it's high time you made me pay the price." How that would please the man of Ithaca. How the sons of Atreus would repay you. Now, of course, we burn to question him, urge him to explain, blind to how false the cunning Greeks could be. All a tremble, he carries on his tale, lying from the cockles of his heart. Time and again the Greeks had yearned to abandon Troy, bone-tired from a long, hard war, to put it far behind and beat a clean retreat. Would to God they had. But time and again, as they were setting sail, the heavy seas would keep them confined to port, and the south wind filled their hearts with dread, and worst of all, once this horse, this massive timber with locking planks, stood stationed here at last, the thunderheads rumbled up and down the sky. So at our wit's end, we send Euripleus off to question Apollo's oracle now, and back he comes from the god's shrine with these bleak words. With blood you appease the winds with a virgin sacrifice. When you, you Greeks, foresought the shores of Troy, with blood you must seek fair winds to sail you home, must sacrifice one more Greek life in return. 
As the word spread, the ranks were struck dumb, and icy fear sent shivers down their spines. Whom did the god demand? Who would meet his doom? Just that moment, the Ithacan hailed the prophet Calchas into our midst. He twisted out of him. What was the god's will? The army roars and rose in uproar. Even then, our soldiers sensed that I was the one. The target of that Ulysses' vicious schemes, they saw it coming. Still, they held their tongues. For ten days the seer, silent, closed off in his tent, refused to say a word or betray a man to death. But at last, goaded on by Ulysses' mounting threats, but in fact conniving in their plot, he breaks his silence and dooms me to the altar, and the army gave consent. The death that each man dreaded turned to the fate of one poor soul, a burden they could bear. The day of infamy soon came. The sacred rites were all performed for the victim, the salted meal strewn, the bands tied round my head. But I broke free of death, I tell you, burst my shackles, yes, and hid all night in the reeds of a marshy lake, waiting for them to sail. If only they would sail. Well, no hope now of seeing the land where I was born, or my sweet children, the father I longed for all these years. Maybe they'll wring from them the price for my escape. Avenge my guilt with my loved one's blood. Poor things! I beg you, king, by the powers who know the truth, by any trust still uncorrupt in the world of men, pity a man whose torment knows no bounds. Pity me in my pain. I know in my soul I don't deserve to suffer. He wept and won his life, our pity too. Priam takes command, has him freed from the ropes and chains that bound him fast and hails him warmly. Whoever you are, from now on, now you've lost the Greeks. Put them out of your mind, and you'll be one of us. But answer my questions. Tell me the whole truth. Why did they raise up this giant monstrous horse? Who conceived it? What's it for? Its purpose? A gift to the gods? A great engine of battle? He broke off. Sinon, adept at deceit, with all his Greek cunning, lifted up his hands, just freed from their fetters, up to the stars, and prayed. Bear witness, you eternal fires of the sky, and you inviolate will of the gods. Bear witness, altar and those infernal knives that I escaped in the sacred bands I I wore myself. The victim, it's right to break my sworn oath to the Greeks. It's right to detest those men and bring to light all their hiding now. No laws of my native land can bind me here. Just keep your promise, Troy. And if I can save you, you must save me too, if I reveal the truth and pay you back in full. All the hopes of the Greeks, their firm faith in a war they launched themselves, had always hinged on Pallas Athena's help. But from the moment that godless Diomedes, flanked by Ulysses, the mastermind of crime, attacked and tore the fateful image of Pallas out of her hallowed shrine and cut down the sentries, ringing your city heights and seized the holy image and even dared touch the sacred bands on the virgin goddess's head with hands reeking blood. From that hour on, the high hopes of the Greeks had trickled away like a slow ebbing tide. They were broken, beaten men, the will of the goddess dead set against them. Omens of this she gave in no uncertain terms. They'd hardly stood her image up in the Greek camp when flickering fire shot from its glaring eyes and salt sweat ran glistening down its limbs, and three times the goddess herself, a marvel, blazed forth from the ground, shield clashing, spear brandished. The prophet spurs them at once to risk escape by sea. You cannot root out Troy with your Greek spears unless you seek new omens in Greece and bring the god back here. The image they'd borne across the sea in their curved ships. So now they've sailed away on the wind for home shores, just to rearm, recruit their gods as allies yet again, then measure back their course on the high seas. Back they'll come to attack you all off guard. So Calchas read the omens. At his command, they raised this horse, this effigy, all to atone for the violated image of Pallas, her wounded pride, her power, and expiate the outrage they had done. But he made them do the work on a grand scale, a tremendous mass of interlocking timbers towering toward the sky, so the horse could not be trundled through your gates, or hauled inside your walls, or guard your people if they revered it well, in the old ancient way. For if your hand should violate this great offering to Minerva, a total disaster, 
if only the God would turn it against the seer himself, will wheel down on Priam's empire, Troy, and all your futures. But if your hands will rear it up into your city, then all Asia in arms can invade Greece, can launch an all-out war right up to the walls of Pelops. That's the doom that awaits our son's sons. Trapped by his craft, that cunning liar, Sinon, we believed his story. His tears, his treachery, sieves the men whom neither Tidius' son nor Achilles could defeat, nor ten long years of war, nor all the thousand ships. But a new portent strikes our doomed people. Now a greater omen, far more terrible, fatal, shakes our senses, blind to what is coming. Laocaeun, the priest of Neptune, picked by Lot, was sacrificing a massive bull at the holy altar when, I cringe to recall it now, look there, over the calm deep strapes of Ophtenidos swim twin giant serpents, rearing in coils, breasting the sea swell side by side, plunging toward the shore, their heads, their blood-red crests surging over the waves, their bodies thrashing, backs roiling in coil on mammoth coil, and the wake behind them churns in a roar of foaming spray. And now their eyes glittering, shot with blood and fire, flickering tongues, licking their massing maws. Yes, now, they're about to land. We blanch at the sight, we scatter, like troops on attack. They're headed straight for Laocoon. First, each serpent seizes one of his small sons, constricting, twisting round him, sinks its fangs in the tortured limbs, and gorges. Next, Laocoon, rushing quick to the rescue, Clutching his sword, they trap him, bind him in huge muscular whorls, their scaly backs lashing round his midriff twice, and twice round his throat, their heads, their flaring necks, mounting over their victim, writhing still, his hands frantic to wrench apart their knotted trunks, his priestly bands splattered in filth, black venom, and all the while his horrible screaming fills the skies, bellowing like some wounded bull, struggling to shrug loose from his neck and axe that struck awry to lumber clear of the altar. Only the twin snakes escape, sliding off and away to the heights of Troy where the ruthless goddess holds her shrine and there at their feet they hide, vanishing under Minerva's great round shield. At once, I tell you, a stranger fear runs through the harrowed crowd. Leia Cajon deserved to pay for his outrage, so they say. He desecrated the sacred timbers of the horse. He hurled his wicked lance at the beast's back. Haul Minerva's effigy up to her house, we shout. Offer our prayers to the power of the goddess. We breach our own ramparts, fling our defenses open. All pitch into the work. Smooth running rollers we wheel beneath its hoofs and heavy hempen ropes we bind around its neck. And teeming with men-at-arms, the huge deadly engine climbs over city walls. And round it, boys and unwed girls sing hymns, thrilled to lay a hand on the dangling ropes. As on and on it comes, gliding into the city, looming high over the city's heart. O oh, my country, Troy, home of the gods, you great walls of the Dardans, long renowned in war. Four times it lurched to a halt at the very brink of the gates, Four times the armor clashed out from its womb, but we, we forged ahead, oblivious, blind, insane. We stationed the monster, fraught with doom and the hollowed heights of Troy. Even now Cassandra revealed the future, opening lips the gods had ruled no Trojan would believe. And we, poor fools, on this our last day... We deck the shrines of the gods with green holiday garlands all throughout the city. But all the while, the skies kept wheeling on and night come sweeping in from the ocean stream in its math mammoth shadow, swallowing up the earth and the pole star and the treachery of the Greeks. Dead quiet. The Trojans slept on, strewn throughout the fortress, weary bodies embraced by slumber, but the Greek armada was on way now, crossing over from Tenedos. Ships in battle formation, under the moon's quiet light, their silent ally, homing in on the berths they knew by heart. When the ship's king sends up a signal flare, the cue for Sinon, saved by the fate's unjust decree, 
and stealthily loosing the pine bolts of the horse. He unleashes the Greek shut up inside its womb. The horse stands open wide, fighters in high spirits, pouring out of its timbered cavern into the fresh air. The chiefs, the Sandrus, Thethanus, ruthless Ulysses, repelling down a rope they dropped from its side, and Achamus, Thoaz, Neopolemus, son of Achilles, Captain Machaon, Menelaus, Epius himself, the man who built that masterpiece of fraud. They steal on a city buried deep in sleep and wine. They butcher the guards, fling open the gates, and hug their cohorts poised to combine forces. Plot complete. This was the hour when rest, that gift of the gods, most heaven sent, first comes to beleaguered mortals, creeping over us now, when look, there, I dreamed I saw Prince Hector but before my eyes. My comrade haggard with sorrow, streaming tears, just as he once was when dragged behind the chariot, black with blood and grime, thongs piercing his swollen feet. What a harrowing sight! What a far cry from the old Hector, home from battle, decked in Achilles' arms, his trophies, or fresh from pitching Trojan fire at the Greek ships, his beard matted now, his hair clotted with blood, bearing the wounds, so many wounds he suffered, fighting round his native city's walls. I dreamed I addressed him first, in tears myself. I forced my voice from the depths of all my grief. O light of the Trojans, last best hope of Troy, what's held you back so long? How long we've waited, Hector, for you to come, and now, from what far shores? How glad we are to see you, we battle-weary men, after so many deaths, your people dead and gone. After your citizens, your city felt such pain. But what outrage has mutilated your face so clear and cloudless once? Why these wounds? Wasting no words, no time on empty questions, heaving a deep groan from his heart, he calls out, Escape, son of the goddess! Tear yourself from the flames! The enemy holds our walls. Troy is toppling from her heights. You have paid your debt to our king and native land. If one strong arm could have saved Troy, my arm would have saved the city. Now into your hand she entrusts her holy things, her household gods. Take them with you as comrades in your fortunes. Seek a city for them. Once you have roved the seas, erect great walls at last to house the gods of Troy. Urging so with his own hands, he carries Vesta forth from her inner shrine, her image clad in ribbons, filled with her power, her everlasting fire. But now, chaos, the city begins to reel with cries of grief, louder, stronger, even though Father's palace stood well back, screened off by trees. But still the clash of arms rings clearer, horror on the attack. I shake off sleep, and scrambling up to the pitched roof, I stand there, ears alert, and I hear a roar like fire, assaulting a wheat field, whipped by a south wind's fury, or mountain toward in full spate, flattening crops, leveling all the happy, thriving labor of oxen, dragging whole trees headlong down in its wake, and a shepherd perched on a sheer rock outcrop, hears the roar, lost in amazement, struck dumb, no, not doubting the good faith of the Greeks now, their treachery plain as day. Already there, the grand house of Dephobus stormed by fire, crashing in ruins. Already his neighbor, Eucalagon, up in flames. The Sigian straits shimmering back in the blaze. The shouting of fighter soars, the clashing blare of trumpets. Out of my wits I seize my arms. What reason for arms? Just my spirit, burning to muster troops for battle. Rush with comrades up to the city's heights. Fury and rage driving me breakneck on as it races th but through my mind. What a noble thing it is to die in arms. But now, look, just slipped out from under the Greek barrage of spears, Panthus, Othri's son, a priest of Apollo's shrine on the citadel, hands full of the holy things. The images of our conquered gods. He's dragging along his little grandson, making a wild dash for our doors. Panthus, where's our stronghold, our last stand? Words still on my lips as he groans in answer. The last day has come for the Trojan people. No escaping this moment. Troy's no more. 
Ilium gone, our awesome Trojan glory. Brutal Jupiter hands it all over to Greece. Greeks are lording over our city up in flames. The horse stands towering high in the heart of Troy, disgorging its armed men with Sinon in his glory. Gloating over us, Sinon fans the fires. The immense double gates are flung wide open. Greeks and their thousands mass there, all who ever sailed from proud Mycenae. Others have choked the cramped streets, weapons brandished now, and battle line of naked glinting steel, tense for the kill. Only the first guards at the gates put up some show of resistance, fighting blindly on. Spurred by Panthus' words and the gods' will, into the blaze I dive, into the fray, wherever the din of combat breaks and war cries fill the sky, wherever the battle fury drives me now and on, I'm joined by Ripius, Epitus, mighty in armor, rearing up in the moonlight. Hippanus comes to my side, and Dymus too, flanked by the young Corobius, Migdon's son. Late in the day, he chanced to come to Troy, incensed with a mad, burning love for Cassandra, son-in-law to our king. He would rescue Troy. Poor man. If only he'd marked his bride's inspired ravings. See, in their close-packed ranks, hot for battle, I spur them on their way. Men, brave hearts, though bravery cannot save us, if you're bent on following me and risking all to face the worst, look around you and see how our chances stand. The, do the gods who shored up our empire have left us. All have deserted their altars and their shrines. Your race to defend a city already lost in flames. But let us die. Go plunging into the thick of battle. One hope saves the defeated. They know they can't be saved. That fired their hearts with a fury of despair. Now, like a wolf pack out for blood on a foggy night, driven blindly by the relentless rabid hunger, leaving cubs behind, waiting jaws parched, so through spears, through enemy ranks we plow to certain death, striking into the city's heart, the shielding wings of the darkness beating us round us. Who has words to capture that nice disaster? Tell that slaughter! What tears could match our torments now? An ancient city is fallen, a power that ruled for ages now in ruins. Everywhere lie the motionless bodies of the dead, strewn in her streets, her homes and her gods' shrines we held in awe. And not only Trojans pay the price in blood, at times the courage races back in their conquered hearts, and they cut their enemies down in all their triumph. Everywhere wrenching grief, everywhere terror, and a thousand shapes of death. And the first Greek to cross our path? Andragius, leading a horde of troops and taking us for allies on the march, the fool. He even gives a warm salute and calls out, Hurry up, men! Why holding back? Why now? Why drag your heels? Troy's up in flames. The rest are looting, sacking the city heights. But you, have you just come from the tall ships? Suddenly, getting no password he can trust, he sensed he'd stumbled into enemy ranks. Stunned, he recoiled, swallowing back his words, like a man who threads his way through prickly brambles, pressing his full weight on the ground, and blindly treads on a lurking snake, and back he shrinks in instant fear as it rears in anger, puffs his blue-black neck, just so Andragia, seeing us, cringes with fear, recoiling, struggling to flee, but we attack, flinging a ring of steel round his cohorts. Panic takes the Greeks unsure of their ground, and we cut them all to pieces. Fortune fills our sails with that first clash, and Corobius, flushed, fired with such success, exults, Comrades, wherever fortune points the way, wherever the first road of safety leads, let soldier on. Exchange shields with the Greeks and wear their emblems. Call it cunning or courage. Who would ask in war? Our, en our enemies will arm us to the hilt. With that he dons Andragius's crested helmet, his handsome blazoned shield, and straps a Greek sword to his hip. His comrades, spirits rising, take his lead. Rippius, Dymus too, and our corps of young recruits. Each fighter arms himself in the loot he had just seized, and on that we forge, blending in with the enemy, battling time and again under strange gods, fighting hand to hand in the blind dark, and many Greeks we send to the king of death. Some scatter back to their ships, making a run for shore and safety. 
Others disgrace themselves, so panicked they clamber inside the monstrous horse, burying themselves in the womb they know so well. But oh, how wrong to rely on God's dead set against you. Watch, the virgin daughter of Priam, Cassandra, torn from the sacred depths of Minerva's shrine, dragged by the hair, raising her burning eyes to the heavens, just her eyes so helpless, shackles kept her from raising her gentle hands, Carobus could not bear the sight of it. Mad with rage, he flung himself at the Greeks' lines and met his death. Closing ranks, we charge after him into the thick of battle and face our first disaster. Down from the temple roof come showers of lances hurled by our comrades there. Duped by the look of our Greek arms, our Greek crests that launch this grisly slaughter, and worse still, the Greeks roaring with anger. We had saved Cassandra. Attack from all sides, Ajax, fiercest of all, and Atreus' two sons, and the whole Dolopian army, wild as a rampaging whirlwind, gusts clashing, the west and the south, and east wind riding high, on the rushing horses of the dawn, and the woods howl, and Nereus, thrashing his savage trident, churns up the sea, exploding in foam from its rocky depths. And those Greeks we had put to rout, our ruse in the murky night stampeding them headlong on throughout the city, back they come, the first to see our, their shields and spears our naked lies, to mark the words on our lips that jar with theirs. In a flash, superior numbers overwhelm us. Caribus is the first to go. Cut down by Penelaus' right hand, he sprawls at Minerva's shrine, the goddess power of armies. Rippius falls too, the most righteous man in Troy, and the most devoted to justice, true, but the gods had other plans. Hippanus, Dimus die as well, run through by their own men. And you, Panthus, not all your pity, piety, not all the sacred bands you wore, as Apollo's priest could save you as you fell. Ashes of Ilium, last flames that engulfed my world, I swear by you that in your last hour I never shrank from the Greek spears, from any startling hazard of war. If fate had struck me down, my sword arm earned it all. Now we are swept away. Iphitus, Peleus with me, one way down with age, and the other slowed by a wound Ulysses gave him, heading straight for Priam's palace, driven there by the outcries. And there, I tell you, a pitched battle flares. You'd think no other battles could match its fury. Nowhere else in the city were people dying so. Invincible Mars rears up to meet us face to face, with waves of Greeks assaulting the roofs. We see them choking the gateway under a tortoise shell of shields, and the scaling ladders climb to the sheep. Choking the gateway under a tortoise shell of shields, and the scaling ladders cling to the steep ramparts. Just at the gates, the raiders scramble up the rungs. Shields on the left arms thrust out for the defense, their right hands clutching the gables. Over against them, Trojans ripping the tiles and turrets from all their roofs. The end is near. They can see it now at the brink of death, desperate for weapons. Some defense, and these, these missiles they send reeling down on the Greeks' heads, the gilded beams, the inlaid glory of all our ancient fathers. Comrades below, posted in close-packed ranks, block the entries, sword points drawn and poised. My courage renewed, I rush to relieve the palace. Brace the defenders, bring the defeated strength. There was a secret door, a hidden passage, linking the wings of Priam's house, remote, far to the rear. Long as our realm still stood, Andromache, poor woman, would often go this way, unattended, to Hector's parents, taking the boy Estianex by the hand to see Grandfather Priam. I slipped through the door up to the jutting roof where the doomed Trojans were hurling futile spears. There was a tower soaring high at the peak toward the sky, our favorite vantage point for surveying all of Troy and the Greek fleet in camp. We attacked that tower with iron crowbars, just where the upper story planks showed bl loosening joints. We rocked it, wrenched it free in its deep moorings all at once. We heaved it toppling down with a crash 
trailing its wake of ruin to grind the massed Greeks assaulting left and right. But on came the Greek reserves, no let up, the hail of rocks, the missiles of every kind would never cease. There at the very edge of the front gates springs Pyrrhus, son of Achilles, prancing in arms, a flash in his shimmering brazen sheath like a snake, buried the whole winter long under frozen turf, swollen to bursting, fed full on poisonous weeds, and now it springs into light, sloughing off its old skin, to glisten sleek in its newfound youth, its back slithering, coiling its proud chest rearing high to the sun, its triple tongue flickering through its fangs. Backing him now comes Periphas, giant fighter, Automedon too, Achilles' attenchman, charioteer who bore the great man's armor, backing Pyrrhus. The young fighters from Skiros raid the palace, hurling firebrands at the roofs. Out in the lead, Pyrrhus seizes a double axe and batters the rocky sill and ripping the bronze posts out from the sockets, hacking the rugged oaken planks of the doors, making a breach, a gaping maw, and there exposed the heart of the house, the sweep of the colonnades, the palace depths of the old kings and Priam lie exposed, and they see the armed sentries bracing at the portals. But all in the house is turmoil, misery groans, the echoing chambers ring with cries of women, wails of mourning hit the golden stars. Mothers scatter in panic down the palace halls and embrace the pillars, cling to them, kiss them hard. But on he comes, Pyrrhus, with all his father's force, no, bo no bolts, not even the guards can hold him back. Under the ram's repeated blows, the doors cave in, the doorposts prized from their sockets, crash flat. Force makes a breach, and the Greeks come storming through. Butcher the sentries, flood the entire place with men-at-arms. No river so wild, no so frothing in spate, bursting its banks to overpower the dikes. Anything in its way, its cresting tides, stampeding in fury down on the fields to sweep the flocks and stalls across the open plain. I saw him myself, Pyrrhus, crazed with carnage, and Atreus's two sons just at the threshold. I saw Hecuba with her hundred daughters and daughters-in-law, saw Priam fouling with blood the altar fires he himself had blessed. Those fifty bridal chambers filled with the hope of children's children still to come, the pillars proud with trophies, gilded with eastern gold, they all come tumbling down, and the Greeks hold what the raging fire spares. Perhaps you wonder how Priam met his end. When he saw his city stormed and seized, his gates wrenched apart, the enemy camped in his palace depths, the old man dons his armor long unused. He clamps it round his shoulders, shaking with age, and all for nothing, straps his useless sword on his hip, <clears throat> then makes for the thick of battle, out to meet his death. At the heart of the house an ample altar stood, naked under the skies, an ancient laurel bending over the shrine, embracing our household gods within its shade. Here, flocking the altar, Hecuba and her daughters, huddled, blown down headlong like doves by a black storm, clutching all for nothing the figures of their gods. Seeing Priam decked in their arms, he'd worn as a young man, "'Are you insane?' she cries. "'Poor husband, what impels you to strap that sword on now? "'Where are you rushing? "'Too late for such defense, such help.' Not even my own Hector, if he came to the rescue now. Come to me, Priam. This altar will shield us all, or else you'll die with us. With those words drawing him toward her there, she made a place for the old man beside the holy shrine. Suddenly, look, a son of Priam. Polites, just escaped from a slaughter at Pyrrhus' hands, comes racing in through the spears, through enemy fighters, fleeing down the long arcades and deserted hallways, badly wounded. Pyrrhus hot on his heels, a weapon poised for the kill, about to seize him, about to run him through and pressing him home, as Polites reaches his parents and collapses, vomiting out his lifeblood before their eyes. At that Priam, trapped in the grip of death, not holding back, not checking his words, his rage, 
You, he cries, you and your vicious crimes. If any power on high recoils at such an outrage, let the gods repay you for all your reckless work. Grant you the thanks, the rich reward you've earned. You've made me see my son's death with my own eyes, defiled a father's sight with his son's lifeblood. You say you're Achilles' son? You lie. Achilles never treated his enemy Priam so. No, he honored a suppliant's rights. He blushed to betray my trust. He restored my Hector's bloodless corpse for burial, sent me safely home to the land I rule. With that and with all his might, the old man flings this spear. But too impotent now to pierce, it merely grazes Pyrrhus's brazen shield that blocks its way and clings there, dangling lip from the boss, all for nothing. Pyrrhus shouts back, Well then, down you go, a messenger to my father, Peleus' son. Tell him about my vicious work, how Neoptolemus degrades his father's name. Don't you forget, now die. That said, he drags the old man straight to the altar, quaking, slithering on through slicks of his own son's blood, and twisting Priam's hair in his left hand, his right hand sweeping forth his sword, a flash of steel. He buries it hilt deep in the king's flank. Such was the fate of Priam, his death, his lot on earth, with to Troy bracing before his eyes, her ramparts down, the monarch who once had ruled in all his glory, the many lands of Asia, Asia's many tribes. A powerful trunk is lying on the shore, the head wrenched from his shoulders, a corpse without a name. Then, for the first time, the full horror came home to me at last. I froze. The thought of my own dear father filled my mind when I saw the old king gasping out his life. With that raw wound, both men were the same age, and the thought of my Cruessa, alone, abandoned, our house plundered, our little Euless fate, I looked back. What forces still stood by me? None. Totally spent in war, they'd all deserted. Down from the roofs they'd flung themselves to earth or hurled their broken bodies in the flames. So at just that moment, I was the one man left, and then I saw her, clinging to Vesta's threshold, hiding in silence, tucked away, Helen of Argos. Glare of the fires lit my view as I looked down, scanning the city left and right, and there she was, terrified of the Trojans' hate. Now Troy was overpowered, terrified of the Greeks' revenge, her deserted husband's rage, that universal fury a curse to Troy in her native land. And here she lurked, skulking, a thing of loathing, cowering at the altar, Helen. Out it flared, the fire inside my soul, my rage ablaze to avenge our fallen country. Pay Helen back, crime for crime. So this woman, it struck me now, safe and sound, she'll look once more on Sparta, her native Greece, She'll ride like a queen in triumph with her trophies, feast on her eyes on her husband, parents, children too, her retinue fawning round her, Phrygian ladies, slaves, that with Priam put to the sword, and Troy up in flames, and time and again our Dardan shores have sweated blood, not for all the world, no fame, no memory to be won for punishing a woman, such victory reaps no praise, but to stamp this abomination out as she deserves, to punish her now, they'll sing my praise for that. What joy, what to glut my heart with the fires of vengeance, brings some peace to the ashes of my people. Whirling words, I was swept away by fury now, when all of a sudden there my loving mother stood before my eyes, but I had never seen her so clearly her pure radiance shining down upon me through the night. The goddess in all her glory, just as the gods behold her build, her awesome beauty grasping my hand, she held me back, adding this from her rose-red lips. My son, what grief could incite such blazing anger? Why such fury? And the love you bore me once? Where has it all gone? Why don't you look first where you left your father? 
Anchises, spent with age. Do your wife, Cruessa, and your son, Ascanius, still survive? The Greek battalions are swarming round them all. And if my love had never rushed to the rescue, flames would have swept them off by now, or enemy sword blades would have drained their blood. Think, it's not that beauty Helen you should hate, not even Paris. The man you should hate, no, it's the gods, the ruthless gods, who are tearing down the wealth of Troy. Her toppling t crown of towers, look around. I'll sweep it all away, the mist so murky, dark, and swirling around you now. It clouds your vision, dulls your mortal sight. You are my son. Never fear my orders. Never refuse to bow to my commands. There, yes, where you see the massive ramparts shattered, blocks wrenched from blocks, the billowing smoke and ash. It's Neptune himself, prizing loose with his giant trident, the foundation stones of Troy. He's making the walls quake, ripping up the entire city by her roots. There's Juno, cruelest in fury, first to commandeer the Scaean gates, sword at her hip and mustering comrades, shock troops streaming out the ships. Already up on the heights, turn round and look, there's Pallas holding the fortress. Flaming out of the clouds, her savage gorgon glaring. Even father himself, he's filling the Greek hearts with courage, stamina, Jove in person spurring the gods to fight the Trojan armies. Run for your life, my son. Put an end to your labors. I will never leave you. I will set you safe at your father's door. Parting words. She vanished into the dense night, and now they all came looming up before me. Terrible shapes, the deadly foes of Troy, the gods gigantic in power. Then at last I saw it all, all Ilium settling into her embers, Neptune's Troy toppling over now from her roots like a proud veteran ash on its mountain summit, chopped by stroke after stroke of the iron axe as woodsmen fight to bring it down. And over and over it threatens to fall, its boughs shudder, its leafy crown quakes and back and forth it sways till overwhelmed by its wounds, with a long last groan it goes. Torn up from its heights, it crashes down, in ruins from its ridge, Venus leading down from the roof I climb and win my way through fires and massive foes. The spears recede and flames roll back before me, at last gaining the door of my father's ancient house. My first concern was to find the man, <clears throat> my first wish to spirit him off into the high mountain range. But father, seeing Ilium raised from the earth, Refused to drag his life out now and suffer exile. You, he argued, you are in your prime, untouched by age, your blood still coursing strong, your hearts of oak. You are the ones to hurry to your escape. Myself, if the gods on high had wished me to live on, they would have saved my palace for me here. Enough, more than enough, than I have seen one sack of my city, once survived its capture. Here I lie, here laid out for death. Come say your parting salutes and leave my body so. I will find my own death, sword in hand. My enemies keen for spoils will be so kind. Death without burial? A small price to pay. For years now I've lingered out my life, despised by the gods, a dead weight to men, ever since the father of gods and king of mortals stormed at me with his bolt and scorched me with his fire. So he said, planted there. Nothing could shake him now. But we dissolved in tears, my wife, Cruessa, and Scantius, the whole household, begging my father not to pull our lives down with him, adding his own weight to the fate that dragged us down. He still refuses, holds to his resolve, clings to the spot. And again I rushed to arms, desperate to die myself. Where could I turn? What were our chances now at this point? What, I cried, did you, my own father, dream that I could run away and desert you here? How could such an outrage slip from a father's lips? If it please the gods that nothing of our great city shall survive, if you are bent on adding your own death to the deaths of Troy and all your loved ones too, 
The doors of the deaths you crave are spread wide open. Pyrrhus will soon be here, bathed in Priam's blood. Pyrrhus who butchers sons and their father's faces. Slaughters fathers at the altar. Was it for this, my loving mother, you swept me clear of the weapons, free of the flames, just to see the enemy camped in the very heart of our house, to see my son, Ascanius, and see my father, my wife, Cruessa, with them sacrificed, massacred in each, in, in each other's blood? Arms, my comrades, bring me arms. The last light calls the defeated. Send me back to the Greeks. Let me go back to fight new battles. Not all of us here will die today without revenge. Now buckling on my sword again and working my left arm through the shield strap, grasping it tightly, just as I was rushing out, right at the doors, my wife, Cruessa, look, flung herself at my feet and hugged my knees and raised our little Eulus up to his father. If you are going off to die, she begged, then take us with you too to face the worst together. But if your battles teach you to hope in arms, the arms you buckle on, your first duty should be to guard your house. Desert us, leave us now to whom? Whom? Little Eulus, your father, and your wife, so I was once called. So Cruessa cries, her wails of anguish echoing through the house. When out of the blue an omen strikes, a marvel. Now as we held our son between our hands, and both our grieving faces, a tongue of fire, watch, flares up from the crown of Ulysses' head, a subtle flame licking his downy hair, feeding around the boy's brow, and though it never harmed him, panicked, we rush to shake the flame from his curls and smother the holy fire, dampen it down with water. But Father Anchises lifts his eyes to the stars in joy, and stretching his hands toward the sky, sings out, Almighty Jove, if any prayer can persuade you now, look down on us. That's all I ask. If our devotion has earned it, grant us another omen, Father. Seal this first clear sign. No sooner said than an instant peal of thunder crashes on the left, and down from the sky a shooting star comes gliding, trailing a flaming torch to irradiate the night as it comes sweeping down. We watch it sailing over the topmost palace roofs to bury itself, still burning bright in the forests of Mount Ida, blazing its path with light, leaving a broad furrow, a fiery wake, and miles round the smoking sulfur fumes. One over at last, my father rises to his full height and praises to, prays to the gods and reveres that holy star. No more delay, not now, you gods of my father's, now I follow wherever you lead me. I am with you. Safeguard our house. Safeguard my grandson, Eulus. This sign is yours. Troy rests in your power. I give way, my son. No more refusals. I will go with you, your comrade. So he yielded. But now the roar of flames grows louder, all through Troy. And the seething floods of fire are rolling closer. So come, dear father, climb upon my shoulders. I will carry you on my back. This labor of love will never wear me down. Whatever falls to us now, we both will share one peril, one path to safety. Little Eulis, walk beside me, and you, my wife, follow me at a distance in my footsteps. Servants, listen closely. Just past the city walls, a grave mound lies, where an old shrine of forsaken Ceres stands, with an ancient cypress growing close beside it. Our father's reverence kept it green for years. Coming by many routes, it's there we meet our rendezvous. And you, my father, carry our hearth gods now, our father's sacred vessels. I, just back from the war and fresh from slaughter, I must not handle the holy things, it's wrong. Not till I cleanse myself in running springs. With that on my broad shoulders and round my neck, I spread a tawny lion's skin for a cloak, and bowing down, I lift my burden up. Little Eulis, clutching my right hand, keeps pace with tripping steps. My wife trails on behind, and so we make our way along the pitch dark paths. And I, who had never flinched at the hurdling spears or swarming Greek assaults, now every stir of wind, every whisper of sound, 
alarms me, anxious both for the child beside me and burden on my back. And then, nearing the gates, thinking we've all got safely through, I suddenly seem to catch the steady tramp of marching feet, and Father, peering out through the darkness, cries, Run for it now, my boy, you must! They're closing in! I see their glinting shields, their flashing bronze! Then, in my panic, something strange, some enemy power, robbed me of my senses. Lost, I was leaving behind familiar paths, and at a run down dead ends, when, oh, dear God, my wife, Cruessa, torn from me by a brutal fate, what then, did she stop in her tracks, or lose her way, or exhausted, sink down to rest? Who knows? I never set my eyes on her again. I never looked back, and she never crossed my mind. Cruessa lost, not till we reached that barrow, sacred to ancient Ceres, where, with all our people rallied at last, she alone was missing, lost, to her friends, her son, her husband, gone forever. Braving, I blamed them all, the gods, the human race. What crueler blow did I feel that night when Troy went down? Ascanius, father... And Chises and all the gods of Troy, entrusting them to my friends, I hid them well away in a valley's shelter, donned my burnished gear, and back I go to Troy. My mind steeled to relive the whole disaster, retrace my route through the whole city now, and put my life in danger one more time. First then, back to the looming walls, the shadowy rear gates by which I'd left the city, Back I go in my tracks, retracing, straining to find my footsteps in the dark. With terror at every turn, the very silence makes me cringe. Then back to I go to my house, if only, only she's gone there. But the Greeks have flooded in, seized the entire place, all over now. Devouring fire, whipped by the winds, goes churning over the rooftops, flames surging over them, scorching blasts raging up the sky. On I go, and again I see the palace of Priam set on the heights. But there in the colonnades, deserted now, in the sanctuary of Juno, there stand the elite watchmen, Phoenix, ruthless Ulysses, guarding all their loot, all the treasures of Troy, hauled from the burning shrines, the sacramental tables, bowls of solid gold, and the holy robes they seize from every quarter, Greeks piling high the plunder, Children and trembling mothers rounded up in a long, endless line. Why, I even dared fling my voice through the dark. My shouts filled the streets, and time and again, overcome with grief, I called at, Cressa, nothing, no reply, and again, Cressa. But then, as I madly rushed from house to house, no end in sight abruptly, right before my eyes, I saw her stricken ghost, my own Cressa's shade but larger than life, the life I'd known so well. I froze, my hackles bristled, my voice choked in my throat, and my wife spoke out to ease me of my anguish. My dear husband, why so eager to give yourself to mad flights of grief? It's not without the will of the gods these things have come to pass, but the gods forbid you to take Cressa with you. Bound from Troy together, The king of lofty Olympus won't allow it. A long exile is your fate. The vast plains of the sea are yours to plow until you reach Hesperian land, where Lydian Tiber flows with its smooth march through rich and loamy fields, a land of hardy people. There a great joy and a kingdom are yours to claim, and a queen to make your wife. Dispel your tears for Cressa, who you loved. I will never behold the high and mighty pride of the palaces, the Myrmidians and the Dolopians, or go as a slave to some Greek matron. No, not I, daughter of Dardanus that I am, the wife of Venus' son. The great mother of gods detains me on these shores. And now, farewell. Hold dear the son we share, we love together. These were her parting words. And for all my tears, I long to say so much, dissolving into the empty air, she left me now. Three times I tried to fling my arms around her neck. Three times I embraced nothing, her phantom sifting through my fingers, 
light as wind, quick as a dream in flight. Gone. And at last the night was over. Back I went to my people, and I was amazed to see what throngs of new companions had poured in to swell our numbers. Mothers, men, our forces gathered for exile, grieving masses. They had come together from every quarter, belongings, spirits ready for me to lead them over the sea to whatever lands I chose. And now the morning star was mounting above the high crests of Ida, leading on the day. The Greeks had taken the city, blocked off every gate. No hope of rescue now. So I gave way at last, and lifting my father, headed toward the mountains. My name is Kevin Smith, and I teach several Integrated Humanities courses through Kepler Education covering the sweep of Western civilization. I will be reading Book 3 from Virgil's The Aeneid. I will be using the Penguin Classics edition. Book 3, The Wanderings. When the gods had seen fit to lay low the power of Asia and the innocent people of Priam, when proud Ilium had fallen and all Neptune's Troy lay smoking on the ground, we were driven by signs from heaven into distant exile to look for a home in some deserted land. There, hard by Antandros under the Phrygian mountain range of Ida, we were mustering men and building a fleet without knowing where the fates were leading us or where we would be allowed to settle. The summer had barely started, and Father Anchises was bidding us hoist sail and put ourselves into the hands of the fates. I wept as I left the shores of my native land and her harbors in the plains where once had stood the city of Troy. I was in exile, taking to the high seas with my comrades and my son, with the gods of our house and the great gods of our people. At some distance from Troy lay the land of Mars, a land of vast plains farmed by Thracians, once ruled by the savage Lycurgus. This people had ancient ties with Troy, while the fortunes of Troy remained, and our household gods were linked in alliance. Here I sailed, and using the name Aeneadae, formed after my own, I laid out my first walls on the curved shore. But the fates frowned on these beginnings. I was worshipping my mother Venus, the daughter of Dione, and the gods who preside over new undertakings, and sacrificing a gleaming white bull to the Most High King of the Heavenly Gods. Close by, there happened to be a mound on top of which there grew a thicket bristling with spears of cornel and myrtle wood. I had gone there and was beginning to pull green shoots out of the ground to cover the altar with leafy branches, when I saw a strange and horrible sight. As soon as I broke the roots of a tree and was pulling it out of the ground, dark gouts of blood dripped from it and stained the earth with gore. The horror of it chilled me to the bone. I trembled and my blood congealed with fear. I went on, pulling up more tough shoots from another tree, searching for the cause, however deep it might lie, and the dark blood flowed from the bark of this second tree. With my mind in turmoil, I began to pray to the country nymphs and to Father Mars Gradivus, who rules over the fields of the Gitae begging them to turn what I was seeing to good and to make the omen blessed. But after I had set about the spear-like shoots of a third shrub with greater vigor and was on my knees struggling to free it from the sandy soil, shall I speak or shall I be silent? I heard a heart-rending groan emerge from deep in the mound and a voice rose into the air, Why do you tear my poor flesh? 
Aeneas, it cried. Take pity now on the man who is buried here, and do not pollute your righteous hands. I am no stranger to you. It was Troy that bore me, and this is no tree that is oozing blood. Escape, I beg you, from these cruel shores, from this land of greed. It is Polluterus that speaks. This is where I was struck down, and an iron crop of weapons covered my body. Their sharp points have rooted and grown in my flesh. At this, fear and doubt oppressed me. My hair stood on end with horror, and the voice stuck in my throat. This was the Polluterus, the doomed Priam, had once sent in secret with a great mass of gold to be brought up by the king of Thrace, when at last he was losing faith in the arms of Troy and saw his city surrounded by besiegers. When fortune deserted the Trojans and their wealth was in ruins, the king went over to the side of the victors and joined the armies of Agamemnon. Breaking all the laws of God, he murdered Polluterus and seized the gold. Greed for gold is a curse. There is nothing to which it does not drive the minds of men. When the fear had left my bones, I told the chosen leaders of the people, and first of all my father, about this portent sent by the gods, and asked what should be done. They were of one mind. We must leave this accursed land where the laws of hospitality had been violated and let our ships run before the wind. So we gave Paluderus a second burial, heaping the earth high in a mound and raising to his shade an altar dark with funeral wreaths and black cypress, while the women of Troy stood all around with their hair unbound in mourning. With offerings of foaming cups of warm milk and bowls of sacrificial blood, we committed his soul to the grave and lifted up our voices to call his name for the last time. Then, as soon as we could trust ourselves to the waves, when the winds had calmed the swell and a gentle breeze was rattling the rigging to call us out to sea, my comrades drew the ships down to the water and crowded the shore. We sailed out of the harbor, and the land and its cities soon fell away behind us. In the middle of the ocean lies a beautiful island dear to Aegean Neptune and the mother of the Nereids. It used to float from shore to shore until in gratitude the archer god Apollo moored it to Guaros and high Mucronos, allowing it to stand firm and be inhabited and mock the winds. Here I sailed, and in this peaceful haven of Delos we came safe to land, weary from the sea. We went ashore and were admiring Apollo's city when its king, Aeneas, king of men and priest of the gods, came to meet us, his forehead garlanded with ribbons and the sacred laurel. Recognizing Anchises as an old friend, he gave us his hand in hospitality, and we entered his house. There I gazed in reverence at the god's temple built high of ancient stone and made this prayer to Apollo. O god of Thumbra, grant us a home of our own. We are weary. Grant us walls and descendants and a city that will endure. Preserve these remnants that have escaped the Greeks and pitiless Achilles to be a second citadel for Troy. Whom are we to follow? Where do you bid us go? Where are we to settle? Send us a sign, O Father, and steal into our hearts. I had scarcely spoken when everything seemed to begin to tremble. The threshold of the doors of the god, his laurel tree, and all the mountains round about were shaken. The sanctuary opened and a bellowing came from the bowl on the sacred tripod. We threw ourselves to the ground, and these were the words that came to our ears. O much enduring sons of Dardanus, the land which first bore you from your parents' stock will be the land that will take you back to her rich breast. Seek out your ancient mother. 
For that is where the house of Aeneas and his sons' sons, and their sons after them, will rule over the whole earth. So spoke Phoebus Apollo, and a great joy and tumult arose among us, all asking what city this was, where Apollo was directing us in our wanderings, what this land was to which we were to return. Then spoke my father Anchises, who had been turning over in his mind what he had heard from the men of old. Listen, he said, you leaders of Troy, and learn what you have to hope for. In the middle of the ocean lies Crete, the island of great Jupiter, where there is a Mount Ida, the cradle of our race, and where the Cretans live in a hundred great cities, the richest of kingdoms. If I remember rightly what I have heard, our first father, Teucer, sailed from there to Asia, landing at Cape Hratium, and chose that place to found his kingdom. Troy was not yet standing, nor was the citadel of Pergamum, and they lived low down in the valleys. This is the origin of the great mother of Mount Sibylle, the bronze symbols of the Coryubants, our grove of Ida, the inviolate silence of our worship, and the yoked lions that draw the chariot of the mighty goddess. Come then, let us follow where we are led by the bidding of the gods. Let us appease the winds and set forth for the kingdoms of Knossos. It is not far to sail. If only Jupiter is with us, the third day we will see our ships on the shores of Crete. So he spoke and made due sacrifice on the altars, a bull to Neptune and a bull to fair Apollo, a black lamb to the storms and a white lamb to favoring breezes. Rumor, as she flew, told the tale of the great Idomeneus, how he had been forced to leave his father's kingdom, and how the shores of Crete were now deserted. Here was a place, empty of our enemies, their homes abandoned, waiting for us. We left the harbor of Ortugia, and flew over the sea to Naxos, where Bacchants dance on the mountain ridges, and to green Don Donusa, to Olerios, to Paras, marble white, and the Cuclades, scattered on the face of the sea, skimming over an ocean churned up by the coasts of a hundred islands. The sailors raised all manner of shouts as they vied with one another in their rowing, and my comrades kept urging me to make for Crete and go back to the home of their ancestors. The wind rising astern sped us on our way, and we came to shore at last on the ancient land of the Curites. Impatiently I set to work on walls for the city we all longed for. I, p I called it Pergamia, and the people rejoiced in the name. I urged them to love their hearths and homes and raise a citadel to protect them. Our ships were soon drawn up on dry land. Our young men were busy with marrying and putting new land under plow, and I was giving them homes and laws to live by, when suddenly from a polluted quarter of the sky there came a cruel, superiating plague upon our bodies and upon the trees and crops. It was a time of death. Men were losing the lives they loved or dragging around their sickly bodies. The dog star burned the fields and made them barren. The grass dried. The crops were infected and gave us no food. My father bade me retrace our course back across the sea to Phoebus Apollo and his oracle at Ortugia to pray for his gracious favor and ask, when he would put an end to our toil, where we were to look for help in our adversity, and what course we were to steer. It was night, and sleep held in its grasp all living things upon the earth. There, I there as I lay, the holy images of the gods, the Phrygian Penates, whom I had rescued from the thick of the flames of the burning city of Troy, 
seem to be standing bathed in clear light before my eyes where the full moon streamed in through the unshuttered windows. At last they spoke to me and comforted my sorrow with these words. Apollo here speaks the prophecy he will give you if you sail back to Ortugia. By his own will he has sent us here and we stand at your door. We followed you in your arms when Troy was burned to ashes. With you to lead us, we have sailed across unmeasured tracts of swelling seas, and in time to come we shall raise your sons to the stars and give dominion to your city. Your task is to build great walls to guard this great inheritance. You must never flag in the long toil of exile, and you must leave this place. Delian Apollo did not send you to these shores. Crete is not where he commanded you to settle. There is a place, Greeks call it Hesperia, an ancient land, strong in arms and in the richness of her soil. The Eunatrians live there, but the descendants of that race are now said to have taken the name of their king, Italus, and call themselves Italians. This is our true home. This is where Dardanus sprang from and his father Iasius, from whom our race took its beginning. Rise then with cheerful heart and pass on these words to Anchises, your father, and let him be in no doubt. He must look for Coryuthus and the land of Ausonia. Jupiter forbids you the Dictian fields of Crete. I was astounded by this vision and by the words of the gods. This was no sleep. I seemed to be face to face with them and to recognize their features and the garlands on their heads, and at the sight my whole body was bathed in cold sweat. Leaping from my bed, I raised my hands, palms upward to the sky, and lifted up my voice in prayer, making pure offerings at the hearth. Having performed these rites, I went with joyful heart to Anchises and told him everything in order. He remembered that our race had two founders, Dardanus and Teucer, a double ancestry. He realized that he had fallen into a new mistake about these ancient places. Oh, my son, he said, you who have been so tested by the fates of Troy, only Cassandra made such a prophecy to me. Now I remember how she used to foretell that this is what fate had in store for us, and she kept talking about Hesperia and about the kingdoms of Italy. But who would have believed that Trojans would land on the shores of Hesperia? Who in those days would have believed the prophecies of Cassandra? Let us yield to Phoebus Apollo. We have been advised. Let us follow the better course. We all accepted his command with cries of joy and abandoned this second settlement, leaving only a few of our number behind, and set sail upon our hollow ships to run before the wind over the vast ocean. When we were out at sea and no longer in sight of land, and all around was sky and all around was sea, I saw a dark cloud come over our heads, bringing storm and black night, and the waves shivered in the darkness. The wind soon whipped up a great swell, and the storm rose and scattered us all over the ocean. A pale of cloud obscured the light. Rain fell from a sky we could not see, and lightning tore the clouds flash upon flash. We were thrown off course and drifted blindly in the waves. Under that sky, even Palunarus said he had lost his bearings in mid-ocean and could not tell day from night. For three long days, if days they were, of darkness and three starless nights, we ran before the storm, until at last on the fourth day we saw the first land rising before us, and there opened a clear view of distant mountains and curling smoke. Down came the sails, and we sprang to the oars. The sailors were not slow to sweep the blue sea and churn it into foam. 
I was saved from the ocean, and the shores of the Strophades were the first to receive me. This is the Greek name for islands in the great Ionian Sea. This is where the deadly Kalino and the other harpies have lived ever since the house of Phineas was barred to them, and they were frightened away from the tables where they used to feed. These are the vilest of all monsters. No plague or visitation of the gods sent up from the waves of the river Styx has ever been worse than these. They are birds with the faces of girls, with filth oozing from their bellies, with hooked claws for hands and faces pale with a hunger that is never satisfied. As soon as we reached the Strophides and entered the harbor, there we saw on every side rich herds of cattle on the level ground and flocks of goats unguarded on the grass. We drew our swords and rushed upon them, calling on the gods and on Jupiter himself to share our plunder. Then we raised couches along the shore of the bay and were feasting on this rich fare, when suddenly the harpies were among us, swooping down from the mountains with a fearful clangor of their wings, tearing the food to pieces and polluting everything with their foul contagion. The stench was rank, and through all this we heard their hideous screeching. Once again, in a sheltered spot far back under an overhanging rock, we relayed our tables and relit the altar fires. Once again the noisy flock came from some hidden roost in a different quarter of the sky and fluttered round their prey, clutching it in their hooked claws and fouling it in their mouths. Then it was I ordered my men to arm themselves to make war against this fearsome tribe. They did as ordered, hiding swords and shields, he, shields here and there in the grass. And so, when Mycenus in his high lookout heard the sound of them swooping down along the whole curved shore of the bay, he raised the alarm by blowing on the hollow bronze of his trumpet, and my comrades attacked. This was a new kind of battle, swords against filthy seabirds, but these were feathers that felt no violence and backs that could receive no wounds. They soared in swift flight up towards the stars, leaving behind them the half-eaten food and their filthy droppings, all but one who remained, perched high on a pinnacle of rock. Kalino was her name. And from her breast there burst this dire prophecy. Is it war you offer us now, sons of Laomedon, for the slaughter of our bullocks and the felling of our oxen? Is it your plan to make war against the innocent harpies and drive us from the kingdom of our ancestors? Listen to what I have to say and fix it in your minds. These words were spoken by the Almighty Father of the gods to Phoebus Apollo, and Phoebus Apollo spoke them to me, and now I, the greatest of the Furies, speak them to you. You are calling upon the winds and trying to sail to Italy. To Italy you will go, and you will be allowed to enter its harbors, but you will not be given a city and you will not be allowed to build walls around it before a deadly famine has come upon you, and the guilt of our blood drives you to gnaw round the edges of your tables, to put them between your teeth and eat them. With these words, she rose on her wings and flew into the forest. In that instant, the blood of my comrades was congealed with fear. Their spirits fell, and they lost all desire for fight, telling me to plead and pray to the creatures for peace, whether they were goddesses or foul and deadly birds. Then Father Anchises stood on the shore and raised his hands, palms upward, to heaven, calling upon the great gods and pledging to pay them all the honors that were their due. O oh, you gods, he cried, let not this threat be fulfilled. O oh gods, turn away this fate from us and graciously preserve your devoted people. He then gave orders to pull in the cables, undo the sail ropes, and let them run. The south wind filled the canvas, 
and wind and helmsman each set the same course for us as we flew over the foaming waves. Soon there appeared in mid-ocean the woods of Zacunthus and Dulichium, Same, and the stone cliffs of Neritos. We raced away from the rocks of Ithaca, the kingdom of Laertes, and cursed the land that had nurtured the villain Ulysses. In no time there rose before us the cloudy cap of Mount Lucas and Apollo's temple, the terror of sailors. Being weary, we set course for it and came to the land at the little city. The anchors ran out from the prows and our ships stood to the shore. So at last our feet were on dry land again, more than we had dared to hope for. We performed rites of purification to Jupiter and lit altar fires in fulfillment of our vows, crowding the shores of Actium with our Trojan games. My comrades stripped and made their bodies slippery with oil and wrestled in the style of their fathers as we celebrated our escape and safe voyage past so many Greek cities, right through the middle of our enemies. In due course, the sun rolled on round the great circle of the year. Icy winter came, and the north winds were roughening the seas. I then took a concave shield of bronze, the armor once carried by great Abbas, and nailed it on the doors of the temple where all could see, proclaiming the dedication of it with this inscription. Aeneas dedicates these arms, taken from the conquering Greeks. Then I gave orders to leave port and told the rowers to sit to their benches. They vied with one another to strike the sea and sweep the surface of it with their oars. We had soon put the cloud-capped citadels of Phaeacia down below the horizon, and we coasted along Epirus until we entered the harbor of Caonia, and then walked up to the lofty city of Buthratum. Here there came to our ears a story almost beyond belief, that Helenus, a son of Priam, was king over these Greek cities of Epirus, having succeeded to the throne and the bed of Pyrrhus, son of Achilles and descendant of Aicus. Andromache, once wife of Hector, had for a second time taken a husband from her own people. I was astounded, and the heart within me burned with love for the man and longing to meet him and find out about these great events. I was walking away from the harbor, leaving ships and shore behind me, when I caught sight of Andromache, offering a ritual meal and performing rites to the dead in a grove in front of a city on the banks of a river Simois, but not the true Simois of Troy. She was pouring a libation to the ashes of her husband Hector, calling on his shade to come to the empty tomb, a mound of green grass on which she had consecrated two altars. There she used to go and weep. When she saw me approaching with armed Trojans all about me, she was beside herself, numb with fear the moment she saw this great miracle and the warmth of life went out of her bones. She fainted, and only after a long time was she at last able to speak to me. Is this a true vision? Is it a true messenger that comes to me, son of the goddess? Are you alive? If the light of life has left you, why are you here? Where is Hector? As she spoke, she burst into tears, and her cries filled all the grove. I could hardly find an answer to these wild words, but stammered a few broken phrases. I am indeed alive. After all that has happened, I still go on living. Do not doubt it. What you see is true. But tell me, what fate has overtaken you since you were deprived of such a husband? What has fallen to the lot of Hector's Andromache? Are you still the wife of Pyrrhus? She answered, and her voice was low and her eyes downcast. 
The happiest of all Trojan women was the virgin daughter of Priam, who was made to die by the tomb of her enemy Achilles under the high walls of Troy. Polyxena did not have to endure the ca casting of lots or live to be the slave of a conqueror and lie in a master's bed. But we saw our home burned and sailed over many seas. We submitted to the arrogance of the house of Achilles and the insolence of his son and bore him a child in slavery. In due course, he turned his attention to marrying a Spartan, Hermione, granddaughter of Lydda, giving his slave Andromache over to his slave Helenus. But Orestes loved Hermione and had hoped to marry her. Incensed at losing her and driven on by the madness brought upon him by his own crimes, he caught Pyrrhus where Pyrrhus least expected him and slaughtered him on the altar he had raised for his father Achilles. At his death, some of the kingdom he had ruled over came into the possession of Helenus, who then called the plains the Caonian Plains and the whole district Caonia after Caon of Troy. He then built a Pergamum, this Trojan citadel on the ridge. But what winds and what fates have given you passage here? Is it some god that has driven you to these shores that you did not know were ours? What about your boy Ascanius? Is he alive and breathing the air? If he were with you now in Troy, but does he ever think of the mother he has lost? Does the old courage and manliness ever rise in him at the thought of his father Aeneas and his uncle Hector? She was weeping her useless tears and sobbing bitterly as these words poured from her when the hero Helenus, son of Priam, arrived from the walls of the city with a great escort. He recognized his own people and took us gladly to his own home. He too was weeping and could speak only a few broken words to us between his tears. As I walked, I recognized a little Troy a citadel modeled on great Pergamum, and a dried-up stream they called the Xanthus. There was the Scaean Gate, and I embraced it. Nor were my Trojans slow to enjoy this Trojan city with me. The king received them in a broad colonnade, and in the middle of the courtyard they poured libations of the wine of Bacchus and fed off golden dishes, and every man had a goblet in his hand. Day after day wore on with breezes tempting our sails and the canvas filling and swelling in the south wind until I went to the prophet Helenus with this request. You are Trojan born. You can read the signs sent by the gods. You understand the will of Phoebus Apollo of Claros, his tripods and his laurels. You know the meaning of the stars the cries of birds and the omens of their flight. Come, tell me, for every sign I have received from heaven has spoken in favor of this journey, and I am persuaded by all the divine powers to set course for Italy and, to, and try to find that distant land. Only the harpy Kilaino has prophesied a strange and monstrous portent, threatening us with her deadly anger and all the horrors of famine. Come, tell me now, what dangers am I to avoid as I start upon this journey? And as it goes on, what must I do to overcome such adversities? Before replying, Helenus first performed a ritual slaughter of bullocks and asked for the blessing of the gods. He then loosened the ribbons from his consecrated head, taking my hand, he led me in anxious expectation into the mighty presence of the God. In due course, he spoke as priest, and this was the prophecy that came from his hallowed lips. O son of the goddess, the proof is full and clear that the highest auspices favor your voyage. This is the fate allotted to you by the king of the gods. This is how your fortune rolls, and this is the order of its turning. 
My words will tell you a small part of all there is to know so that you may trust yourself more safely to cross the seas that are waiting to receive you and come to harbor in Ausonia. The fates do not allow Hellenus to know the rest, and Saturnian Juno forbids it to be spoken. First, you are wrong to imagine that it is a short voyage to Italy and that there are harbors close at hand for you to enter. Far and pathless are the ways that lie between you and that far distant land. You must first bend the oar in the waves of Sicilian seas, then cross the ocean of Ausonia and the lakes of the underworld, and pass Aea, the island of Circe, before you can come to the land which will be safe for the founding of your city. I shall give you a sign, and you must keep it deep within your heart. When in an hour of perplexity by the flowing waters of a lonely river, you find under some holm oaks on the shore a great sow with the litter of thirty piglets she has farrowed, lying there on her side all white, with her young all white around her udders. That will be the place for your city. There you will find the rest ordained for all your labors. Nor is there any need for you to shudder at the thought of eating your tables. The fates will find a way. Call upon Apollo, and he will come. But you must quickly leave this land of ours and keep well clear of the shore of Italy that lies nearest us, bathed by the tide of our sea, for hostile Greeks live in all these cities. Here Locrians from Naryukum have built their walls, and the army of Cretan Idomeneus of Leuctus has seized the Salentine plains in Calabria. Here, too, is the little town of Patelia, perching on the wall built for it by Philoctetes, leader of the Meliboeans. When you have passed all these and your ships are moored across the sea, when you have raised altars on the shore to fulfill your vows, do not forget to veil your head in purple cloth, so that when the altar fires are burning to honor the gods, no enemy presence can intrude and spoil the omens. Your comrades and you yourself must keep this mode of sacrifice, and your descendants must maintain this purity of worship forever. But when you sail on and the wind carries you near the shore of Sicily, and the close-set barriers of Pelorus open before you, make for the land to the south and the sea to the south, taking the long way round Sicily and keeping well clear of the breakers on the coast to starboard. Men say these lands were originally one, but were long ago convulsed by some great upheaval and torn apart. Such changes can occur in the long aging of time. The waves of the sea burst in between them and cut Sicily loose from the flank of the land of Hesperia, putting coastlines between their fields and cities, and flowing in between them in a narrow tide. On your right waits Scylla in ambush, and on your left the insatiable Charybdis. Three times a day with the deep vortex of her whirlpool, Charybdis sucks great waves into the abyss and then throws them upwards again to lash the stars. But Scylla lurks in the dark recesses of her cave and shoots out her mouth to seize ships and drag them onto the rocks. She has a human face, and as far as the groin she is a girl with lovely breasts. But below she is a monstrous sea creature, her womb full of wolves, each with a dolphin's tail. It is better to lose time by taking the long course round Cape Pacunus, rather than set eyes on the hideous Scylla deep in her cave, or see those rocks loud with the barking of dogs as blue as the sea. One more thing. If the prophet Hellenus has any insight into the future, if there is any reason to believe what I say, 
If Apollo fills my mind with the truth, there is one prophecy I shall make to you above all others, one counsel I shall repeat to you again and again. Worship the Godhead of great Juno first and foremost in your prayers. Of your own free will, submit your vows to Juno and win over the mighty Queen of Heaven with your offerings as you pray. If you do this, you will at last leave Sicily behind you and succeed in reaching the shores of Italy. When you have landed and come to the city of Cumae and the sacred lakes of Avernus, among their sounding forests, There, deep in a cave in the rock, you will see a virgin priestess foretelling the future in prophetic frenzy by writing signs and names on leaves. After she has written her prophecies on these leaves, she seals them all up in her cave, where they stay in their appointed order. But the leaves are so light that when the door turns on its sockets, the slightest breath of wind dislodges them. The draught from the door throws them into confusion, and the priestess never makes it her concern to catch them as they flutter round her rocky cave and put them back in order or join up the prophecies. So men depart without receiving advice and are disappointed in the house of Sybil. No matter how impatient your comrades, no matter how the winds may cry out to your sails to take to sea, Though you know that you could fill the canvas with favoring breezes, you must not begrudge the time, but must stay to visit the priestess. Approach her oracle with prayers, and beg her by her own gracious will to prophesy to you herself, opening her lips and speaking to to you in her own voice. She will tell you of the peoples of Italy and the wars that are to come and how you are to escape or endure all the labors that lie before you. If you do her reverence, she will give you a prosperous voyage. This is as much as my voice may utter to give you guidance. Now go forward, and by your actions raise the greatness of Troy to the skies. After the prophet Hellenus had told us these things in the friendliness of his heart, He then ordered his people to carry gifts of solid gold and carved ivory down to our ships and stowed a great quantity of silver in their hulls with cauldrons from Jupiter's temple at Dodona, a breastplate of chain mail interwoven with triple threads of gold, and a noble helmet with crest and streaming plumes, once worn by Neoptolemus. There were other gifts for my father, and he also gave us horses and leaders of men, rowers to make up the crews and arms for my comrades. Meanwhile, Anchises was ordering us to fit out the ships with their sails and not lose the following winds when the priest of Apollo addressed him in deep respect. Anchises, the gods love you. You have been thought worthy of the highest of all honors the love of Venus. You have been twice rescued from the ruins of Troy, and now before you, look, the land of Ausonia. Sail there and take possession of it. But you must sail past the opposite coast. The part of Ausonia which Apollo reveals to you is far from here. Go then, Anchises, fortunate in the devotion of your son. There is no more to say. Why do you keep talking when the wind is rising? Andromache also grieved at this parting that was to be our last, and brought us robes embroidered with gold thread and a Phrygian cloak for Ascanius. She was as generous as Helenus had been, heaping the gifts of her weaving upon him and saying, Take these too, my boy, and I hope the work of my hands may remind you of Andromache, wife of Hector, and be a token of my long-enduring love for you. Accept them. They are the last gifts you will receive from your own people. You are the only image left to me of my own son, Estionax. He had just those eyes and just those hands. His face was just like yours. 
he would have been growing up now, the same age as yourself. The tears were starting to my eyes as I was leaving them, and I spoke these words. Live on and enjoy the blessing of heaven. Your destiny has been accomplished. But we are called from fate to fate. Your rest is one. You do not need to plow tracts of ocean searching for the ever-receding Ausonian fields. You have before your eyes an image of the river Xanthus and a Troy made by your own hands, more fortunate, I pray, than the Troy that was, and less of a stumbling block to the Greeks. If ever I reach the river Thubris, and the fields through which the Thubris flows, and see my people with their own city walls, we shall in some future age unite our cities and the peoples of Hesperia and Epirus. For we are kith and kin, the same Dardanus is our founder, and the same destiny attends us. We shall make them both one Troy in spirit. Let that be a duty for our descendants. Down the coast we sailed near the Keraunian rocks, where the crossing to Italy is shortest. And as we sailed, the sun set and shadow darkened the mountains. At last we lay down by the waves of the sea in the lap of earth, and after allotting the next day's order of rowing, we took our ease all along the dry beach and sleep washed into our weary limbs. Night in its chariot, drawn by the hours, was not yet coming up to the middle of the sky, but there was no more sleep for Polynurus. He rose from his bed and studied all the winds, pricking up his ears to test the air and marking the path of every star gliding in the silent sky. Arcturus and the rainy Hyades, and the two Triones, the oxen of the plow, and he looked round to the south at Orion, armed in gold, and saw that the whole sky was serene and settled. Clear came his signal from the high stern. We broke camp, started our voyage, and spread the wings of our sails. The stars had been put to flight, and dawn was reddening in the sky when we sighted in the far distance the dim hills and plains of Italy. Italy! The first shout was from Acates. And Italy, the men took up the cry and cheerful salute. Then Father and Kise, standing on the high stern, garlanded a great mixing bowl, filled it with unwatered wine, and called upon the gods, O you who rule sea, land, and storm, give us an easy wind for our voyage. Blow kindly upon us. His prayer was answered. The breeze freshened and a harbor opened up before us, growing nearer and nearer till we could see the temple of Minerva on the citadel. My comrades furled their, their sails and pointed their prows to the shore. The harbor was shaped like a bow, curving away from the swell which came in from the east. The rocks at the mouth were foaming with salt spray, but the harbor lay tucked away behind. Towering rocks on either side stretched down their arms to form a double wall, and the temple stood well back from the shore. The first omen I saw here was four horses, white as snow, cropping the grass on a broad plain, and my father and Kises interpreted it. This land that receives us is promising us war. Men arm horses for war, and so this troop of horses means threat of war. Yet, at other times, they are harnessed to chariots and accept reins under the yoke and harmony. There is hope of peace also. At that moment, we prayed to the sacred godhead of Pallas, clasher of arms, the first goddess to welcome us in this hour of our joy. Standing at the altar, we veiled our heads with Phrygian cloth, and in accordance with the instructions which Hellenus had told us to follow before all others, duly paid the prescribed honor to Juno of Argos with our burnt offerings. We did not linger there, but as soon as we had performed the rites in due order, we raised our sails, swung the yards round, and left behind us this home of Greeks, this land we could not trust. 
Next we saw the Bay of Taratum, the city of Hercules, if the story is true, and over against it rose the temple of the goddess Juno at Lacinium, the citadel of Kaulon, and the Bay of Sculacium, that great breaker of ships. Then from far out at sea we sighted Mount Etna in Sicily and heard a loud moaning of waters and grinding of rocks and the voice of breakers beating on the shore as the sea began to rise and swirl the sand in its surge. Father Anchises cried out, This must be the deadly Charybdis. These are the cliffs Hellenus warned us against. These are the terrible rocks. Use all your strength to save yourselves, comrades. Keep well in time and rise to the oar. They did as they were bidden. Polynurus was the first to wrench his ship to port and out to sea with a loud creaking of the bow, and the whole fleet with every sail and oar stirred to port with him. A great arching wave came and lifted us to the sky, and a moment later as the wave was sucked down we plunged into the abyss of hell. Three times the cliffs roared between their hollow rocks. Three times we saw the foam shoot up and spatter the stars. Meanwhile, the sun had set, the wind had fallen, and we were weary and lost, drifting towards the shore of the Cyclops. The harbor there is out of the wind. It is still and spacious, but close by Mount Etna thunders and hurls down its deadly debris. Sometimes it shoots a pitch-black cloud of swirling smoke and glowing ashes into the sky and tosses up balls of flame to lick the stars. Sometimes it belches boulders, tearing out the bowels of the mountain and throwing molten rock up into the air, seething and groaning in its very depths. The story goes that the body of Enchilidus half consumed by the fire of the thunderbolt, is crushed under this great mass. Mighty Etna lies on top of him, breathing fire from its shattered furnaces, and every time he turns over from one weary flank to another, the whole of Sicily trembles and murmurs and wreathes the sky with smoke. We hid in the woods and lived through a night of horror, not seeing what was making these monstrous sounds. The fire of the stars was quenched and the dark bowl of, bowl of heaven was denied their radiance. Clouds darkened the sky, an unbroken night obscured the moon. At last the morning star appeared and the next day was beginning to rise. The goddess of the dawn had dispersed the dank mists from the sky when suddenly we saw a strange sight. Coming out of the woods was a man we did not know, in pitiable plight and half dead with hunger, coming towards us on the shore with his hand stretched out in supplication. We stared at him. The filth on his body was indescribable. He had a straggling beard, and the rags he wore were pinned together by thorns. But for all that he was a Greek, one of those who had been sent to Troy bearing the arms of his country. When still at a distance he saw our Trojan clothes and Trojan armor, he checked his stride and stood in terror at the sight of us. But he soon rushed down to the shore weeping and pleading, I beg you, Trojans, by all the stars, by the gods above, by the bright air of heaven which we breathe, take me aboard your ships. Take me anywhere, that is all I ask. I know I was one of those who sailed with the Greek fleet. I admit I made war against the gods of your homes in Troy. If that offense is so great, tear me limb from limb, scatter the pieces on the waves, and let them sink into the vastness of the sea. If I am to die, I shall be pleased to die at the hands of men." When he had spoken, he clasped our knees, he groveled on his knees and would not rise. We urged him to explain who he was, what family he came from, and what misfortune was driving him to this. Father Anchises himself was not slow to offer his right hand, and that assurance gave him courage. He laid aside his fear and told his story. 
My native land is Ithaca. I am a comrade of the unfortunate Ulysses. My name is Achaemenides. My father, Adamastus, being poor, I went to Troy. Cursed be the day. My comrades, distraught with fear, forgot me and left me here in the vast cave of the Cyclops when they crossed that cruel threshold to safety. This huge cavern is his home, deep and dark and filthy with the gore of his feasts. He himself is so tall that his head knocks against the stars. O oh, you gods, relieve the earth of all such monsters. No one dares to look at him or speak to him. He feeds on the flesh of his victims and drinks the black blood. I have seen him with my own eyes lolling in the middle of his cave with two of our men in one huge hand, bashing their bodies on the rock till the threshold was swimming with blood. I have seen him chewing arms and legs with black gore oozing from them and the warm limbs twitching between his teeth. But he met his punishment. The man from Ithaca did not submit to this. Whatever happened, Ulysses was always Ulysses. As soon as the Cyclops had his fill and was sunk in a drunken stupor, lying there with his head back and his neck exposed, sprawling all over the cave and belching blood and wine and pieces of flesh as he slept, we prayed to the great gods, and after casting lots, spread ourselves out all round him. Then, taking a sharp weapon, we drilled the one huge eye that lay, like an argive shield or the lamp of Apollo's sun, deep set in that dreadful forehead. That was how in the end we took sweet revenge for the death of our comrades. But you are in danger. You must escape and escape now. Cut your moorings and put to sea. You know what Polymphemus is and how huge he is. Keeping his woolly sheep penned there in his hollow cave and squeezing the milk from their udders, but there are a hundred other horrible cyclopses living together near this shore and roving the high mountains. This is now the third time I have seen the horns of the moon filling with light as I have dragged out my existence in the woods alone among the dens and lairs of wild beasts, climbing rocks to keep watch on the giant cyclopses, and trembling at the sound of their voices and the tread of their feet. My food is miserable. The trees yield me some berries and the fruit of the cornel, hard as stone, and I tear up herbs by the root and eat them. I have kept constant watch, but this is the first time I have seen ships coming near this shore. I have put myself in your hands, and would have done so whoever you had been. It is enough for me to escape from this unspeakable people. You can take this life of mine by whatever means you please. Scarcely had he finished speaking, when we saw the shepherd, Polyphemus himself, high up on the mountain among his sheep, heaving his vast bulk down towards the shore he knew so well. He was a terrifying sight, huge, hideous, blinded in his one eye, and using the trunk of a pine tree to guide his hand and give him a firm footing. His woolly sheep were coming with him. They were the only pleasure he had left, his sole consolation in distress. As soon as he felt the waves deepening and reached the level ocean, he washed away with sea water the blood that was still trickling from his gouged out eye, grinding his teeth and moaning, and as he strode now in mid-ocean, the waves still did not wet his towering flanks. We were terrified, and lost no time in taking the fugitive aboard, he had suffered enough, and making our escape. Keeping silence as we cut the cables, we churned the surface of the sea, leaning forward and straining at the oars. He heard us, and whirled round in the direction of our voices, but he had no chance of laying a hand on us or keeping up the current of the Ionian Sea, so he raised a great clamor which set the ocean and all its waves shivering. 
The whole land of Italy trembled with fear, and the bellowing boomed in the hollow caverns of Mount Etna. The tribe of Cyclopses was roused and came rushing down from their woods and high mountains to the harbor and filled the shore. We saw the brotherhood of Etna standing there helpless, each with his one eye glaring and head held high in the sky, a fearsome gathering, standing like high-topped mountain oaks or cone-bearing cypresses in Jupiter's soaring forest or the grove of Diana. With terror driving us along, we let the sheets full out and filled our sails with whatever wind was blowing. This is what Helenus had told us not to do. He had advised us that it was a narrow passage between Scylla and Charybdis, with death on either side if I did not hold a steady course. I resolved to turn about, and sure enough the north wind came to our rescue and blew down the narrow strait from Cape Pelorus. I sailed south past the mouth of the river Pentagius, with its harbor of natural rock, past the bay of Megara and low-lying Thapsus. Achaemenides pointed out such places to us as we took him back along the shores he had once sailed in his wanderings as a comrade of the unfortunate Ulysses. At the entrance to the Bay of Syracuse, opposite the wave-beaten headland of Plemurium, there stands an island which men of old called Ortugia. The story goes that the river god Alpheus of Elis forced his way here by hidden passages under the sea and now mingled with Sicilian waters at the mouth of Arethusa's fountain. Obeying the instructions we had received, we worshipped the great gods of the place, and I then sailed on, leaving behind the rich lands around the marshy river Helorus. From here we rounded Cape Pacunus, keeping close in to its jutting cliffs of rock, and Camarinia came into view in the distance, the place the fates forbade to move and then the Geloan plains and Gela itself called after its turbulent river. Then in the far distance appeared the great walls of Acragas on its crag, once famous for the breeding of high-mettled horses. Next, the winds carried me past Selenus, named after the parsley it gave to crown the victors in Greek games, and I steered past the dangerous shoals and hidden rocks of Lilubeum. I then put into port at Drepanum, but had little joy of that shore. This was the place where, weary as I was with all these batterings of sea and storm, to my great grief I lost my father and Kisis, who had been my support in every difficulty and disaster. This is where you left me, O best of fathers, whom I rescued from so many dangers and all to no purpose. Neither Helenus, for all his fearsome predictions, nor the harpy Kilino gave me any warning of this sorrow. This was the last of my labors. With this my long course was run. From here I sailed, and God drove me upon your shores. In these words did Father Aeneas recount his wanderings and the fates the gods had sent him, and they all listened. At last he was silent. Here he made an end and was at peace. My name is George Harrell. I'm from Idaho, graduated um, undergrad and master's degree from NSA. I'm teaching currently American history and economics, two different courses there with Kepler. And today I'm reading the Aeneid book four, The Tragic Queen of Carthage. 
but the queen. Too long she has suffered the pain of love, hour by hour nursing the wound with her lifeblood, consumed by the fire buried in her heart. The man's courage, the sheer pride of his line, they all come pressing home to her over and over. His looks, his words, they pierce her heart and cling, no rest, no peace for her body, love will give her none. A new day's dawn was moving over the earth, Aurora's torch, cleansing the sky, burning away the dank shade of night as the restless queen, beside herself, confides now to the sister of her soul. Dear Anna, the dreams that haunt my quaking heart, who is this stranger just arrived to lodge in our house, our guest? How noble his face, his courage, and what a soldier. I'm sure, I know it's true, the man is born of the gods. Fear exposes the low-born man at once, but oh, how tossed he's been by the blows of fate. What a tale he's told, what a bitter bowl of war he's drunk to the dregs. If my heart had not been fixed, dead set against embracing another man in the bonds of marriage, ever since my first love deceived me, cheated me by his death, if I were not as sick as I am of the bridal bed and torch, this, perhaps, is my one lapse that might have brought me down. I confess it, Anna, yes. Ever since my Sicaeus, my poor husband met his fate, and my own brother shed his blood and stained our household gods, this is the only man who's roused me deeply, swayed my wavering heart. The signs of the old flame, I know them well. I pray that the earth gape deep enough to take me down, or the Almighty Father blast me with one bolt to the shades. The pale, the glimmering shades in hell, the pit of night, before I dishonor you, my conscience, break your laws. He's carried my love away, the man who wed me first. May he hold it tight, safeguard it in his grave. She broke off her voice choking with tears that brimmed and wet her breast. But Anna answered, Dear one, dearer than light to me, your sister, would you waste away, grieving your youth away, alone, never to know the joy of children, all the gifts of love? Do you really believe that's what the dust desires, the ghosts in their ashen tombs? Have it your way. But granted that no one tempted you in the past, not in your great grief, no Libyan suitor, and none before entire. You scorned Yarbas and other lords of Africa, sons bred by this fertile earth and all their triumph. Why resist it now, this love that stirs your heart? Don't you recall whose lands you settled here? The men who pressed around you? On one side, the Catulian cities, fighters matchless in battle, unbridled Numidians, Syrtis, the treacherous sandbanks. On the other side, an endless desert, parched earth where the wild bark and marauders range at will. Why mention the war that boiling up entire your brother's deadly threats? I think, in fact, the favor of all the gods and Juno's backing drove these Trojan ships on the winds that sailed them here. Think what a city you will see, my sister. What a kingdom rising high if you marry such a man, with a Trojan army marching at our side. Think how the glory of Carthage will tower to the clouds." Just ask the gods for pardon, win them with offerings, treat your guests like kings, weave together some pretext for delay, while winter spends its rage and drenching Orion whips the sea, the ship still battered, weather still too wild. These were the words that fanned her sister's fire, turned her doubts to hopes, and dissolved her sense of shame. And first they visit the altars, make the rounds, praying the gods for blessings, shrine by shrine. They slaughter the pick of yearling sheep, the old way, to Ceres, giver of laws, to Apollo, Bacchus, who sets us free, and Juno, above all, who guards the bonds of marriage. Dido, aglow with beauty, holds the bowl in her right hand, pouring wine between the horns of a pure white cow, or gravely paces before the gods' fragrant altars. Under their statues' eyes, refreshing her first gifts, dawn to dusk. And when the victim's chests are splayed, Dido, her lips parted, pours over their entrails, throbbing still for signs. But oh, how little they know, the omniscient seers. What good are prayers and shrines to a person mad with love? The flame keeps gnawing into her tender marrow, hour by hour, and deep in her heart the silent wound lives on. Dido burns with love, the tragic queen. She wanders in frenzy through her city streets like a wounded doe caught all off guard by a hunter stalking the woods of Crete, 
who strikes her from afar and leaves his winging steel in her flesh. And he's unaware, but she veers in flight through Dicte's woody glades, fixed in her side the shaft that takes her life. And now, Dido leads her guests through the heart of Carthage, displaying Phoenician power, the city readied for him. She'd speak her heart, but her voice chokes midward. Now at dusk, she calls for the feast to start again, madly begging to hear again the agony of Troy, to hang on his lips again, savoring his story. Then, with the guests gone and the dimming moon quenching its light in turn, and the setting stars inclining heads to sleep, alone in the echoing hall, distraught, she flings herself on the couch that he left empty. Lost as he is, she's lost as well. She hears him, sees him, or she holds Ascanius back and dandles him on her lap, bewitched by the boy's resemblance to his father, trying to cheat the love she dare not tell. The towers of Carthage, half-built, rise no more, and the young men quit their combat drills and arms. The harbors, the battlements, plan to block attack, all work suspended now, the huge threatening walls with the soaring cranes that sway across the sky. No sooner had Jove's dear wife perceived that Dido was in the grip of such a scourge, no thought of pride could stem her passion now, than Juno approaches Venus and sets a cunning trap. What a glittering prize, a triumph you carry home, you and your boy there, you grand and glorious powers. Just look, one woman crushed by the craft of two gods. I am not blind, you know. For years you've looked askance at the homes of rising Carthage, feared our ramparts. But where will it end? What good is all our strife? Come, why don't we labor now to live in peace, eternal peace, sealed with the bonds of marriage? You have it all, whatever your heart desires, Dido's ablaze with love, drawing the frenzy deep into her bones. So let us rule this people in common, joint command, and let her marry her Phrygian lover, be his slave and give her Tyrians over to your control, her dowry in your hands. Perceiving at once that this was all pretense, a ruse to shift the kingdom of Italy onto Libyan shores, Venus countered Juno. Now, who'd be so insane as to shun your offer and strive with you in war? If only fortune crowns your proposal with success. But swayed by the fates, I have my doubts. Would Jove want one city to hold the Tyrians and the Trojan exiles? Would he sanction the mingling of their peoples, bless their binding pacts? You are his wife, with every right to probe him with your prayers. You lead the way, I'll follow. The work is mine. Imperious Juno carried on. But how to begin this pressing matter now and see it through? I'll explain in a word or so. Listen closely. Tomorrow, Aeneas and lovesick Dido plan to hunt the woods together, soon as the day's first light climbs high and the titan's rays lay bare the earth. But while the beaters scramble to ring the glens with nets, I'll shower down a cloudburst. Hail, black driving rain. I'll shatter the vaulting sky with claps of thunder. The huntsmen will scatter, swallowed up in the dark, and Dido and Troy's commander will make their way to the same cave for shelter. And I'll be there. If I can count on your own goodwill in this, I'll bind them in lasting marriage, make them one. Their wedding it will be. So Juno appealed, and Venus did not oppose her, nodding in assent, and smiling at all the guile she saw through. Meanwhile dawn rose up and left her ocean bed, and soon as her rays have lit the sky, an elite band of young huntsmen streams out through the gates, bearing the nets, wide-meshed or tight for traps, their hunting spears with broad iron heads, troops of Massilian horsemen galloping hard, packs of powerful hounds keen on the scent. Yet the queen delays, lingering in her chamber with Carthaginian chiefs expectant at her doors. And there her proud, meddlesome charger prances in gold and royal purple, pawing with thunder hoofs, championing a foam-flecked bit. At last she comes, with a great retinue crowding around the queen who wears a Tyrian cloak with rich embroidered fringe. Her quiver is gold, her hair drawn up in a golden torque, and a golden buckle clasps her purple robe and folds. Nor do her Trojan comrades tarry. Out they march, Young Ulysses flushed with joy, Aeneas in command, the handsomest of them all, advancing as her companion joins his troops with hers. So vivid. Think of Apollo leaving his Lycian haunts, and Xanthus in winter spate, 
He's out to visit Delos, his mother's isle, and strike up the dance again while round the altars swirls a growing throng of Cretans, Dryopians, Agathirsians with tattoos, and a drumming roar goes up as the god himself strides the Scythian ridge, his streaming hair braided with pliant laurel leaves entwined in twists of gold, and arrows clash on his shoulders. So no less swiftly Aeneas strides forward now, and his face shines with a glory like the gods. Once the huntsmen have reached the trackless lairs aloft in the foothills, suddenly, look, some wild goats flushed from a ridge come scampering down the slopes, and lower down a herd of stags goes bounding across the open country, ranks massed in a cloud of dust, fleeing the high ground. But young Ascanius, deep in the valley, rides his eager mount and relishing every stride outstrips them all. Now goats, now stags, but his heart is racing, praying, if only they'd send among this feeble easy game some frothing wild boar or a lion stalking down from the heights and tawny in the sun. Too late. The skies have begun to rumble, peals of thunder first, and the storm breaking next. A cloudburst, pelting hail, and the troops of hunters scatter up and down the plain. Tyrian com comrades, bands of Dardans, Venus's grandson Eulus, panicking, running for cover, quick, and down the mountain gullies erupt in torrents. Dido and Troy's commander make their way to the same cave for shelter now. Primordial Earth and Juno, queen of marriage, give the signal, and lightning torches flare in the high sky, bears witness to the wedding. Nymphs in the mountain tops wail out the wedding hymn. This was the first day of her death, the first of grief, the cause of it all. From now on, Dido cares no more for appearances, nor for her reputation either. She no longer thinks to keep the affair a secret. No, she calls it a marriage, using the word to cloak her sense of guilt. Straightway, rumor flies through Libya's great cities. Rumor, swiftest of all the evils in the world. She thrives on speed, stronger for every stride, slight with fear at first, and soon soaring into the air, she treads the ground and hides her head in the clouds. She is the last, they say, our Mother Earth produced. Bursting in rage against the gods, she bore a sister for Coes and Enceladus. Rumor, quicksilver afoot and swift on the wing, a monster, horrific, huge and under every feather on her body, what a marvel, an eye that never sleeps, and as many tongues as eyes and as many raucous mouths and ears pricked up for the news. By night she flies aloft between the earth and sky, whirring across the dark, never closing her lids in soothing sleep. By day she keeps her watch, crouched on a peaked roof or palace turret, terrorizing the great cities, clinging as fast to her twisted lies as she clings to words of truth. Now rumor is in her glory, filling Africa's ears with tale on tale of intrigue, brooding her song of facts and falsehoods mingled. Here this Aeneas, born of Trojan blood, has arrived in Carthage, and lovely Dido deigns to join the man in wedlock. Even now they warm the winter, long as it lasts, with obscene desire, oblivious to their kingdom's abject thralls of lust. Such talk the sordid goddess spreads on the lips of men, then swerves in her course, heading straight for King Yarbas, stokes his heart with hearsay, piling fuel on his fire. Yarbas, son of an African nymph whom Jove had raped, raised the god a hundred splendid temples across the king's wide realm, a hundred altars too, consecrating the sacred fires that never died, eternal sentinels of the gods. The earth was rich with blood of slaughtered herds, and the temple doorways wreathed with riots of flowers. This Yarvis, driven wild, set ablaze by the bitter rumor, approached an altar, they say, as the god hovered round, and lifting a suppliant's hand, he poured out prayers to Jove. Almighty Jove, now as the Moors adore you, feasting away on their gaudy couches, tipping wine in your honor, do you see this, or are we all fools, father, to dread the bolts you hurl? All aimless, then, your fires high in the clouds that terrify us so. All empty noise, your peals of grumbling thunder. That woman, that vagrant, here in my own land she founded her paltry city for a pittance. We tossed her some beach to plow, on my terms. And then she spurns our offer of marriage. She embraces Aeneas as lord and master in her realm. 
and now the second Paris, leading his troop of eunuchs, his hair oozing oil, a Phrygian bonnet tucked up under his chin. He revels in all that he has filched while we keep bearing gifts to your temples. Yes, yours, coddling your reputation, all your hollow show. So King Yarbus appealed, his hand clutching the altar, and Jove Almighty heard and turned his gaze on the royal walls of Carthage and the lovers oblivious now to their good name. He summons Mercury, gives him marching orders. Quick, my son, away, call up the zephyrs, glide on wings of the wind, find the Dardan captain who now malingers long in Tyrian Carthage, look and pays no heed to the city's fate decrees are his. Take my commands through the racing winds, and tell him this is not the man his mother, the lovely goddess, promised. Not for this did she save him twice from Greek attacks. Never. He would be the one to master an Italy rife with leaders, shrill with the cries of war, to sire a people sprung from Teucer's noble blood, and bring the entire world beneath the rule of law. If such a glorious destiny cannot fire his spirit, if he will not shoulder the task for his own fame— does the father of Ascanius grudge his son the walls of Rome? What is he plotting now? What hope can make him loiter among his foes, lose sight of Italian offspring still to come, and all the Lavinian fields? Let him sail. This is the sum of it. This must be our message. Jove had spoken. Mercury made ready at once to obey the great commands of his almighty father. First he fastens under his feet the golden sandals, winged to sweep him over the waves and earth alike with the rush of gusting winds. Then he seizes the wand that calls the pallid spirits up from the underworld and ushers others down to the grim dark depths. The wand that lends us sleep or sends it away, that unseals our eyes in death. Equipped with this, he spurs the winds and swims through billowing clouds, till in mid-flight he spies the summit and rugged flanks of Atlas, whose long-enduring peaks supports the skies. Atlas, his pine-covered crown, is forever girded round with black clouds, battered by wind and rain. Driving blizzards cloak his shoulders with snow. Torrents course down from the old titan's chin, and shaggy beard that bristles stiff with ice. Here the god of Silene landed first, banking down to a stop on balanced wings. From there, headlong down with his full weight, he plunged to the sea as a sea hawk skims the waves, rounding the beaches, rounding cliffs to hunt for fish in shore. So Mercury of Silene flew between the earth and sky to gain the sandy coast of Libya, cutting the winds that sweep down from his fa mother's father, Atlas. Soon as his winged feet touched down on the first huts in sight, he spots Aeneas, founding the city fortifications, building homes in Carthage, and his sword hilt is studded with tawny jasper stars. A cloak of glowing Tyrian purple drapes his shoulders, a gift that the wealthy queen had made herself, weaving into the weft a glinting mesh of gold. Mercury lashes out at once. You sow now, you lay foundation stones for the soaring walls of Carthage, building her gorgeous city, doting on your wife, blind your own realm, oblivious to your fate, the king of the gods whose power sways earth and sky. He is the one who sends me down from brilliant Olympus, bearing commands for you through the racing winds. What are you plotting now, wasting time in Libya? What hope misleads you so? If such a glorious destiny cannot fire your spirit, if you will not shoulder the task for your own fame, at least remember Ascanius rising into his prime, the hopes you lodge in Eulis, your only heir. You owe him Italy's realm, the land of Rome. This order still on his lips, the god vanished from sight into empty air. Then Aeneas was truly overwhelmed by the vision, stunned. His hackles bristled with fear. His voice chokes in his throat. He yearns to be gone, to desert this land he loves, thunderstruck by the warnings, Jupiter's command. But what can he do? What can he dare say now to the queen in all her fury and win her over? Where to begin? What opening? Thoughts racing, here, there, probing his options, turning to this plan, that plan, torn in two, until at his wit's end, this answer seems the best. He summons Nathesius, Sergestus, staunch Serestus, gives them orders. Fit out the fleet, but not a word. Muster the crews on shore, all tackles set to sail. But the cause for our new course, you keep it secret. 
Yet he himself, since Daidu, who means the world to him, knows nothing, never dreaming such a powerful love could be uprooted. He will try to approach her, find the moment to break the news gently, a way to soften the blow that he must leave. All shipmates snap to commands, glad to do his orders. True, but the queen, who can delude a lover? soon caught wind of a plot afoot, the first to sense the Trojans are on the move. She fears everything now, even with all secure. Rumor, vicious as ever, brings her word, already distraught, that Trojans are rigging out their galleys, gearing to set sail. She rages in helpless frenzy, blazing through the entire city, raving like some maenad, driven wild when the women shake the sacred emblems, when the cyclic orgy shouts of Bacchus fire her on, and Citharon echoes round with maddening midnight fires. At last she assails Aeneas before he said a word. So, you traitor, you really believed you'd keep this a secret, this great outrage? Steal away in silence from my shores? Can nothing hold you back? Not our love? Not the pledge once sealed with our right hands? Not even the thought of Dido, doomed to a cruel death? Why labor to rig your fleet when the winter's raw, to risk the deep when the north wind's closing in? You cruel heartless, even if you were not pursuing alien fields and unknown homes, even if ancient Troy were standing still, who'd sail for Troy across such heaving seas? You're running away from me? Oh, I pray you, by these tears, by the faith in your right hand, what else have I left myself in all my pain? By our wedding vows, the marriage we began, if I deserve some decency from you now, if anything mine has ever won your heart, pity a great house about to fall, I pray you. If prayers have any place, reject this scheme of yours. Thanks to you, the African tribes, the Numidian warlords, hate me, even my own Tyrians rise against me. Thanks to you, my sense of honor is gone, my one and only pathway to the stars. The renown I once held dear, in whose hands my guests do you leave me here to meet my death. Guests, that's all that remains of husband now. But why do I linger on, until my brother Pygmalion batters down my walls, or Yarbus drags me off his slave? If only you'd left a baby in my arms, our child, before you deserted me, some little Aeneas playing about our halls, whose features at last would bring you back to me in spite of all, I would not feel so totally devastated, so destroyed. The queen stopped. But he, warned by Jupiter now, his gaze held steady, fought to master the torment in his heart. At last he ventured a few words. I... You have done me so many kindness, and you could count them all. I shall never deny what you deserve, my queen, never regret my memories of Dido, not while I can recall myself and draw the breath of life. I'll state my case in a few words. I never dreamed I'd keep my flight a secret. Don't imagine that. Nor did I once extend a bridegroom's torch or enter into a marriage pact with you. If the fates had left me free to live my life, to arrange my own affairs of my own free will— Troy is the city, first of all, that I'd safeguard. Troy and all that's left of my people whom I cherish. The grand palace of Priam would stand once more. With my own hands, I would fortify a second Troy to house my Trojans in defeat. But not now. Grinian, Apollo's oracle, says that I must seize on Italy's noble land. His Lycian lots say Italy. There lies my love. There lies my homeland now. If you, a Phoenician... Fix your eyes on Carthage, a Libyan stronghold. Tell me, why do you grudge the Trojans, their new homes on Italian soil? What is the crime if we seek far-off kingdoms too? My father and Chysis, whenever the darkness shrouds the earth in its dank shadows, whenever the stars go flaming up the sky, my father's anxious ghost warns me in dreams and fills my heart with fear. My son, Ascanius, I feel the wrong I do to one so dear, robbing him of his kingdom, lands in the west, his fields decreed by fate. And now the messenger of the gods, I swear it, by your life and mine, dispatched by Jove himself, has brought me firm commands through the racing winds. With my own eyes I saw him, clear in broad daylight, moving through your gates. With my own ears I drank his message in. Come, stop inflaming us both with your appeals. I set sail for Italy, all against my will. 
even from the start of his declaration. She has glared at him askance, her eyes roving over him, head to foot, with a look of stony silence, till abruptly she cries out in a blaze of fury. No goddess was your mother, no Dardanus sired your line, you traitor liar. No, Mount Caucasus fathered you on its flinty, rugged flanks, and the tigers of Hyrcania give you their dugs to suck. Why hide it? Why hold back to suffer greater blows? Did he groan when I wept? Even look at me? Never. Surrender a tear? Pity the one who loves him? What can I say first? So much to say. Now, neither mighty Juno nor Saturn's son the father gazes down on this with just impartial eyes. There's no faith left on earth. He was washed upon my shores helpless, and I, I took him in like a maniac, let him share my kingdom. Salvaged his lost fleet, plucked his crews from death. Oh, I am swept by the furies, gales of fire. Now it's Apollo the prophet, Apollo's Lycian oracles. They're his masters now. And now, to top it off, the messenger of the gods, dispatched by Jove himself, come rushing down the winds with his grim sect commands. Really, what work for the gods who live on high? What a concern to ruffle their repose. I won't hold you. I won't even refute you. Go. Strike out for Italy on the winds, your realm across the sea. I hope, I pray, if the just gods still have any power wrecked on the rocks mid-sea, you'll drink your bowl of pain to the dregs, crying out the name of Dido over and over, and worlds away I'll hound you then with pitched black flames, and when icy death has severed my body from its breath, then my ghost will stalk you through the world. You'll pay, you shameless, ruthless, and I will hear of it. Yes, the report will reach me even among the deepest shades of death. She breaks off in the midst of outbursts, desperate, flinging herself from the light of day, sweeping out of his sight, leaving him numb with doubt, with much to fear and much he means to say. Catching her as she faints away, her women bear her back to her marble bridal chamber and lay her body down upon her bed. But Aeneas is driven by duty now. Strongly as he longs to ease and allay her sorrow, speak to her, Turn away her anguish with reassurance, still moaning deeply, heart shattered by his great love. In spite of all, he obeys the gods' commands, and back he goes to his ships. Then the Tro Trojans throw themselves in the labor, launching their tall vessels down along the beach, and the hall rubbed sleek with pitch floats high again. So keen to be gone, the men drag down from the forest untrimmed timbers and boughs still green for oars. You can see them streaming out of the whole city, men like ants that, wary of winter's onset, pillage some huge pile of wheat to store away in their grange, and their army's long black line goes marching through the field, trundling their spoils down some cramped grassy track. Some put shoulders to giant grains and thrust them on, some dress the ranks strictly martial stragglers, and the whole trail seethes with labor. What did you feel then, Dido, seeing this? How deep were the groans you uttered, gazing now from the city heights to watch the broad beaches seething with action, the bay a chaos of outcries right before your eyes? Love, you tyrant, to what extremes won't you compel our hearts? Again she resorts to tears, driven to move the man, or try with prayers, a suppliant kneeling, humbling her pride to passion. So if Die she must, she'll leave no way untried. Anna, you see the hurly-burly all across the beach, the crews swarming from every quarter, the wind cries for canvas, the buoyant oarsmen crown their sterns with wreaths, this terrible sorrow. Since I saw it coming, Anna, I can endure it now. But even so, my sister, carry out for me one great favor in my pain. To you alone he used to listen the traitor, to you confide his secret feelings. You alone know how and when to approach him, soothe his moods. Go, my sister, plead with my imperious enemy. Remind him, I was never at Aulis, never swore a pact with the Greeks to rout the Trojan people from the earth. I sent no fleet to Troy. I never uprooted the ashes of his father and Chyses, never stirred his shade. Why does he shut his pitiless ears to my appeals? Where is he rushing now? If only he would offer one last gift to the wretched queen who loves him, to wait for fair winds, smooth sailing for his flight. 
I no longer beg for the long-lost marriage he betrayed, nor would I ask him now to desert his kingdom, no, his lovely passion, Latium. All I ask is time, blank time, some rest from frenzy, breathing room till my fate can teach my beaten spirit how to grieve. I beg him, pity your sister, Anna, one last favor, and if he grants it now, I'll pay him back with interest when I die. So Dido pleads, and so her desolate sister takes in the tale of tears again and again. But no tears move Aeneas now. He is deaf to all appeals. He won't relent. The fates bar the way, and his heaven blocks his gentle human ears. As firm as a sturdy oak grown tough with age, when the north winds blasting off the Alps compete, fighting left and right to wrench it from the earth, and the winds scream, the trunks shudder, its leafy crest showers across the ground, but it clings firm to its rock, its roots stretching as deep into the dark world below as its crown grows, towering toward the gales of heaven. So firm this hero stands, buffeted left and right by storms of appeals. He takes the full force of love and suffering deep in his great heart. His will stands unmoved. The falling tears are futile. Then, terrified by her fate, tragic Dido prays for death, sickened to see the vaulting sky above her, and to steal her new resolve to leave the light. She sees, laying gifts on the altars, steaming incense, shudder to hear it now, the holy water going black, and the wine she pours congeals in bloody filth. She tells no one what she saw, not even her sister. Worse, there was a marble temple in her palace, a shrine built for her long-lost love, Sicaeus. Holding it dear, she tended it, marvelous devotion, draping the snow-white fleece and festal boughs. Now from its depths, she seemed to catch his voice, the words of her dead husband calling out her name, while night enclosed the earth in its dark shroud, and over and over a lonely owl perched on the rooftops drew out its low, throaty call to a long, wailing dirge. And worse yet, the grim predictions of ancient seers keep terrifying her now with frightful warnings. Aeneas, the hunter, savage in all her nightmares, drives her mad with panic. She always feels alone, abandoned, always wandering down some endless road, not a friend in sight, seeking her own Phoenicians in some godforsaken land, as frantic as Pentheus, seeing battalions of furies, twin suns ablaze and double cities of Thebes before his eyes, or Agamemnon's Orestes, hounded off the stage, fleeing his mother armed with torches, black snakes, while blocking the doorway coil her furies of revenge. So, driven by madness, beaten down by anguish, Dido was fixed on dying, working out in her mind the means, the moment. She approaches her grieving sister, Anna, masking her plan with a brave face aglow with hope, and says, I found a way, dear heart. Rejoice with your sister, either to bring him back in love for me or free me of love for him. Close to the bounds of ocean, west with the setting sun, lies Ethiopian land, the end of the earth, where colossal Atlas turns on his shoulder, the heavens studded with flaming stars. From there, I have heard a Massilian priestess comes who tended the temple held by Hesperian daughters. She'd safeguard the boughs in the sacred grove and ply the dragon with morsels dripping loops of oozing honey and poppies drowsing with slumber. With her spells, she vows to release the hearts of those she likes, to inflict raw pain on others, to stop the rivers in midstream, reverse the stars in their courses, raise the souls of the dead at night and make earth shudder and rumble underfoot. You'll see, and send the ash trees marching down the mountains. I swear by the gods, dear Anna, by your sweet life, I arm myself with magic arts against my will. Now go, build me a pyre in secret, deep inside our courtyard, under the open sky. Pilot high with his arms, he left them hanging within our bridal chamber. The traitor, so devoted then. And all his clothes, and crowning it all, the bridal bed that brought my doom. I must obliterate every trace of the man, the curse, and the priestess shows the way. She says no more, and now as the queen falls silent, pallor sweeps her face. Still Anna cannot imagine these outlandish rites would mask her sister's death. 
She can't conceive of such a fierce passion. She fears nothing graver than Dido's grief at the hands of her Psychus. So she does as she is told. But now the queen, as soon as the pyre was built beneath the open sky, towering up with pitch pine and cut logs of oak, deep in the heart of her house, she drapes the court with flowers, crowning the place with wreaths of death. And to top it off, she lays his arms in the sword he left and an effigy of Aeneas, all on the bed they'd shared, for well she knows the future. Altars ring the pyre, her hair loose in the wind, the priestess thunders out the names of her three hundred gods, Erebus, Chaos, and Triple Hecate, Diana, the three-faced virgin. She'd sprinkled the water, simulating the springs of hell, and gathered potent herbs, reaped with bronze sickles, under the moonlight, dripping their milky black poison, and fetched a love charm ripped from a foal's brow, just born before the mother could gnaw it off. And Dido herself, standing before the altar, holding the sacred grain in reverent hands, with one foot free of its sandal, robes unbound, sworn now to die. She calls on the gods to witness, calls on the stars who know her approaching fate, and then to any power above, mindful, even-handed, who watches over lovers bound by unequal passion, Dido says her prayers. The dead of night and weary living creatures throughout the world are enjoying peaceful sleep. The woods and savage seas are calm, at rest, and the circling stars are gliding on in their midnight courses. All the fields lie hushed, and the flocks and gay and gorgeous birds that haunt the deep, clear pools and the thorny country thickets all lie quiet now, under the silent night, asleep. But not the tragic queen. Torn in Spiro, Dido will not dissolve into sleep. Her eyes, her mind won't yield tonight. Her torments multiply over and over. Her passion surges back into heaving waves of rage. She keeps on brooding. Obsessions roil her heart. And now what shall I do? Make a mockery of myself? Go back to my old suitors? Tempt them to try again? Beg the Numidians? Grovel? Plead for a husband? Though time and again I scorn to wed their like? What then? Trail the Trojan ships? Bend to the Trojans every last demand? So pleased are they with all the help, the relief I lent them once. And memory of my service past stands firm in grateful minds. And even if I were willing, would the Trojans allow me to board their proud ships, a woman they hate? Poor lost fool, can't you sense it, grasp it yet, the treachery of Lamadon's breed? What now? Do I take flight alone, consorting with crews of Trojan oarsmen in their triumph? Or follow them out with all my troops of Tyrians thronging the decks? Yes, hard as it was to uproot them once from Tyre, how can I force them back to sea once more, command them to spread their sails to the winds? No, no, die. You deserve it. End your pain with the sword. You, my sister, you were the first won over by my tears to pile these sorrows on my shoulders, mad as I was, to throw me into my enemy's arms. If only I'd been free to live my life untested in marriage, free of guilt as some wild beast untouched by pangs like these. I broke the faith I swore to the ashes of Sychaeus. Such terrible grief kept breaking from her heart, as Aeneas slept in peace on his ship's high stern, bent on departing now, all tackles set to sail. And now in his dreams it came again, the god, his phantom, the same features shining clear, like mercury head to foot, the voice, the glow, the golden hair, the bloom of youth on his limbs and his voice rang out with warnings once again. Son of the goddess, how can you sleep so soundly in such a crisis? Can't you see the dangers closing around you now? Madman, can't you hear the west wind ruffling to speed you on? That woman spawns her plots, mulling over some desperate outrage in her heart, lashing her surging rage. She's bent on death. Why not flee headlong? Flee headlong while you can. You'll soon see the waves, a chaos of ships, lethal torches flaring, the whole coast ablaze, if now a new dawn breaks and finds you still malingering on these shores. Up with you now, enough delay. Woman's a thing that's always changing, shifting like the wind. And with that, he vanished into the black night. Then terrified by the sudden phantom, Aeneas, 
wrenching himself from sleep, leaps up and rouses his crew and spurs them headlong on. Quick, up and at it, shipmates. Man the thwarts. Spread canvas fast. A god's come down from the sky once more. I've seen him. Urging us on to sever our mooring cables. Sail at once. We follow you, blessed god, whoever you are. Glad at heart, we obey your commands once more. Now help us. Stand beside us with all your kindness. Bring us favoring stars in the sky to blaze our way. Tearing sword from sheath like a lightning flash, he hacks the mooring lines with a naked blade. Gripped by the same desire, all hands pitch in. They hoist and haul. The shore's deserted now, the water's hidden under the fleet. They bend to it, churn the spray and sweep the clear blue sea. By now, early dawn had risen up from the saffron bed of Tithonus, scattering fresh light on the cloud. But the queen from her high tower... Catching sight of the morning's white glare, the armada heading out to sea with sails trimmed to the wind, and certain the shore and port were empty, stripped of oarsmen, three, four times over she beat her lovely breast, she ripped at her golden hair, and, oh by God, she cries, will the stranger just sail off and make a mockery of our realm? Will no one rush to arms, come streaming out of the whole city, hunt him down, race to the docks and launch the ships? Go quick, bring fire, hand out weapons, bend the oars. What am I saying? Where am I? What insanity is this that shifts my fixed resolve? Dido, poor fool, is it only now your wicked work strikes home? It should have then when you offered him your scepter. Look at his hand clasp. Look at his good faith now. That man who they say carries his father's gods, who stooped to shoulder his father bent with age. Couldn't I have seized him then, ripped him to pieces, scattered them in the sea, or slashed his men with steel, butchered Ascanius, served him up as his father's feast? True, the luck of battle might have been at risk. Well, risk away. Whom did I have to fear? I was about to die. I should have torched their camp and flooded their decks with fire. The son, the father, the whole Trojan line. I should have wiped them out, then hurled myself on the pyre to crown it all. You sun whose fires scan all works of the earth, and you Juno, the witness midwife to my agonies. Hecate, greeted by nightly shrieks at city crossroads, and you, you avenging furies, and gods of dying Dido. Hear me, turn your power my way, attend my sorrows. I deserve your mercy. Hear my prayers. If that curse of the earth must reach his haven, labor on to landfall, if Jove and the fates command and the boundary stone is fixed, still let him be plagued in war by a nation proud in arms, torn from his borders, wrenched from Ulysses' embrace. Let him grovel for help and watch his people die a shameful death. And then, once he has bowed down to an unjust peace, may he never enjoy his realm and the light he yearns for. Never. Let him die before his day, unburied on some desolate beach. That is my prayer, my final cry. I pour it out with my own lifeblood. And you, my Tyrians, harry with hatred all his line, his race to come. Make that offspring to my ashes. Send it down below. No love between our peoples, ever. No pacts of peace. Come rising up from my bones, you avenger still unknown, to stalk those Trojan settlers. Hunt with fire and iron, now or in time to come, whenever the power is yours. Shore clash with shore, sea against sea, and sword against sword. This is my curse. War between all our peoples, all their children. Endless war. With that, her mind went veering back and forth. What was the quickest way to break off from the light? the life she loathed. And so with a few words, she turned to Barca, Sicaeus' old nurse. Her own was now black ashes deep in her homeland, lost forever. Dear old nurse, send Anna, my sister, to me here. Tell her to hurry. Sprinkle herself with river water. Bring the victims marked for the sacrifice I must make. So let her come, and wrap your brow with the holy bands, these rites to Jove of the sticks that I have set in motion. I yearn to consummate them, End the pain of love. Give that cursed Trojan's pyre to the flames. The nurse bustled off with an old crone's zeal. But Dido, trembling, desperate now with the monstrous thing afoot, her bloodshot eyes rolling, quivering, cheeks blotched with pain, with imminent death, goes bursting through the doors to the inner courtyard, 
clambers in frenzy up the soaring pyre and unsheaths a sword, a Trojan sword she once sought as a gift, but not for such an end. And next, catching sight of the Trojans' clothes in the bed they knew by heart, delaying a moment for tears for memory's sake, the queen lay down and spoke her final words. O dear relics, dear as long as fate and the gods allowed, receive my spirit and set me free of pain. I have lived a life. I have journeyed through the course that fortune charted for me, and now I pass to the world below my ghost in all its glory. I have founded a noble city, seen my ramparts rise. I have avenged my husband, punished my blood brother, our mortal foe. Happy, all too happy I would have been if only the Trojan keels had never grazed our coast. She presses her face in the bed and cries out, I shall die unavenged, but die I will. So, so, I rejoice to make my way among the shades. And may that heartless Darden far at sea drink down deep the sight of our fires here and bear with him this omen of our death. All at once, in the midst of her last words, her women see her doubled over the sword, the blood foaming over the blade, her hands splattered red. A scream goes stabbing up to the high roofs. Rumor raves like a maenad through the choked city. Sobs and grief and the wails of women ringing out through homes. And the heavens echo back the keening din. For all the world, as if enemies stormed the walls and all of Carthage or old Tyre were toppling down in flames in their fury, wave on mounting wave, were billowing over the roofs of gods and men. Anna heard, and stunned, breathless with terror, raced through the crowd, her nails clawing her fists, fists beating her breast, crying out to her sister now at the edge of death, Was it all for this, my sister, you deceived me all along? Is this what your pyre meant for me? This, your fires? This, your altars? You deserted me. What shall I grieve for first? Your friend, your sister, you scorn me now in death. You should have called me on to the same fate, the same agony, same sword, the one same hour had borne us off together. Just to think I built your pyre with my own hands, implored our father's gods with my own voice, only to be cut off from you. How very cruel, when you lay down to die, you have destroyed your life, my sister, mine too, your people, the lords of Sidon, and your new city here. Please help me to bathe your wounds in water now, and if any last lingering breath still hovers, let me catch it on my lips. With those words, she had climbed the pyre's topmost steps, and now clasping her dying sister to her breast, fondling her, she sobbed, staunching the dark blood with her own gown. Dido, trying to raise her heavy eyes once more, failed. Deep in her heart, the wound kept rasping, hissing on. Three times she tried to struggle up on an elbow. Three times she fell back, writhing on her bed. Her gaze wavering into the high skies, she looked for a ray of light, and when she glimpsed it, moaned. Then Juno, in all her power, filled with pity for Dido's agonizing death, her labor long and hard, spit Iris down from Olympus to release her spirit, wrestling now in a death lock with her limbs. Since she was dying a death not fated or deserved, no, tormented before her day in a blaze of passion, Proserpina had yet to pluck a golden lock from her head and commit her life to the Styx and the dark world below. So Iris, glistening dew, comes skimming down from the sky on gilded wings, trailing showers of iridescence shimmering into the sun, and hovering over Dido's head declares, So commanded I take this lock as a sacred gift, to the gods of death, and I release you from your body. And with that, she cut the lock with her hand, and all at once, the warmth slipped away, the life dissolved in the winds. My name is Isaiah Nixon. I am a geography teacher with Kepler Education, where I teach courses in cartography, people and place, and life on Earth. I am also the director of the Rhetoric School at Oak Grove Classical Academy in Albuquerque, New Mexico, 
where I teach logic, rhetoric, and history courses. I am reading the Dryden translation of the Aeneid, published in 1697. I have chosen to read this translation because our seventh grade students read this translation. It is old, but it has stood the test of time and is easily understood by readers of all ages. Book five. Aeneas, setting sail from Africa, is driven by a storm on the coast of Sicily, where he is hospitably received by his friend Acestus, king of part of the island, and born of Trojan parentage. He applies himself to celebrate the memory of his father with divine honors, and accordingly institutes funeral games and appoints prizes for those who should conquer in them. While the ceremonies were performing, Juno sends Iris to persuade the Trojan women to burn the ships, who upon her instigation set fire to them, which burnt four, and would have consumed the rest had not Jupiter, by a miraculous shower, extinguished it. Upon this, Aeneas, by the advice of one of his generals and a vision of his father, builds a city for the women, old men, and others, who were either unfit for war or weary of the voyage and sails for Italy. Venus procures of Neptune a safe voyage for him and all his men, excepting only his pilot, Polinarus, who is unfortunately lost. Meantime, the Trojan cuts his watery way, fixed on his voyage, through the curling sea, then casting back his eyes with dire amaze, sees on the Punic shore the mounting blaze, the cause unknown, Yet his presaging mind, the fate of Dido from the fire divined. He knew the stormy souls of womankind, what secret springs their eager passions move. How capable of death for injured love, dire auguries from the hence the Trojans draw, till neither fires nor shining shores they saw. Now seas and skies their prospect only bound, an empty space above, a floating field around. But soon the heavens with shadows were spread, a swelling cloud hung hovering o'er their head, livid it looked and threatening of a storm. Then night in horror ocean's face deform, the pilot Polinarus cried aloud, What gusts of weather from the gathering cloud, my thoughts presage ere yet tempest roars, Stand your tackle, mates, and stretch your oars. Contract your swaling sails and luff to wind. The frightened crew perform the task assigned. Then, to his fearless chief, Not heaven, he said, though Jove himself could promise Italy, Can stern the torrent of this raging sea. Mark how the shifting winds from west arise, And what collected night involves the skies. Nor can our shaken vessels live at sea, much less again the tempest forced their way. Tis a fate diverts our course, and fate we must obey. Not far from hence, if I observed aright, the southing of the stars and polar light, Cecilia lies, whose hospitable shores, in safety we may reach with struggling oars. Aeneas then replied, too sure I find we strive in vain against the seas and wind. Now shift your sails, what place can please me more than what you promised the Sicilian shore, whose hollowed earth and Kinsey's bones contains, and where a prince of Trojan lineage reigns, the course resolved before the western wind, thy scud amain, and make the port assigned. Meantime, Acestus from a lofty stand beheld the fleet descending on the land, and not unmindful of his ancient race, down from the cliff he ran with eager pace, and held the hero in a strict embrace. Of a rough Libyan bear the spoils he wore, and either a hand-pointed javelin bore, his mother was a dame of Dardan blood, his sire Chrysissus, a Sicilian flood. He welcomes his returning friends ashore with plenteous county cates and homely store. Now, when the following morn had chased away the flying stars and light restored the day, Aeneas called the Trojan troops around, and thus bespoke them from a rising ground. 
offspring of heaven, divine Dardidian race, the sun revolving through its real space. The shining circle of the year has filled, since first this isle my father's ashes held, and now the rising day renews the year, a day forever sad, forever dear. This would I celebrate with annual games, with gifts on altars piled and holy flames. Though banished Gatulia's barren sands, caught on the Grecian seas or hostile lands. But since this happy storm our fleet has driven, not as I deem without the will of heaven, upon these friendly shores and flowery plains, which hide Achilles and his blessed remains. Let us with joy perform his honors due, and pray for prosperous winds our voyage to renew. Pray that in towns and temples of our own the name of great Ancinsis may be known, and our yearly games may spread the gods' renown. Our sports, Acestus of the Trojan race, with royal gifts ordained, is pleased to grace. Two steers on every ship the king bestows, his gods and ours sh shall share your equal vows. Besides, if nine days hence the rosy morn shall with unclouded light the skies adorn, that day with solemn sports I mean to grace, like galleys on the seas shall run a watery race. Some shall in swiftness for the goal contend, and others try the twanging bow to bend. The strong, the iron gauntlet's arm shall stand, Opposed in combat on the yellow sand. Let all be present at the games prepared, And joyful victors wait the just reward. But now assist the rites, with garlands crowned. He said, and first his brows with myrtle bound. Then Helamus by his example led, And old Acestus each adorned his head. Thus young Ascanus, with sprightly grace, His temples tied, and all the Trojan race. Aeneas then advanced amidst the train, by thousands followed through the flowery plain, to great Achinsus' tomb, which when he found, he poured to Bacchus on the hollowed ground. Two bowls of sparkling wine, of milk two more, and two from offered bowls of purple gore. With roses then sepulchre he strode, and thus his father's ghost bespoke aloud. Hail, O ye holy manes, hail again, Paternal ashes now reviewed in vain. The gods permitted not that you with me Should reach the promised shores of Italy, Or Tiber's flood, what flood sore it be. Scarce had he finished, when the speckled pride, A serpent from the tomb began to glide. His huggy bulk on seven high volumes rolled. Blue was his breadth of back, but streaked with scaly gold. Thus riding on his curls, he seemed to pass a rolling fire along and singe the grass. More various colors through his body run than Iris when her bow imbibes the sun. Betwixt the rising altars and around, the sacred monster shot along the ground. With harmless play, amidst the bowls he passed, And with his lolling tongue essayed the taste. Thus fed with holy food, the wondrous guest, Within the hollow tomb retired to rest. The pious prince, surprised at what he viewed, The funeral honors with more zeal renewed, Doubtful if this place's genius were, Or guardian of his father's sepulchre. Five sheep, according to the rites, he slew, as many swine and steers of sable hue. Now new generous wine from the goblets poured, and called his father's ghost from hell restored. The glad attendants in long order come, offering their gifts at great Ankinsi's tomb. Some add more oxen, some divide the spoil, some place the charges on the grassy soil. Some blow the fires, and offered entrails broil. Now came the day desired. The skies were bright, with rosy luster of rising light. The bordering people, roused by sounding fame, Of Trojan feasts and great Acestes' name. The crowded shore with acclamations fill, Part to behold and part to prove their skill, And first the gifts in public view they place. 
green laurel wreaths and palm and victor's grace. Within the circle, arms and tripods lie, igots of gold and silver heaped on high, and vests embroidered of the Tyrian dye. The trumpets clangor, then the feast proclaims, and all prepare for their appointed games. Four galleys first, which equal rowers bear, advancing in the watchery's lists appear. The speedy dolphin outstrips the wind, bore Minuthus author of the Memian kind. Gyas the vast Chimera's bolt commands, which rising like towering city stands. Three Trojans tug at every laboring oar, three banks in three degrees the sailors bore. Beneath their sturdy strokes the billows roar. Sir Gesthus, who began the Sergian race, in the great centaur took the leading place. Clonthus on the sea green Silo stood, from Clunthius draws his Trojan blood. Far in the sea against the foaming shore, there stands a rock, the raging billows roar, above his head in storms, but, when tis clear, uncurl their ridgy backs, and at his foot appear, in peace below the gentle waters run, the cormorants above lie basking in the sun. On this the hero fixed an oak in sight, the mark to guide the mariners aright. To bear with this, the seamen stretch their oars. Then round the rock they steer and seek the former shores. The lots decide their pace. Above the rest, each leader shining in his Tyrian vest, the common crew with wreaths of poplar boughs. Their temples crown, and shade their sweaty brows. Besmeared with oil, their naked shoulders shine. All take their seats and wait the sounding sign. They gripe their oars, every panting breast is rayed by turns with hope, by turns with fear depressed. The clangor of the trumpet gives the sign. At once they start, advancing in a line. With shouts, the sailors rend the starry skies. Lashed with their oars, the smoking billows rise. Sparkles the briny man, and the vexed ocean fries. Exact in time, with equal strokes they row. At once, the brushing oars and brazen pro dash upon the sandy ways, at ope the depths below. Not fiery coursers in a chariot race invade the field with half so swift a pace. Not the fierce driver with more fury lends, the sounding lash and ere the stroke descends. Low to the wheels his pliant body bends. The partial crowd their hopes and fears divide, and aid with eager shouts the favored side. Cries, murmurs, clamors, with a mixing sound from woods to woods, from hills to hills rebound. Amidst the loud applauses of the shore, Giaz outstripped the rest and sprung before. Cloanthus, better manned, pursued him fast, but his oar-masted galley checked his haste. The centaur and the dolphin brushed the brine, with equal oars advancing in a line. Now the mighty centaur seems to lead, and now the speedy dolphin gets ahead. Now board to board the rival vessels row, the billows lave the skies and the ocean groans below. They reach the mark, proud Gius and his train, in triumph rode the victors of the main. But steering round, he charged his pilot sand, more close to shore and skim along the sand. Let others bear to sea, Minotus heard, but secret shelves too cautiously he feared, and fearing, sought the deep, and still aloof he steered. With louder cries, the captain called again. Bear to the rocky shore and shun the main, he spoke. And speaking, at his stern he saw the bold Cloanthus near the shelvings draw. Betwixt the mark and him, Scylla stood, and in a closer compass plowed the flood. He passed the mark, and wheeling got before, Gia's blaspheme, the gods devoutly swore, cried out for anger, and his hair he tore. Mindless of the others' lives, 
So high was grown his rising rage, and careless of his own. The trembling daughter to the deck he drew, then hoistened up, and overboard he threw. This done, he seized the helm, his fellows cheered, turned short upon the shelves, and madly steered. Hardly his head the plunging pilot rears, clogged with his clothes and cumbered with his years. Now dropping wet, he climbs the cliff with pain. The crowd that saw him fall and float again shout from the distant shore and loudly laughed to see his heaving breast disgorge the briny drought. The following centaur and the dolphins grew, their vanished hopes of victory renew. When Gius lags, they kindle in the race. To reach the mark, Sergethus takes the place. Menethus pursues, and while around they wind, comes up not half his galley's length behind. Then on the deck, amidst his mates appeared, and thus their dropping courage he cheered. My friends and Hector's followers heretofore, exert your vigor, tug the laboring oar, stretch to your strokes, my still unconquered crew, whom from the flaming walls of Troy I drew. In this, our common interest, let me find that strength of hand, that courage of the mind. As when you stemmed the strong Malian flood, and o'er Syrtis broken billows rode, I seek not now the foremost palm to gain. Though yet, but ah, the haughty wish is vain. Let those who enjoy it whom the gods ordain, but to be last the lags of all the race. Redeem yourselves and me from that disgrace. Now, one and all, they tug amain. They row at full stretch and shake the brazen prow. The sea beneath them sinks, their laboring sides are swelled, and sweat runs guttering down in tides. Chance aids their daring with unhoped success. Sergethus, eager with his beak to press, betwixt the rival galley and the rock, shuts up the unwieldy centaur in the lock. The vessel struck, and with the dreadful shock, her oars she shivered, and her head she broke. The trembling rowers from their banks arise, and anxious from themselves renounce the prize. With iron poles they heave her off the shores, and gather from the sea their floating oars. The crew of Menethsis, with elated minds, urge their success and call the willing winds, then ply their oars and cut their liquid way in larger compass on the roomy sea. As when the dove her rocky hold forsakes, rused in a fright, her sounding wings she shakes, the cavern rings with clattering, out she flies and leaves her callow care and cleaves the skies. At first she flutters, but at length she springs to smoother flight and shoots up her wings. So Minuthis in the dolphin cuts the sea and flying with a force, that force assists his way. Sergethsis in the centaur, soon he passed, wedged in the rocky shoals and sticking fast. In vain the victor, he with cries implores and practices to row with shattered oars. Then Menethsis bears with Gius and outflies. The ship without a pilot yields the prize. Unvanquished, Scylla now alone remains, her he pursues, and all his vigor strains. Shouts the favoring multitude arise. Applauding echo to the shouts replies. Shouts, wishes, and applause rung rattling through the skies. These clamors with disdain the Scylla heard. Much grudged the praise, but more robbed reward. Resolved to hold their own, they mend their pace. All obstinate to die or gain the race. Raised with success, the dolphin swiftly ran, for they can conquer who believe they can. Both urge their oars and fortune both supplies, and both perhaps had shared an equal prize. When to the seas Cloanthus holds his hands, and succor from the watery powers demands, Gods of the liquid realms on which I row, if given by you, the laurel bind my brow, assist to make me guilty of my vow. A snow-white bull shall on your shore be slain, his offered entrails cast into the main, 
and ruddy wine from golden goblets thrown, your grateful gift and my return shall own. The choir of nymphs and Forcus from below, with virgin panopy, heard his vow, and old Portinus, with his breath of hand, pushed on and sped the galley to the land. Swift as a shaft, or winged wing she flies, and darting to the port, obtains the prize. The herald summons all, and then proclaims, Cloanthus, conqueror of the naval games. The prince with laurel crowns the victor's head, and three fat steers are to his vessel led. The ship's reward with generous wine beside, and sums of silver which the crew divide. The leaders are distinguished from the rest, the victor honor with a nobler vest, where gold and purple strive in equal rows, and needlework its happy cost bestows. There Ganymede is wrought with living art, chasing through Ida's groves the trembling heart. Breathless he seems, yet eager to pursue, when from aloft descends an open view. The bird of Jove, and sozing on his prey, with crooked talons bears the boy away. In vain, with lifted hands and gazing eyes, his guards below him soaring through the skies, and dogs pursue his flight with imitated cries. Menethsis, the second victor, was declared, and summoned there the second prize he shared, a coat of mail which brave Demolius bore, more brave Aeneas from his shoulders tore, in single combat on the Trojan shore. This was ordained for Menethius to possess, in war for his defense, for ornament and peace. Rich was the gift, and glorious to behold. But yet so pondereth with its plates of gold, that scarce two servants could the weight sustain, yet loaded thus, Demolius o'er the plain, pursued and lightly seized the Trojan train. The third, succeeding to the last reward, two goodly bowls of massy silver shard, with figures prominent and richly wrought, and two brass cauldrons from Dodona brought. Thus all, rewarded by the heroes' hands, their conquering temples bound with purple bands, and now Sergethsis, clearing from the rock, brought back his galley shattered with the shock. Forlorn she looked, without an aiding oar, and houted by the vulgar made to shore. As when a snake surprised upon the road is crushed athwart her body by the load of heavy wheels, or with a mortal wound, her belly bruised and trotted to the ground. In vain, with loosened curls, she crawls along, yet fierce above, she brandishes her tongue, glares with her eyes, and bristles with her scales, but groveling in the dust, her parts and sound she trails. So slowly to the port the centaur tends, but what she wants in oars with sails amends. Yet for his galley saved the grateful prince is pleased the unhappy chief to recompense. Foley, the Cretan slave, rewards his care, a beauteous herself with lovely twins affair. From thence his way the Trojan hero bent into the neighboring plain with mountains pent whose sides were shaded with surrounding wood. Full in the midst of this fair valley stood a native theater, which rising slow by just degrees o'erlooked the ground below. High on sylvan throne the leader sate, a numerous train attend in solemn state. Here those that in the rapid course delight, desire of honor and the prize invite. The rival runners Without order stand, the Trojans mixed with the Sicilian band. First Nisus, with Euralus, appears, Euralus a boy of blooming years. With sprightly gaze and equal beauty crowned, Nisus, for friendship to the youth, renowned. Diorus next, of Priam's royal race. Then Salius joined with Patron, took their place. But Patron in Arcadia had his birth, and Salius from Arcanian earth. Then two Sicilian loose, the names of these, Swift Helmus 
and lovely panopies, both jolly huntsmen, both in forest bred, and owning old Acestus for their head, with several others ignobler name, whom time has not delivered or to fame. To these the hero thus his thoughts explained, in words which general approbation gain. One common largest is for all designed, the vanquished and the victor shall be joined. Two darts of polished steel and Gnossian wood, a silver-studded axe alike bestowed. The foremost three have olive wreaths decreed. The first of these obtains a stately steed, adorned with trappings, and the next in fame, the quiver of the Amazonian dame. With feathered Thracian arrows well supplied, a golden belt shall gird his manly side, which with a sparkling diamond shall be tied. The third, this Grecian helmet, shall content. He said to their appointed base they went, with beating hearts the expected sign receive, and starting all at once the barrier leave, spread out as on the winged winds they flew and seized the distant goal with a greedy view. Shot from the crowd, swift Nissus all or past, nor storms nor thunder, equal half his haste. The next, but though the next yet far disjoined, came Salius and Euralus behind, then Helmus, whom young Diorus plied, step after step, and almost side by side, his shoulders pressing, and, in a longer space, had won, or left at least a dubious race. Now spent, the goal they almost reach at last, when eager Nissus, hapless in haste, slipped first, and slipping fell upon the plain, soaked with the blood of oxen newly slain. The careless victor had not marked his way, but treading where the treacherous puddle lay, his heels flew up, and on the grassy floor he fell, besmeared with filth and holy gore. Not mindless, then, Euralus of thee, nor of the sacred bonds of amity, he strove the immediate rival's hope to cross, and caught the foot of Salius he rose. So Salius lay extended on the plain, Euralus springs out the prize to gain, and leaves the crowd applauding peals as attend, the victor to the goal, who vanquished by his friend. Next, Helamus, and then Diorus came, by two misfortunes made the third in fame. But Salius enters, and exclaiming loud, for justice deafens and disturbs the crowd, urges his cause may be in court heard, and pleads the prize as wrongfully conferred. But favor for Euralus appears, his blooming beauty with his tender tears, had bribed the judges for the promised prize. Besides, Diorus fills the court with cries, who vainly reaches at last reward. If the first palm of Salius be conferred, then thus the prince, let no disputes arise where fortune placed it. I award the prize, but fortune's errors give me leave to mend, at least to pity my deserving friend. He said, and from among the spoils he draws, Ponderous with shaggy mane and golden paws, A lion's hide to Salius he gives. Nissus with envy sees the gift and grieves. If such rewards to vanquished men are due, he said, And falling is to rise by you. What prize may Nissus from your bounty claim, Who merited the first rewards and fame? In falling, both an equal fortune tried, would fortune for my fall so well provide? With this he pointed to his face, and showed his hand and all his habits smeared with blood. The indulgent father of the people smiled, and caused to be produced an ample shield of wondrous art by Didymon wrought. Long since Neptune's bars in triumph brought, this given to Nissus, he divides the rest an equal justice in his gifts expressed. The race thus ended, and rewards bestowed, once more the prince bespeaks the attentive crowd, 
If there be here whose dauntless courage dare, in gauntlet fight with limbs and body bare, his opposite sustain in open view, stand forth the champion, the games renew. Two prizes I propose, and thus divide, a bull with gilded horns and fillets tied, shall be the portion of the conquering chief, and a sword and a helm shall cheer the loser's grief. Then haughty dares in the lists appears, stalking he tries, his head erected bears, his nervous arms, the weighty gauntlet wield, and loud applauses echo through the field, dares alone in combat us to stand, the match of mighty Paris hand to hand, the same at Hector's funerals undertook, gigantic buttes of thy Amician stock, and by the stroke of his resistless hand stretched the vast bulk upon the yellow sand. Such dares was, and such he strode along. And drew the wonder of the gazing throng, his brawny back and ample breast he shows, his lifted arms around his head he throws, and deals in whistling air his empty blows, his matches sought, but through trembling band no one dares answer to the proud demand. Presuming of this force, it with sparkling eyes, already he devours the promised prize. He claims the bull with lawless insolence, and having seized his horns, accosts the prince. If none my match's valor dares oppose, how long shall dares wait his dastard foes? Permit me, chief, permit me without delay, to lead this uncontented gift away. The crowd assents, and with redoubled cries, for the proud challenger demands the prize. Acestus, furred with just disdain, to see the palm usurped without a victory, reproached Entellus thus, who sate beside, and heard and saw unmoved the Trojan's pride. Once, but in vain, a champion of renown, so tamely can you bear the ravished crown, a prize in triumph born before your sight, and shun for fear the danger of the fight. Where is our Eryx now, the boasted name, the god who taught your thundering arm the game? Where now your baffled honor, where the spoil that filled your house, and fame that filled our isle? And tell us thus, my soul is still the same, unmoved with fear and moved with marital fame. But my chill blood is curdled in my veins, and scarce the shadow of a man remains. Oh, could I to that fair prime again, that prime of which the boaster is so vain, the brave, who his decrepit age defies, should feel my force without the promised prize he said, and rising at the word, he threw two ponderous gauntlets down in open view, gauntlets which Eric's wont in fight to wield, and sheathed his hands with enlisted field. The fear and wonder seized, the crowd beholds, the gloves of death with seven distinguished folds, of tough bull hides, the spathe within is spread, with iron or with loads of heavy lead. Dares himself was daunted at the sight, renounced his challenge and refused to fight. Astonished at their weight, the hero stands and poised the ponderous engines in his hands. What had you wonder, said Entellus, been had you the gauntlets of Alcides seen, or viewed the stern debate on this unhappy green? These which I bear your brother Eryx bore, still marked with battered brains and mingled gore. With these he long sustained the Herculean arm, and these I wielded with my blood was warm. And languished frame, while better spirits fed, ere age unstrung my nerves, or time or snowed my head. But if the challenger these arms refuse, and cannot wield their weight, or dare not use, if great Aeneas and Acestus join, in his request these gauntlets I resign. Let us with equal arms perform the fight, and let him leave to fear, since I resign my right.
This said Entelus for the strife prepares, stripped of his quilted coat, his body bears. Composed of mighty bones and brawn he stands, a goodly towering object on the sands. Then just Aeneas equal arms supplied, which rounded their shoulders to their wrists they tied. Both on tiptoe stand, at full extent, their arms aloft, their bodies inly bent, their heads from aiming blows they bear afar, with clashing gauntlets they provoke the war. One of his youth and pliant limbs relies, one of his sinews and his giant size, the last is stiff with age, his motion slow. He heaves for breath, he staggers to and fro. The clouds of issuing smoke his nostrils loudly blow. Yet equal in success they ward, they strike. Their ways are different, but their art alike. Before, behind, the blows are dealt, around their hollow sides the rattling thumps resound. A storm of strokes, well meant, with fury flies, and errors about their temples, ears, and eyes. Nor always errs, for oft the gauntlet draws a sweeping stroke along the crackling jaws. Heavy with age, Entilus stands his ground, but with his warping body wards the wound. His hand and watchful eye keep an even pace, while dares, traverses, and shifts his place. And like a captain who beleaguers round some strong-built castle on rising ground, views all the approaches with observing eyes, this and that, other part in vain he tries, and more on industry than force relies. With hands on high, Entelus threats his foe, but dares watch the motion from below, and slipped aside and shunned the long-descending blow. Entelus wastes his forces on the wind, and thus deluded of stroke designed. Headlong and heavy fell his ample breast, and weighty limbs his ancient mother pressed. So falls a hollow pine that long had stood on Ida's height, or Erasmus' wood, torn from the roots. Their differing nations rise, and shouts and mingled murmurs rend the skies. Acestus runs with eager haste to raise the fallen companion of his youthful days. Dauntless he rose, and to the fight returned, with shame his glowing cheeks, his eyes with fury burned. Disdain and conscious virtue furred his breast, and with redoubled force his foe he pressed. He lays on load with either hand a main, and headlong drives the Trojan o'er the plain nor stops, nor stays, nor rests, nor breath allows, but storm of strokes descended about his brows, a rattling tempest and a hail of blows. But now the prince, who saw the wild increased of wounds, commands the combatants to cease, and bounds Antilles's wrath and bids the peace. First to the Trojan spent with toil he came, and soothed his sorrow for the suffered shame. What fury seized my friend? The gods, said he, to him, and averse to thee, had given his arm superior force to thine. Tis madness to contend with strength divine. The gauntlet fight thus ended. From the shore, his faithful friends unhappy dares bore. His mouth and nostrils poured a purple flood, and pounded teeth came rushing with his blood. Faintly he staggered through his hissing throng, and hung his head, and trailed his legs along. The sword and cask carried by his train, but with his foe the palm and ox remain. The champion then, before Aeneas came, proud of his prize, but prouder of his fame. O goddess born in you, Dardinian host, mark with attention and forgive my boast. Learn what was I, by what remains, and know from what impending fate you saved my foe. Sternly he spoke, then confronts the bull, and on his ample forehead aiming full, the deadly stroke descending pierced to the skull. Down drops the beast, nor needs a second wound, but sprawls in pangs of death and spurns the ground. Then thus, in dare's stead I offer this, 
Eric's accept a nobler sacrifice. Take the last gift my withered arms can yield. Thy gauntlets I resigned, and here renounce the field. This done, Aeneas orders for the close. The strife of archers with contending bows. The mast of Sergithus, shattered galley bore. With his own hands he raises on the shore. A fluttering dove upon the top they tie. The living mark at which their arrows fly. The rival archers line in advance, their turn of shooting to receive from chance. A helmet holds their names, the lots are drawn. On the first scroll was read, Hippocoon, the people shout. Upon the next was found, young Minutius, late with naval honors crown. The third contained Eurytion's noble name, thy brother, Pandarus, and next in fame, whom Paulus urged the treaty to confound and send among the Greeks a feathered wound. A Cestus in the bottom last remained, whom not his age from youthful sports restrained. Soon all with vigor bend their trusty bows, and from the quiver each his arrow chose. Hippocoon's was first with forceful sway. It flew, and whizzing cut the liquid way, Fixed in the mast the feathered weapon stands, the fearful pigeon flutters in their bands. And the tree trembled, and the shouting cries of the pleased people rend the vaulted skies. Then Minutius to the head of his arrow drove with lifted eye and took his aim above, but made a glancing shot and missed the dove, yet missed so narrow that he cut the cord which fastened by the foot the flitting bird. The captive thus released, away she flies, and beats with clapping wings the yielding skies. His bow, already bent, Eurytion stood, and having first invoked his brother God, his winged shaft with eager haste he sped. The fatal message reached her as she fled. She leaves her life aloft, she strikes the ground, and renders back the weapon in the wound. A cestus, grudging at his lot, remains, without a prize to gratify his pains. Yet shooting upward, he sends his shaft to show an archer's art and boast his twanging bow. The feathered arrow gave a dire portent, and later augurs judge from this event. Shaft by the speed, it furred, and as it flew, a trail of following flames ascending drew, kindling thy mount, and mark the shiny way across the skies as falling meteors play, and vanish to the wind or in a blaze decay, the Trojans and Sicilians widely stare, and trembling turn their wonder into prayer. The Dardan prince put on a smiling face and strained a cestus with close embrace, then, honoring him with gifts above the rest, turned the bad omen, nor his fears confessed. The gods, he said, the miracle have wrought, and ordered you the prize without the lot. Except this gauntless, rough with figured gold, the Thracian Cessius gave my sire of old this pledge of ancient amity receive, which to my second sire I justly give. He said, and with trumpet's cheerful sound, proclaimed him victor, and with laurel crowned, nor good Eurytion envied him the prize, though he transfixed the pigeon in the skies, who cut the line with second gifts was graced, the third was his who arrowed pierced the mast. The chief, before the games were wholly done, called Periphantus tutor up to his son, and whispered thus, With speed a canny is fined, and if his childish troop be ready joined, on horseback, let him grace his grandsire's day, and lead his equals armed in just array. He said, and calling out the cirque he clears, the crowd withdrawn, an open plain appears. And now the noble use of form divine advance their fathers in a line. The riders grace the steeds, the steeds with glory shine. Thus, marching on in military pride, shouts of applause resound from side to side. Their casks adorned with laurel wreaths they wear, each brandishing aloft a cornel's spear. Some at their backs their gilded quivels bore. 
Their chains of burnished gold hung down before. Three graceful troops they formed upon the green. Three graceful leaders at their head were seen. Twelve followed every chief and left a space between. The first young Priam led, a lovely boy, whose grandsire was the unhappy king of Troy. His race in after times was known to fame. New honors, the Latian name, and well the royal boy his Thracian steed became. White were the fetlocks of his feet before, and on his front a snowy star he bore. The beauteous Attis, with Aelius bred, of equal age the second squadron led. The last in order, but the first in place, first in lovely features of his face, rode fair Acanius on a fiery steed, Queen Dido's gift, the Tyrian breed, sure coursers for the rest the kings ordain, with golden bits adorned and purple reins. The pleased spectators peals of shouts renew, and all the parents in the children view, their make, their motions, and their sprightly grace, and hopes and fears alternate in their face. The unfledged commanders in their martial train first make the circuit of the sandy plain. Around their sires, and at the appointed sign, drawn up in beauteous order, form a line. The second signal sounds, the troop divides, in three distinguished parts, with three distinguished guides. Again they close, and once again disjoin, in troop to troop opposed, and line to line. They meet, they wheel, they throw their darts afar with harmless rage and well-dissembled war. Then in a round of mingled bodies run, flying they follow and pursuing shun. Broken they break and rallying, they renew in other forms the military shoe. At last in order, undiscerned they join and march together in a friendly line. And as the Cretan labyrinth of old, with wandering ways and many winding fold, involved the weary feet without redress, in a round error which denied recess. So fought the Trojan boys in warlike play, turned and returned, and still a different way. Thus dolphins in the deep each other chase, in circles when they sim around the watery race. This game, these carousels, Acanius taught, and building Alba to the Latins brought, shewed what he learned the Latin sires impart, to their succeeding sons the graceful art. From these imperial Rome received the game, which Troy the use the Trojan troop they name. Thus far the sacred sports they celebrate, but fortune soon resumed her ancient hate. For while they pay the dead annual dues, those envied rites Saturnian Juno views, and sends the goddess of the various bow to try new methods of revenge below, supplies the winds to wing her airy way, where in the port secure the navy lay, Swiftly fair Iris down her arch descends, and undiscerned her fatal voyage ends. She saw the gathering crowd and gliding thence, the desert shore, and fleeting without defense. The Trojan matrons on the sand alone, with sighs and tears, a kinsis death bemoan. Then turning to the sea their weeping eyes, their pity to themselves renew their cries. Alas, said one, what oceans yet remain for us to sail? What labors to sustain? All take the word, and, with a general groan, implore the gods for peace and places of their own. The goddesses, great in mischief, view their pains, and in a woman's form her heavenly limbs restrains. In face and shape old Barrow she became, Dorcas's wife a venerable dame, once blessed with riches and a mother's name. Thus changed amidst the crying crowd she ran, mixed with the matrons, and these words began. O oh, wretched we, whom not the Grecian power, nor flames destroyed in Troy's unhappy hour. O oh, wretched we, reserved by cruel fate, beyond the ruins of the sinking state. Now seven resolving years are wholly run, since this improsperous voyage we begun. 
Since tossed from the shore to shore, from lands to lands, inhospitable rocks and barren sands, wandering in exile through the stormy sea, we search in vain for flying Italy, now cast by fortune of this kindred land, what should our rest and rising walls withstand, or hinder here to fix our banished band? O country lost and gods redeemed in vain, if still in endless exile we remain. Shall we no more the Trojan walls renew, our streams of some dissembled Samoy's view? Haste, join with me, the unhappy fleet consume. Cassandra bids and I declare her doom. In sleep I saw her, she supplied my hands. For this I more than dreamt with flaming brands. With these, said she, these wandering ships destroy. These are your fatal seats, and these your Troy. Time calls you now the precious hour employ. Slack not the good presage with heaven inspires our minds to dare, and gives the ready fires. See, Neptune's altars minister their brands. The god is pleased, the god supplies our hands. Then from the pile a flaming fire she drew, and tossed in air amidst the galleys threw. Wrapped in amaze, the matron's wild stare, then Prigo, reverence for her hoary hair, Prigo, the nurse of Priam's numerous race, no borough this, though she belies her face, what terrors from her frowning front arise, behold a goddess in her ardent eyes, what rays around her heavenly face are seen, mark her majestic voice and more than mortal mine, Barreau, but now I left, whom pinned with pain, her age and anguish from these rites detain. She said, the matron seized with new amaze, rule their malignant eyes, and on the navy gaze. They fear and hope, and neither part obey. They hope the fated land, but fear the fatal way. The goddess, having done her task below, mounts up on equal wings and bends her painted bow, struck with sight and seized with rage divine. The matrons prosecute their mad design. They shriek aloud, they snatch with impious hands the food of altars, fires, and blaming brands. Green boughs and saplings mingled in their haste and smoking torches on the ships they cast. The flame unstopped at first, more fury gains, and Vulcan rides at large with loose reins. Triumphant to the painted sterns he soars, and seizes his ways, the banks and crackling oars. Eumelus was the first, the news to bear, while yet the crowd, the rural theater. Then what they hear, it witnessed by their eyes. A storm of sparkles and flames arise. Ascanius took the alarm, while yet he led his early warriors on his prancing steed, and on spurring his equals soon or past. Nor could his frightened friends reclaim his haste. Soon as the royal youth appeared in view, he sent his voice before him as he flew. What madness moves you, matrons, to destroy? the last remainders of unhappy Troy. Not hostile fleets, but your own hopes you burn, and on your friends your fatal fury turn. Behold your own Ascanius. While he said, he drew his glittering helmet from his head, in which the use to sportful arms he led. By this, Aeneas and his train appear, and now the women, seized with shame and fear, Dispersed to woods and caverns take their flight, Abhor their actions and avoid the light. Their friends acknowledge and their error find And shake the goddess from their altered mind. Not so the raging fires their fury cease, But lurking in the seams with seeming peace, Work on their way amid the smolding tow, Sure in destruction but in motion slow. The silent plague throw green timber eats, and vomits out tardy flame by fits. Down to the keels and upward to the sails, the fire descends or mounts, but still prevails. Nor buckets poured, nor strength of human hand can the victorious element withstand. 
the pious hero rends his robe and throws to heaven his hands, and with his hands he vows. O oh, Jove, he cried, if prayers can yet have place, if thou abhorrest not all the Dardan race, if any spark of pity still remain, if gods are gods and not invoked in vain, yet spare the relics of the Trojan train, yet from the flames our burning vessels free, or let thy fury alone on me. At this devoted head thy thunder throw, and send the willing sacrifice below. Scarce had he said, when southern storms arise, from pole to pole the forky lightning flies. Loud rattling shakes the mountains in the plain, heaven bellies downward and descends in rain, whole sheets of water from the clouds are sent, which hissing throw the planks and flames prevent, and stop the fiery pest. Four ships alone, burnt to the waist, and for the feet alone. But doubtful thoughts the hero's heart divide, if he should still in Sicily reside, forgetful of his fate, or tempt the main, in hope the promised Italy to gain. Then knots old and wise, to whom alone the will of heaven by Pallas was foreshown, versed in portents experienced and inspired, to tell events and what the fates required. Thus, while he stood, to neither part inclined, with cheerful words relived his laboring mind. O goddess born, resigned in every state, with patience bear, with prudence push your fate, by suffering well our fortune we subdue, fly when she frowns, and when she calls pursue. Your friend Acestus is of Trojan kind, to him disclose the secrets of your mind. Trust in his hands your old and useless train, too numerous for the ships, which yet remain, the feeble, old, indulgent of their ease, the dames who dread the dangers of the seas, with all the dastard crew who dare not stand the shock of battle with your foes by land. Here you may build a common town for all, and, from Acestus's name, Acesta call. The reasons with his friend's experience joined, encouraged much, but more disturbed his mind. I was dead of night, when to the slumbering eyes his father's shade descended from the skies, and thus he spoke more than vital breath, loved while I lived, and dear even after death. O son, in various toils and troubles tossed, the king of heaven employs my careful ghost. On his commands, the gods who saved from fire your flaming feet, and heard your just desire. The wholesome counsel of your friend receive, and hear the coward train and women leave. The chosen youth and those who nobly dare transport to tempt the dangers of the war. The stern Italians will encourage try. Rough are their manners and their minds are high. But first, Pluto's palace you shall go and seek my shade among the blessed below. For not with impious ghosts my soul remains, nor suffers with the damned perpetual plains, but breathes the living air of soft Elysian plains. The chaste Sibylia shall your steps convey, and blood offered victims free the way. There shall you know what realms the gods assign, and learn the fates and fortunes of your line. But now, Farewell. I vanish with the night and feel the blast of heaven's approaching light. He said, and mixed with shades, and took his airy flight. Whither so fast the filial duly cried, and why, ah, why, the wished embrace denied? He said, and rose, as holy zeal inspires. He rakes hot embers and renews the fires. His country gods and Vesta then adores, with cakes and incense, and their aid implores. Next were his friends, and royal host he sent, revealed his vision and the gods' intent. With his own purpose, all without delay, the will of Jove and his desires obey. They list with women each degenerate name, who dares not hazard life for future fame. 
These they cashier, the brave remaining few. Oars, banks, and cables half-consumed renew. The prince designs a city with a plow. The lots their several tenements allow. This part is named from Ilium, that from Troy. And the new king ascends the throne with joy. A chosen senate from the people draws, appoints the judges, and adorns the law. Then, on top of Eryx, they begin a rising temple to the Paphian queen. Achilles last is honored as a god, a priest is added, annual gifts bestowed, and groves are planted round his blessed abode. Nine days pass in feasts, their temples crowned, and fumes of incense in the fanes abound. Then from south arose a gentle breeze that curled the smoothness of the glassy seas. The rising winds a ruffling gale afford and call the mercy merry mariners aboard. Now loud laments along the shores resound of parting friends in close embraces bound. The trembling women, the degenerate train, who shunned the frightful dangers of the main. Even those desire to sail and take their share of the rough passage and the promised war, whom good Aeneas cheers and recommends to their new master's care his fearful friends. On Eryx's altars, three fat calves he lays, a lamb new fallen to the stormy seas, then slips his halsers and his anchors weighs. High on the deck the godlike hero stands, with olive crowned, a charger in his hands. Then cast the reeking entrails in the brine and poured the sacrifice of purple wine. Fresh gales arise, with equal strokes they vie, and brush the buxom seas and o'er the billows fly. Meantime, the mother goddess full of fears, to Neptune thus addressed with tender tears. The pride of Jove's imperious queen, the rage, the malice which no sufferings can assuage, compel me to these prayers, since neither fate, nor time, nor pity can remove her hate. Even Jove is thwarted by his haughty wife, still vanquished, yet she still renews the strife. As if it were little to consume the town, which awed the world and worth the imperial crown. She prosecutes the ghost of Troy with pains, and gnaws even to the bones the last remains. Let her the causes of hatred tell, but you can witness its effects too well. You saw the storm she raised on Libyan floods, that mix mounting billows with the clouds. When bribing Aeolus, she shook the main and moved rebellion in your watery reign. With fury, she possessed the Dardan dames to burn their fleet with excreasable flames and forced Aeneas, when his ships were lost, to leave his folliers on foreign coast. For what remains, your godhead I implore and trust my son to your protecting power. If neither Jove's nor fate's decree withstand, secure his passage to the Latian land. Then, thus the mighty ruler of the main, What may not Venus hope from Neptune's reign? My kingdom claims your birth, my late defense. Of your endangered fleet my claim, your confidence. Nor less by land than sea my deeds declare, How much your loved Aeneas is my care. Thee, Xanthus, and thee, Simoi, I attest, your Trojan troops when proud Achilles pressed, and drove before him headlong on the plain, and dashed against the walls the trembling train. When floods were filled with bodies of the slain, when crimson Xanthus, doubtful of his way, stood up on ridges to behold the sea. New heaps came tumbling in and choked his way. When your Aeneas fought, but fought with odds of force unequal and unequal gods. I spread the cloud before the victor's sight, sustained the vanquished and secured his flight. Even then secured him when I sought with joy the vowed destruction of ungrateful Troy. My will's the same, fair goddess, fear no more. Your fleet shall safely gain the Latian shore. Their lives are given one destined head along, 
shall perish for the multitudes atone. Thus, having armed with hopes her anxious mind, his finny team Saturnian Neptune joined, then adds the foamy bridle to their jaws, and to loosened reins permit the laws. High on the waves his azure car he guides, its axles thunder and the sea subsides, and the smooth ocean rolls her silent tides, the tempests fly before their father's face, trains of inferior gods his triumph grace, and monster wails before their master play, and choirs of tritons crowd the watery way. The marshaled powers and equaled troops divide, to right and left the gods his better side, in close and on the worse the nymphs and nereids ride. Now, smiling hope, with sweet vicissitude, within the hero's mind his joy renewed. He calls to raise the masts, the sheets display, the cheerful crew with diligence obey. They scud before the wind and sail in open sea, ahead of all the master pilot steers, and, as he leads, the following navy veers, the steeds of night had traveled half the sky. The drowsy rowers on their benches lie. When the soft god of sleep, with easy flight, descends and draws behind the trail of light, thou, Polinarus, art his destined prey. To thee alone he takes his fateful away. Dire dreams to thee an iron sleep he bears, and lightning on thy prow the form of Forbus bears. And then, thus the traitor god began his tale. The winds, my friend, inspire a pleasing gale. The ships, without thy care, securely sail. Now steal an hour of sweet repose, and I will take the rudder and thy room supply. To whom the yawning pilot half asleep, me dost thou bid to trust the treacherous deep. The harlot smiles of her dissembling face, and to her faith commit the Trojan race. Shall I believe the siren south again, and oft betrayed not know the monster main? He said, his fastened hands the rudder keep, and fixed on heaven his eyes repel invading sleep. The god was wroth, and at his temples threw. A branch of leth dipped and drunk the Stygian dew. The pilot, vanquished by the power divine, soon closed his swimming eyes and lay supine. Scarce were his limbs extended at their length. The god, insulting with superior strength, fell heavy on him, plunged him in the sea, and with the stern the rudder tore away. Headlong he fell, and struggling the main, cried out for helping hands, but cried in vain. The victor demon mounts obscure in air, while the ship sails without the pilot's care. On Neptune's faith the floating fleet relies, but what the man forsook the god supplies. And o'er the dangerous deep secure the navy flies, glides by the siren's cliffs a shelfy coast, long infamous for ships and sailors lost. And white with bones, the impetuous ocean roars, and rocks rebellow from the sounding shores. The watchful hero felt the knocks and found, tossing the vessel sailed on shoaly ground. Sure of his pilot's loss, he takes himself, the helm, and steers aloof and shuns the shelf. Inly he grieved, and groaning from the breast, deplored his death, and thus his painly expressed. For faith reposed on seas, and on the flattering sky, thy naked corpse is doomed on the shores unknown to lie. My name is Lily Wilmoth, and I am a Kepler teacher for the 2020 school year. 
A couple of the courses I'll be offering are How to Write a Fairy Tale, a rhetoric writing course, and also Old Testament Survey, focusing on poetry and wisdom writings. I will be reading Book 6 from the Aeneid, The World Below, and my translation is by Robert Fitzgerald. So grieving and in tears, he gave the ship her head before the wind, drawing toward land at the Euobian settlement of Cumai. Ships came about, prows pointing seaward, anchors biting to hold them fast, and rounded sterns indented all the water's edge. The men debarked in groups, eager to go ashore upon Hesperia. Some struck seeds of fire out of the veins of flint, and some explored the virgin woods, layers of wild things for fuel, pointing out, too, what streams they found. Aeneas, in duty bound, went inland to the heights where overshadowing Apollo dwells, and nearby, in a place apart, a dark, enormous cave, the Sibyl feared by men. In her, the Delian god of prophecy inspires many uncanny powers of mind and soul, disclosing things to come. Here, Trojan captains walked to Diana of the Crossroads Wood and entered under roofs of gold. They say that Daedalus, when he fled the realm of Minos, dared to entrust himself to stroking wings and to the air of heaven, unheard of path, on which he swam away to the cold north, at length to touch down on that very height of the Chalcidians. Here, on earth again, he dedicated to you, Phobus Apollo, the twin sweeps of his wings. Here he laid out a spacious temple. In the entranceway, Androgeus's death appeared. Then Cecrops' children ordered to pay in recompense each year the living flesh of seven sons. The urn from which the lots were drawn stood modeled there. And facing it upon the opposite door, the land of Crete, emergent from the sea, here the brutish act appeared, Pasiphae being covered by the bull and the cow's place, then her mixed breed, her child of double form, the minotaur, get of unholy lust. Here, too, that puzzle of the house of Minos, the maze none could untangle, until touched by a great love shown by a royal girl, he, Daedalus himself, unraveled all the baffling turns and dead ends in the dark, guiding the blind way back by a skein unwound. In that high sculpture you, too, would have had your great part, Icarus, had grief allowed. Twice your father had tried to shape your fall in gold, but twice his hands dropped. Here the Trojans would have passed on and gazed and read it all, had not Achates, whom they had sent ahead, returned now with the priestess of Apollo and of Diana, goddess of the crossroads, Dephobe, the Sibyl, Glaucus's daughter. Thus she addressed the king. The hour demands no lagging over sites like these. Instead, you should make offering of seven young bulls from an ungelded herd and seven again well-chosen ewes. With these words for Aeneas, orders his men were quick to act upon. The priestess called them her, to her lofty shrine. The cliff's huge flank is honeycombed, cut out in a cavern, perforated a hundred times, having a hundred mouths with rushing voices carrying the responses of the sibyl. Here, as the men approached the entranceway, the sibyl cried out, Now is the time to ask your destinies. And then, the god, look there, the god. And as she spoke, neither her face nor hue went untransformed, nor did her hair stay neatly bound. Her breast heaved, her wild heart grew large with passion, taller to their eyes and sounding now no longer like a mortal since she had felt the god's power breathing near. She cried, Slow are you in your vows and prayers. Trojan Aeneas, are you slow? Be quick, the great mouths of the gods' house, thunderstruck, will never open till you pray. Her lips closed tight on this. A chill ran through the bones of the tough Teucrians, but their king poured out entreaties from his deepest heart. O oh, Phobus, God who took pity on the pain of Troy, who guided Paris's hands, his dart and shaft, against the body of Aesides. As you led on, I entered all those seas, washing great lands, and then the distant tribe of the Massilians at the Surtes edge. Now we take hold at last of Italy that slipped away so long. Grant that the fortune of Troy shall have pursued us this far only. 
and all you gods and goddesses as well who took offense at Ilium and our pride, at last and rightly you may spare Pergamum's children. Most holy prophetess, for knowing things to come, I ask no kingdom other than that fate allows me. Let our people make their settlement in Latium with all Troy's wandering gods and shaken powers. Then I shall dedicate a temple here to Phobos and Diana of the Crossroads, ordering festal days in Phobos' name. A holy place awaits you in my kingdom, where I shall store your prophecies, your dark revelations to my people, and appoint a chosen priesthood for you, gracious one. But now commit no verses to the leaves, or they may be confused, shuffled and whirled by playing winds. Chant them aloud, I pray. Then he fell silent. But the prophetess, whom the bestriding God had not yet broken, stormed about the cavern, trying to shake his influence from her breast, while all the more her tired, mad jaws quelled her savaged heart and and tamed her by his pressure. In the end, the cavern's hundred mouths, all of themselves unclosed to let the sibyl's answers through. You, sir, now quit at last of the sea's dangers for whom still greater are in store on land. The Darden race will reach Lavinian country, put that anxiety away, but there will wish they had not come. Wars, vicious wars I see ahead, and Tiber foaming blood. Simois, Xanthus, Dorians encamped, you'll have them all again with an Achilles, child of Latium, he too, goddess born. And nowhere from the pers- from pursuit of Teucrians will Juno stray, while you go destitute, begging so many tribes and towns for aid. The cause of suffering here again will be a bride to foreign Teucrians, a marriage made with a stranger. Never shrink from blows. Boldly, more boldly, where your luck allows, go forward, face them. A first way to safety will open where you reckon on at least from a Greek city. These were the sentences in which Sybil of Kumai from her shrine sang out her riddles, echoing in the cave, dark sayings muffling truths, the way Apollo pulled her up raging, or else whipped her on, digging the spurs beneath her breast. As soon as her fit ceased, her wild voice quieted. The great soldier, Aeneas, began to speak. No novel kinds of hardship, no surprises loom ahead, sister, I foresaw them all, went through them in my mind. One thing I pray for, since it is here, they say, one finds the gate of the king of underworld, the shadowy marsh that wells from Acheron. May I have leave to go to my dear father's side and see him? Teach me the path, show me the entrance way. Through fires and with a thousand spears behind, I brought him on these shoulders, rescued him amid our enemies. He shared my voyage, bore all the seas with me, hard nights and days of menace from the sea and sky, beyond the strength and lot of age, frail though he was. Indeed, he prayed this very prayer. He told me that I should come to you and beg it humbly. Piteous son and father, gracious lady, all this is in your power. Hecate gave you authority to have and hold a vernus wood. If Orpheus could call his wife's shade up, relying on the strings that sang loud on his Thracian lyre, if Pollux redeemed his brother taking his turn at death, so often passing back and forth, why name the heroes Theseus and Hercules? By birth, I too descend from Jove on high. While these terms he prayed and pressed the altar, breaking in, the sibyl said, Offspring of gods by blood, Trojan Anchises' son, the way downward is easy from Avernus. Black Dis's door stands open day and night. But to retrace your steps to heaven's air, there is the trouble, there is the toil. A, f- a few whom a benign Jupiter has loved, or whom fiery heroism has borne to heaven, sons of God, could do it. All midway are forests, then Cositis, thick and black, winds through the gloom. But if you feel such love and such desire to cross the Stygian water twice, to view the night of Tartarus twice, if this mad efforts to your liking, then consider what you must accomplish first. A tree's deep shade conceals a bow whose leaves and pliant twigs are all of gold, a thing sacred to Juno of the lower world. The whole grove shelters it, and thickest shade in dusky valleys shuts it, and yet 
No one may enter hidden depths below the earth unless he picks this bow, the tree's fruit, with its foliage of gold. Proserpina decreed this bow as her due should be given to her own fair hands when torn away. In place of it, a second grows up without fail, all gold as well, flowering with metallic leaves again. So lift your eyes and search, and once you find it, pull away the bow. It will come willingly, easily, if you are called by fate. If not, with all your strength you cannot conquer it, cannot lop it off with a sword's edge. A further thing is this, your friend's dead body. Ah, but you don't know. Lies out there unburied, polluting all your fleet with death, while you are lingering, waiting on my counsel here at my door. First, give the man his rest, entomb him, lead black beasts to sacrifice, begin with these amends. Then, in due course, you'll see the Stygian forest rise before you, regions not for the living. She fell silent, closing her lips. With downcast face and eyes, Aeneas turned from the cavern to the shore, dark matters on his mind. Steadfast Achates walked beside him with deliberate pace and equal anxieties. The two exchanged in shifting conversation many guesses as to that friend, now dead, now to be buried, so the prophetess had said. Then suddenly, as they came down to the dry beach, they saw Mycenaeus, robbed of life by early death, their own Mycenaeus, a son of Aeolus, never surpassed at rousing fighting men with brazen trumpet, setting Mars afire. Once he had been great Hector's adjutant, going forward at Hector's side in battle, brilliant with trumpet and with spear as well. After Achilles took the life of Hector, this gallant soldier joined Dardan Aeneas in allegiance to no lesser cause. That day, by chance, as he blew notes on a hollow shell, making the sea sing back, in his wild folly he dared the gods to rival him. Then Triton, envious, if this can be believed, caught him and put him under the surf amid the rocks offshore. All who were there clamored round the body in lament, Aeneas, the good captain, most of all. In haste then, even as they wept, they turned to carry out the orders of the Sibyl, racing to pile up logs for the altar pyre and build it sky high. Into the virgin forest, thicket of wild things, went the men. And down the pitch pines came, the bitten ilex rang with axe blows, ash and oak were split with wedges, mighty rowans were trundled down the slopes. Aeneas himself went first in all this labor, cheering his fellows on with implements like theirs in hand. But grimly in his heart he wondered, studying the unmeasured forest, and fell to prayer. If only the golden bow might shine for us in such a wilderness, as all the prophetess foretold was true. Mecenas, in your case, only too true. The words were barely uttered when two doves in casual flight out of the upper air came down before the man's eyes to alight on the green grass, and the great hero knew these birds to be his mother's. Joyously he prayed, Oh, be my guides, if there's a way, wing on into that woodland where the bow, the priceless bow, shadows the fertile ground. My divine mother, do not fail your son in a baffling time. Then he stood still to see what signs the dove might give, or where their flight might lead them. And they fed, and they flew on, each time as far as one who came behind could keep in view. Then, when they reached the gorge of sulphurous Avernus, First borne upward through the lucent air, they glided down to their desired rest, the two-hued tree, where the glitter of gold filtered between green boughs. Like mistletoe in that woods in winter thrives with yellowish berries and new leaves, a parasite on the trunk it twines around. So bright amid the dark green ilex shone the golden leafage rustling in light wind. Aeneas at once briskly took hold of it, and, though it clung, greedily broke it off, then carried it to Sibyl's cave. Meanwhile, the Teucrians on the shore wept for Mycenaeus, doing for thankless dust the final honors. First they built up a giant pyre, enriched with pitch pine and split oak, with somber bows alongside the dark cypresses in the front. On top they made a blazon of bright arms. One group set water boiling over flames, then washed the cold corpse and anointed it 
groaning aloud, and laid it out when mourned on a low couch with purple robes thrown over it, a hero shrouding. Bearers then took up as their sad duty the great buyer. With eyes averted in their father's ancient way, they held the torch below. Heaped offerings blazed up and burned, food, incense, oil, and bowls. And when the flame died and the coals fell in, they gave a bath of wine to the pyre's remnant, thirsty ash. Then picking out the bones, Corineus enclosed them in an urn. The same priest with pure water went three times around the company, aspurging them with cleansing drops from a ripe olive sprig, and spoke the final words. Faithfully then, Aeneas heaped a great tomb over the dead, placing his arms, his oar, his trumpet there beneath a promontory, named for him, Mycenaeum now and always, age to age. All this accomplished with no more ado, he carried out the orders of the Sibyl. The cavern was profound, wide-mouthed, and huge, rough underfoot, defended by dark pool and gloomy forest. Overhead, flying things could never safely take their way. Such deathly exhalations rose from the black gorge into the dome of heaven. The priestess here placed four black bullocks, wet their brows with wine, plucked bristles from between the horns, and laid them as her first offerings on the holy fire calling loud to Hecate, supreme in heaven, and Erebus. Others drew knives across beneath and caught warm blood in bowls. Aeneas, by the sword's edge, offered up to Night, the mother of Eumenides, and her great sister, Earth, a black-fleeced lamb, a sterile cow to thee, Proserpina. Then, for the Stygian king, he lit at night new altars, where he placed over the flames entire carcasses of bulls and poured rich oil on blazing viscera. Only see, just at the light's edge, just before sunrise, earth rumbled underfoot, forested ridges broke into movement, and far howls of dogs were heard across the twilight as the goddess nearer and nearer came. Away, away, the Sibyl cried, all those unblessed, away, depart from the, all the grove. But you, Aeneas, enter the path here and unsheath your sword. There's need of gall and resolution now. She flung herself wildly into the cave mouth, leading as he strode boldly at her heels. Gods who rule the ghosts, all silent shades, and chaos, and infernal fiery stream, and regions of wide night without a sound. May it be right to tell what I have heard. May it be right and fitting by your will that I describe the deep world sunk in darkness under the earth. Now, dim to one another, in desolate night, they walked on through the gloom, through Dis's homes all void and empty realms, as one goes through a wood by a faint moon's treacherous light, when Jupiter veils the sky and black night blots the colors of the world. Before the entrance in the jaws of Orcus, grief and avenging cares have made their beds, and pale diseases and sad age there are, and dread and hunger that sways men to crime, and sordid want and shapes to affright the eyes, and death and toil and death's own brother sleep, and the mind's evil joys, on the door sill, death bringing war, and iron cubicles of the humanities, and raving discord, viperish hair bound up in gory bands. In the courtyard, a shadowy giant elm spreads ancient boughs, her ancient arms where dreams, false dreams, the old tale goes, beneath each leaf cling and are numberless. There, too, about the doorway, forms of monsters crowd, centaurs, twi-formed scyllas, hundred-armed Briarius, and the Lernaean hydra hissing horribly, and the chimera breathing dangerous flames, and gorgons and harpies, huge garion, triple-bodied ghost. Here, swept by sudden fear, drawing his sword, Aeneas stood on guard with naked edge against them as they came. If his companion, knowing the truth, had not admonished him how faint these lives were, empty images hovering bodiless, he had attacked and cut his way through phantoms, empty air. The path goes on from that place to the waves of Tartarus's Acheron, thick with mud, 
A whirlpool out of a vast abyss boils up and belches all the silt it carries into Cositis. Here, the ferryman, a figure of fright, keeper of waters and streams, is Charon, foul and terrible, his beard grown wild and hoar, his staring eyes all flame, his sordid cloak hung from a shoulder knot. Alone he poles his craft and trims the sails, and in his rusty hull ferries the dead, old now, but old age in the gods is green. Here a whole crowd came streaming to the banks, mothers and men, the forms with all life spent of heroes great in valor, boys and girls unmarried, and young sons laid on the pyre before their parents' eyes, as many souls as leaves that yield their hold on the boughs and fall through the forests in the early frost of autumn, or as migrating birds from the open sea that darken heaven when the cold season comes and drives them overseas to sunlit lands. There all stood, begging to be the first across, and reached out longing hands to the far shore. But the grim boatman now took these aboard, now those waving the rest back from the strand. In wonder at this, and touched by the commotion, Aeneas said, Tell me, sister, what this means, the crowd at the stream. Where are the souls bound? How are they tested so that these turn back while those take oars to cross the dead black water? Briefly, the ancient princess answered him, Cositus is the deep pool that you see, the swamp of sticks beyond infernal power by which the gods take oath and fear to break it. All in the nearby crowd you notice here are pauper souls, the souls of the unburied, Charon's the boatman. Those the water bears are the souls of buried men. He may not take them shore to dread shore on the hoarse currents there until their bones rest in the grave, or till they flutter and roam this side a hundred years. They may have a passage then, and may return to cross the deeps they long for. Anchises' son had halted pondering on so much, and stood in pity for the soul's hard lot. Among them he saw two sad ones of unhonored death, Leucaspis and the Lycian fleet's commander, Orontes, who had sailed the windy sea from Troy together till the southern gale had swamped and whirled them down, both ship and men. Of a sudden he saw his helmsman, Palinurus, going by, but A few nights before, on a course from Libya, as he watched the stars, had been pitched overboard astern. As soon as he made sure of the disconsolate one, in all the gloom, Aeneas called, Which god took you away from us and put you under, Palinurus? Tell me. In this one prophecy, Apollo, who had never played me false, falsely foretold you'd be unharmed at sea and would arrive on the Ausonian coast. Is the promise kept? But the shade said, Phobus' cauldron told you no lie, my captain, and no god drowned me at sea. The helm that I hung on to, duty bound to keep our ship on course, by some great shock chanced to be torn away. And I went with it overboard. I swear by the rough sea I feared less for myself than for your ship. With rudder gone and steersmen knocked overboard, it might well come to grief in big seas running. Three nights, heavy weather, out of the south, on the vast water tossed me. On the fourth dawn, I sighted Italy, dimly ahead, as a wave crest lift me. By turns, I swam and rested, swam again, and got my footing on the beach. But savages attacked me as I clutched at the cliff top, weighted down by my wet clothes. Poor fools, they took me for a prize and ran me through. Surf has me now, and sea winds, washing me close inshore. By heaven's happy light and the sweet air, I beg you, by your father and by your hopes of Iulus' rising star, deliver me from this captivity, unconquered friend. Throw earth on me. You can put in to Velia port, or if there be some way to do it, if your goddess mother shows a way, and I feel sure you pass these streams and Stygian marsh by heaven's will. Give this poor soul your hand. Take me across. Let me at least in death find quiet haven." When he had made his plea, the sibyl said, From what source comes this craving, Palinurus? Would you, though still unburied, see the Styx and the grim river of the Eumenides, or even the riverbank without a summons? Abandon hope by prayer to make the gods change their decrees. Hold fast to what I say to comfort your hard lot. 
Neighboring folk in cities up and down the coast will be induced by portents to appease your bones, building a tomb and making offerings there on a cape forever named Palinurus. The sibyl's words relieved him, and the pain was for a while dispelled from his sad heart, pleased at the place name. So the two walked on down to the stream. Now, from the Stygian water, the boatman, seeing them in the silent wood and headed for the bank, cried out to them a rough, uncalled-for challenge. Who are you in armor visiting our rivers? Speak from where you are. Stop there. Say why you came. This is the region of the shades and sleep and drowsy night. It breaks eternal law for the Stygian craft to carry living bodies. Never did I rejoice, I tell you, letting Alcides cross, or Theseus and Perithous, demigods by paternity, though they were invincible in power. One forced in change, chains from the king's own seat, the watchdog of the dead, and dragged him away trembling. The other two were bent on carrying Our Lady off from Dis's chamber. This the prophetess and servant of Amphrisian Apollo briefly answered, here are no such plots, so fret no more. These weapons threat nothing. Let the great watchdog at the door howl on forever, terrifying the bloodless shades. Let chaste Proserpina remain at home in her uncle's house. The man of Troy, Aeneas, remarkable for loyalty, great in arms, goes through the deepest shades of Erebus to see his father. In the very image of so much goodness moves you not at all. Here is a bow and she showed the bow that had been hidden beneath her dress. You'll recognize it. Then his heart puffed up with rage, subsided. They had no more words. His eyes fixed on the ancient gift, the bow, the destined gift, so long unseen. Now seen, he turned his dusky craft and made for shore. There from the long thwarts where they sat, he cleared the other souls and made the gangway wide, letting the massive man step in the bilge. The leaky coracle groaned at the weight and took a flood of swampy water in. At length, on the other side, he put ashore the prophetess and hero in the mire, a formless ooze amid the gray-green sedge. Great Cerberus barking with his triple throat makes all that shoreline ring as he lies huge in a facing cave. Seeing his neck begin to come alive with snakes, the prophetess tossed him a lump of honey and a drugged meal to make him drowse. Three ravenous gullets gaped as he snapped up the sop. Then his great bulk subsided and lay down through all the cave. Now, seeing the watchdog deep in sleep, Aeneas took the opening. Swiftly, he turned away from the river, over which no soul returns. Now voices crying loud were heard at once, the souls of infants wailing. At the door of the sweet life, they were to have no pardon, torn from the breast. A black day took them off and drowned them all in bitter death. Near these were souls falsely accused, condemned to die. But not without a judge or juryman had these souls got their places. Minos reigned as the presiding judge, moving the urn, and called a jury of the silent ones to learn of lives and accusations. Next were those sad souls, benighted, who contrived their own destruction, and as they hated daylight, cast their lives away. How they would wish in the upper air now to endure the pain of poverty and toil, but iron law stands in the way, since the drear, hateful swamp has pinned them down here, and the sticks that winds nine times around and exerts imprisoning power. Not far away, spreading on every side, the fields of mourning came in view, so called since here are those whom pitiless love consumed with cruel wasting, hidden on paths apart by myrtle woodland growing overhead. Death itself, pain will not let them be. He saw here Phaedra, Procris, Eriphili, sadly showing the wounds her hard son gave, Evadne and Pasiphae, at whose side Laodamia walked, and Sanius, a young man once, a woman now, and turned again by fate into the older form. Among them, with her fatal wound still fresh, Phoenician Dido wandered in the deep wood. The Trojan captain paused nearby and knew her dim form in the dark, 
as one who sees early in the month, or thinks to have seen, the moon rising through cloud all dim, he wept and spoke tenderly to her. Dido, so forlorn, the story then that came to me was true, that you were out of life, had met your end by your own hand. Was I, was I the cause? I swear, by heaven's stars, by the high gods, by any certainty below the earth, I left your land against my will, my queen. The gods' commands drove me to do their will, as now they drive me through this world of shades, these moldy wastelands and these depths of night. And I could not believe that I would hurt you so terribly by going. Wait a little. Do not leave my sight. Am I someone to flee from? The last word destiny lets me say to you is this. Aeneas, with such pleas, tried to placate the burning soul, savagely glaring back, and tears came into his eyes. But she had turned with a gaze fixed on the ground as he spoke on, her face no more affected than if she were immobile granite or Marpesian stone. At length she flung away from him and fled, his enemy still, into the shadowy grove, where he, whose bride she had once been, Sychaeus, joined in her sorrows and returned her love. Aeneas still gazed after her in tears, shaken by her ill fate and pitying her. With effort then he took the given way, and they went on, reaching the farthest lands where men famous in war gather apart. Here Tydeus came to meet him, and then came Parthenopeus, glorious in arms, Adrastus then, a pallid shade. Here too were Dardans long bewept in the upper air, men who died in the great war, and he groaned to pick these figures out in a long file, Glaucus, Medon, Thersolicus, besides Antinor's three sons, then the priest of Ceres, Polyboetes, then Idaeus, holding still to his war car, holding his old gear. To right and left they crowd the path and stay, and will not have enough of seeing him, but love to hold him back, to walk beside him, and hear the story of why he came. Not so Agamemnon's phalanx, chiefs of the Danans. Seeing the living man in bronze that glowed through the dark air, they shrank in fear. Some turned and ran, as once when routed to the ships, while others raised a battle shout, or tried to, mouths agape, mocked by the whispering cry. Here, next he saw Dephobus, Priam's son, mutilated from head to foot, his face and both hands cruelly torn, ears shorn away, nose to the nose holes lopped by a shameful stroke. Barely knowing the shade who quailed before him, covered up his tortured face, Aeneas spoke out to him in his known voice. Dephobus, gallant officer in high Teucer's line, who chose this brutal punishment, who had so much the upper hand of you. I heard on that last night that you had fallen, spent after a slaughter of the Pelasgians, fallen on piled carnage. It was I who built on Rohitium Point at an empty tomb and sent a high call to your soul three times. Your name, your armor, marks the place. I could not find you, friend, to put your bones in earth in the old country as I came away. And Priam's son replied, you left undone nothing, my friend, but gave all ritual due, Dephobus, due a dead man's shade. My lot and the Laconian woman's ghastly doing sank me in this hell. These are the marks she left me as her memorial. You know how, between one false gladless and another, we spent that last night. No need to remind you. When the tall, deadly horse came at one bound, with troops crammed in its paunch above our towers, she made a show of choral dance and led our Phrygian women crying out on Bacchus here and there, but held a torch amid them, signaling to Danans from the height. Worn by the long day, heavily asleep, I lay in my unlucky bridal chamber, and rest, profound and sweet, most like the rest of death, weighed on me as I lay. Meanwhile, she, my distinguished wife, moved all my arms out of the house as she had slipped my sword, my faithful sword, out from beneath my pillow, opened the door and called in Menelaus, hoping no doubt by this great gift to give him, her lover, to blot old infamy out. Why hold back from telling it? The two burst into the bedroom, joined by that ringleader of atrocity, Ulysses, of the Wind King's line, 
O oh, gods, if with pure lips I pray, requite the Greeks with equal suffering. But you, now tell me, what in the world has brought you here alive? Have you come from your sea wandering, and did heaven direct you? How could harrying fortune send you to these sad, sunless homes, disordered places? At this point in their talk, Aurora, borne through the high air on her glowing rosy car, had crossed the meridian. Should they linger now with stories, they might spend the allotted time. But at Aeneas' side, the sibyl spoke, warning him briefly. Night comes on, Aeneas. We use up hours grieving. Here is the place where the road forks. On the right hand, it goes past mighty Dis's walls, Elysium Way, our way. But leftward road will punish malefactors, taking them to Tartarus. Dephobus answered her. No need for anger, reverend lady. I'll depart and make the tally in the darkness full again. Go on, sir, glorious all. Go on, enjoy a better destiny. He spoke, and even as he spoke, he turned away. Now, of a sudden, Aeneas looked and saw to the left, under a cliff, wide buildings girt by a triple wall round, under which a torrent rushed with scorching flames and boulders tossed in thunder, the abyss's fiery river. A massive gate with adamantine pillars faced the stream, so strong no force of men or gods in war may ever avail to crack and bring it down. And high in air an iron tower stands, on which Tisiphone, her bloody robe, pulls up about her, has her seat, and keeps unsleeping watch over the entranceway by day and night. From the interior groans are heard, and thud of lashes, clanking iron, dragging chains, arrested in his tracks, appalled by what he heard, Aeneas stood. What are the forms of evil here, O oh sister? Tell me, and the punishments dealt out. Why such a lamentation? Said the sibyl. Light of the Teucrians, it is decreed that no pure soul may cross the sill of evil. When, however, Hecate appointed me caretaker of Avernus Wood, she led me through heaven's punishments and taught me all. This realm is under Cretan Radamanthus's iron rule. He sentences, he listens, and makes the souls confess their crooked ways, how they put off atonements in the world with foolish satisfaction, thieves of time, until too late, until the hour of death. At once the avenger girdled with her whip, Tisiphone leaps down to lash the guilty, vile writhing snakes held out on her left hand and calls her savage sisterhood. The awaited time has come. Hell gates will shudder wide on shrieking hinges. Can you see her now, her shape as doorkeeper upon the sill? More bestial, just inside, the giant Hydra lurks with fifty black and yawning throats. Then Tartarus itself goes plunging down in darkness twice as deep as heaven is high, for eyes fixed on ethereal Olympus. Here is Earth's ancient race, the brood of titans, hurled by lightning down to roll forever in the abyss. Here, too, I saw those giant twins of Aloeus, who laid their hands upon the great heaven to rend it and to topple Jove from his high seat. And I saw, too, Salmoneus paying dearly for the jape of mimicking Jove's fire, Olympus's thunder. Shaking a bright torch from a four-horse car, he rode through Greece and his hometown in Elis, glorying, claiming honor as a god, out of his mind to feign with horses' hooves on bronze the blast and inimitable bolt. The Father Almighty, amid heavy cloud, let fly his missile, no firebrand for him, nor smoky pitch-pine light, and spun the man headlong in a huge whirlwind. One had sight of Titios, too, Child of all mothering earth, his body stretched out over nine whole acres, while an enormous vulture with hooked beak forages forever in his liver, his vitals rife with agonies. The bird lodged in the chest cavity, tears at his feast, and tissues growing again get no relief. As for the Lapiths, I need tell. Ision, Perithus, and the black crag overhead— so sure to fall, it seems already falling. Golden legs gleam on the feasters' couches. Dishes and royal luxury prepared are laid before them. 
But the oldest fury crouches near and springs out with her torch, her outcry if they try to touch the meal. Here come those who, as long as life remained, held brothers hateful, beat their parents, cheated poor men dependent on them, also those who hugged their newfound riches to themselves and put nothing aside for relatives. A great crowd, this. Then men killed for adultery, men who took arms in war against the right, not scrupling to betray their lords. All these are hemmed in here, awaiting punishment. Best not inquire what punishment, what form of suffering at their last end overwhelms them. Some heave at the great boulder, or revolve, spread-eagled hung on wheel spokes. Theseus cleaves to his chair and cleaves to it forever. Phlegias in his misery teaches all souls his lesson, thundering out amid the gloom. Be warned and study justice, not to scorn the immortal gods. Here's one who sold his country, foisted a tyrant on her, set up laws, or nullified them for a price. Another entered his daughter's room to take a bride forbidden to him. All these dared monstrous wrong and took what they dared for. If I had a hundred tongues, a hundred mouths, a voice of iron, I could not tell of all the shapes their crimes had taken or their punishments. All this he heard from her who for long years had served Apollo. Then she said, come now, be on your way and carry out your mission. Let us go faster. I can see the walls of the Cyclops' forges build ahead, facing us. The portico and the gate where they command us to leave the gifts required. On this, the two in haste strode on abreast down the dark paths over the space between and neared the doors. Aeneas gained the entrance, halted there, asperged his body with fresh water drops, and on the sill before him fixed the bow. Now that at last this ritual was performed, his duty to the goddess done, they came to places of delight, to green parkland, where souls take ease amid the blessed groves. Wider expanses of high air endow each vista with a wealth of light. Souls here possess their own familiar sun and stars. Some train on grassy rings, others compete in field games, others grapple on the sand. Feet moving to a rhythmic beat, the dancers group in a choral pattern as they sing. Orpheus, the priest of Thrace, in his long robe, accompanies, plucking his seven notes, now with his fingers, now with his ivory quill. Here is the ancient dynasty of Teucer, heroes high of heart, beautiful scions, born in greater days. Ilus, Asaracus, and Dardanus, who founded Troy. Aeneas marvels to see their chariots and gear far off, all phantom, lances fixed in earth, and teams unyoked at graze on the wide plain. All joy they took, alive in cars and weapons, as in the care and pasturing of horses, remained with them when they were laid in earth. He saw how vividly, along the grass to right and left, others who feasted there and chorused out a hymn praising Apollo, with a fragrant laurel grove, where Poe sprang up and took his course to the world above, the broad stream flowing on amid the forest. This was the company of those who suffered wounds in battle for their country, those who in their lives were holy men and chaste, or worthy of Phobos and prophetic song, or those who bettered life by finding out new truths and skills, or those who to some folk by benefactions made themselves remembered. They all wore snowy chaplets on their brows. To these souls, mingling on all sides, the Sibyl spoke now, and especially to Musaeus, the central figure, towards whose towering shoulders all the crowd gazed. Tell us, happy souls, and you, great seer, what region holds Anchises? Where is his resting place? For him we came by ferry across the river of Erebus, and the great soul answered briefly. None of us has one fixed home. We walk in shady groves and bed on river, river banks and occupy green meadows fresh with streams. But if your hearts are set on it, first cross this ridge, and soon I shall point out an easy path. So saying, he walked ahead and showed them from the height the sweep of the shining plain. Then down they went and left the hilltops. 
Now, Aeneas' father, Anchises, deep in the lush green of a valley, had given all his mind to a survey of souls, till then confined there, who were bound for daylight in the upper world. By chance his own were those he scanned now, all his own descendants, with their futures and their fates, their characters and acts. But when he saw Aeneas advancing toward him on the grass, he stretched out both his hands in eagerness, as tears wetted his cheeks, he said in welcome, Have you at last come? Has that loyalty your father counted on conquered the journey? Am I to see your face, my son, and hear our voices in communion as before? I thought so, surely, counting the months I thought the time would come. My longing has not tricked me. I greet you now. How many lands behind you? How many seas? What blows and dangers, son? How much I feared the land of Libya might do you harm. Aeneas said, your ghost, your sad ghost, father, often before my mind, impelled me to the threshold of this place. My ships ride anchored in the Tuscan Sea. But let me have your hand. Let me embrace you. Do not draw back. At this his tears brimmed over and down his cheeks, and there he tried three times to throw his arms around his father's neck. Three times the shade, untouched, slipped through his hands, weightless as wind and fugitive as dream. Aeneas now saw at the valley's end a grove standing apart, with stems and bows of woodland rustling, and the stream of Leith russet running past those peaceful glades. Around it, souls of a thousand nations filled the air, as bees in meadows at the height of summer hover and home on flowers and thickly swarm on snow-white lilies, and the countryside is loud with humming. At the sudden vision shivering at a loss, Aeneas asked what river flowed there, and what men were those in such a throng along the riverside. His father Anchises told him, Souls for whom a second body is in store. Their drink is the water of Leith, and it frees from care and long forgetfulness. For all this time I have so much desired to show you these and tell you of them face to face, to take the roster of my children's children here, so you may feel with me more happiness at finding Italy. Must we imagine, father, there are souls that go from here aloft to upper heaven and once more return to bodies dead weight? The poor souls, how can they crave our daylight so? My son, I'll tell you not to leave you mystified. Anchises says, and took each point in order. First, then, the sky and lands and sheets of water, the bright moon's globe, the titan sun and stars, are fed within by spirit, and a mind infused through all the members of the world makes one great living body of the mass. From spirit comes the race of man and beast, the life of birds, odd creatures the deep sea contains beneath her sparkling surfaces. And fiery energy from a heavenly source belongs to the generative seeds of these. So far as they are not poisoned or clogged by mortal bodies, their free essence dimmed by earthiness and deathliness of flesh. This makes them fear and crave, rejoice and grieve. Imprisoned in the darkness of the body, they cannot clearly see heaven's air. In fact, even when life departs on the last day, not all the scourges of the body pass from the poor souls, not all distress of life. Inevitably, many malformations, growing together in mysterious ways, become inveterate. Therefore, they undergo the discipline of punishments and pay in penance for old sins. Some hang full length to the empty winds. For some, the stain of wrong is washed by floods or burned away by fire. We suffer each his own shade. We are sent through wide Elysium, where a few abide in happy lands, till the long day, the round of time fulfilled, has worn our stains away, leaving the soul's heaven-sent perception clear, the fire from heaven pure. These other souls, when they have turned time's wheel a thousand years, the god calls in a crowd to Leith stream, that there, unmemoried, they may see again the heavens, and wish re-entry into bodies. Anchises paused. He drew both Sun and Sibyl into the middle of the murmuring throng, then picked out a green mound from which to view the souls as they came forward, one by one, and to take note of faces. Come, he said, what glories follow Darden generations in after years, and from Italian blood what famous children in your line will come, 
souls of the future, living in our name, I shall tell clearly now, and in the telling teach you your destiny. That one you see, the young man leaning on a spear, unarmed, has his allotted place nearest the light. He will be first to take the upper air. Silvius, a child with half Italian blood and an Alban name, your last born, whom your wife Lavinia, late in your great age, will rear in forests to be king and father of kings. Through him our race will rule in Alba Longa. Next him is Procus, pride of the Trojan line, and Capis too, then Numitor. Then one whose name restores you, Silvius Aeneas, both in arms and piety your peer, if ever he shall come to reign in Alba. What men they are, and see their rugged forms with low oak-leaf crowns shadowing their brows. I tell you, these are two found nomentum, Gabi, Fidenae town, Colatia's hilltop towers, Pometi, Fort Inus, Bola, Cora, names to be heard for places nameless now. Then Romulus, fathered by Mars, will come to make himself his grandfather's companion. Romulus, reared by his mother Ilia in the bloodline of Asaracus. You see the double plume of Mars fixed on his crest? See how the father of the gods himself now marks him out with his own sign of honor? Look now, my son. Under his auspices, illustrious Rome will bound her power with earth, her spirit with Olympus. She'll enclose her seven hills with one great city wall, fortunate in the men she breeds. Just so, Cybele mother, honored on Erecynthus, wearing her crown of towers, onward rides by chariot through the towns of Phrygia, in joy at having given birth to gods and cherishing a hundred grandsons, heaven-dwellers with homes on high. Turn your two eyes this way and see this people, your own Romans. Here is Caesar and all the line of Eulus, all who shall one day pass under the dome of the great sky. This is the man, this one, of whom so often you have heard the promise. Caesar Augustus, son of the deified, who shall bring once again an age of gold to Latium, to the land where Saturn reigned in early times. He will extend his power beyond the Garamants and Indians, over far territories north and south, of zodiacal arts, the solar way, where Atlas, heaven-bearing on his shoulder, turns the night sphere studded with burning stars. At that man's coming, even now, the realms of Caspia and Maeotia tremble, warned by oracles, and the seven mouths of Nile go dark with fear. The truth is, even Alcides never traversed so much of earth. I grant that he could shoot the hind with brazen hoofs or bring peace to the groves of Aramanthus, or leave Lyrna affrighted by his bow. Neither did he who guides his triumphal car with reins of vine shoots twisted, Bacchus driving down from Nysus' height his tiger's team. Do we lag still at carrying our valor into action? Can our fear prevent our settling in Ausonia? Who is he so set apart there, olive-crowned, who holds the sacred vessel in his hands? I know the snowy mane and beard, Numa, the king, who will build early Rome on a base of laws, a man sent from the small-town poverty of Curus to high sovereignty. After him comes Tullus, breaker of his country's peace, arousing men who have lost victorious ways, malingering men to war. Near him is Ancus, given to boasting, even now too pleased with veering popularity's heady air. Do you care to see now, too, the Tarkin kings and proud soul of the avenger, Brutus, by whom the bundled fasces are regained? Consular power will be first his, and his the pitiless axes. When his own two sons plot war against the city, he will call for the death penalty in freedom's name. Unhappy man, no matter how posterity may see these matters, love of the fatherland will sway him, and unmeasured lust for fame. Now see the Deci and the Drusi there, and stem Torquatus with his axe, and see Camillus bring the lost standards home. That pair, however, matched in brilliant armor, matched in their heart's desire now, while night still holds them fast, 
once they attain life's light? What war, what grief will they provoke between them? Battle lines and bloodshed? As the father marches from the Alpine ramparts, down from Monaco's walled height, and the son-in-law, drawn up with armies of the east, awaits him. Sons, refrain, you must not blind your hearts to that enormity of civil war, turning against your country's very heart, her own vigor of manhood. You, above all, who trace your line from the immortals, you be first to spare us. Child of my own blood, throw away your sword. Mamias there, when Corinth is brought low, will drive his car as victor and as killer of Achaeans to our high capital. Paulus will conquer Argos and Agamemnon's old Mycenae, defeating Perseus, the Aesid, heir to the master of war Achilles, thus avenging his own Trojan ancestors, and the defilement of Minerva's shrine. Great Cato, who would leave you unremarked, or Cossus, you, or the family of Gracchi, or the twin Scipios, bright bolts of war, the bane of Libya, or you, Fabricius, in poverty yet powerful, or you, Serranus, at the furrow casting seed, where though I weary, do you hurry me, you, Fabi, Fabius Maximus? You are the only soul who shall dare restore our wounded state by waiting out the enemy. Others will cast more tenderly in bronze their breathing figures, I can well believe, and bring more lifelike portraits out of marble. Argue more eloquently, use the pointer to trace the paths of heaven accurately, and accurately foretell the rising stars. Roman, remember by your strength to rule earth's peoples, for your arts are to be these, to pacify, to impose rule of law, to spare the conquered, battle down the proud. Anchises paused here as they gazed in awe, then added, See there how Marcellus comes with spoils of the commander that he killed? How the man towers over everyone. Cavalry leader, he'll sustain the realm of Rome in hours of tumult, bringing to heal the Carthaginians and rebellious Gaul. And for the third time in our history, he'll dedicate an enemy's general's arms to Father Romulus. But here Aeneas broke in, seeing at Marcellus' side a young man, beautifully formed and tall in shining armor, but with clouded brow and downcast eyes. And who is that one, father, walking beside the captain as he comes? A son or grandchild from the same great stock? The others murmur all astir how strong his presence is, but night like a black cloud about his head whirls down in awful gloom. His father Anchises answered, and the tears welled up as he began. Oh, do not ask about this huge grief of your people, son. Fate will give earth only a glimpse of him. Now let the boy live on. Lords of the sky, you thought the majesty of Rome too great if it had kept these gifts. How many groans will be sent up from that great field of Mars to Mars's proud city, and what sad rites you'll see, Tiber, as you flow past the new-built tomb. Never will any boy of Ilian race exalt his Latin forefathers with promise equal to his. Never will Romulus's land take pride like this in any of her sons. Weep for his faithful heart, his old world honor, his sword arm never beaten down. No enemy could have come through a clash with him unhurt. Whether this soldier went on foot or rode, digging his spurs into a lathered mount. Child of our mourning, if only in some way you could break through your bitter fate, for you will be Marcellus. Let me scatter lilies, all I can hold, and scarlet flowers as well, to heap these for my grandson's shade at least, frail gifts and ritual of no avail. So rapidly, everywhere, father and son wandered the airy plain and viewed it all, after Anchises had conducted him to every region and had fired his love of glory in the years to come, he spoke of wars that he must fight, of Laurentines and of Latinus's city, then of how he might avoid or bear each toil to come. There are two gates of sleep, one said to be of horn, whereby the true shades shall pass with ease. The others are all white ivory, a gleam without a flaw. And yet, false dreams are sent through this one by the ghosts to the upper world. Anchises now, his last instructions given, took son and Sibyl there, and let them go by the ivory gate. Aeneas made his way straight to the ships to see his crews again, 
then sailed directly to Caeta's port. Bow anchors out, the sterns rest on the beach. <laughs>